Welcome to Billionaire Romance Audiobooks. Please subscribe to this YouTube channel. It helps more than you know and is the best way to stay up to date on our latest releases. When you subscribe, you'll also get notified when we release new videos. Thank you for listening, and we hope you have a great day. The Christmas Bets A Billionaire Romance Box Set By Michelle Love Audio Copyright, 2023, BFA Publishing Note we edited this romance audiobook to comply with the YouTube content guidelines. If you want to listen to the full-length non-edited version, you can grab a copy from Google Play Books or Kobo. Blurb Immerse yourself in the allure of the holidays with my special box set, showcasing three sizzling love stories that promise to ignite your Christmas wishes and fill your cozy moments with the warmth of romance. Book 1, Lucky's Naughty Angel, A Second Chance Romance I don't deserve a girl like Julia. She's young, sweet, pure, and sheltered. She's my total opposite. I've been trying to pull my life together since my idiot brother got me thrown in prison, but it doesn't change the facts. I'm a bad guy. I'm a devil, and Reverend Alderson's daughter Julia is an angel on earth. I love her and I want to do things to her that would make the reverend want my head. So I have to stay away. But then she decides to kiss me in a damn elevator, and make it really clear that she wants me just as bad as I want her, and she's willing to go behind dear old daddy's back to have me. This is a bad idea. But I can't resist. She crooks her finger, and I come running. I've never felt so good about being bad in my life. Book 2, The Orphan Next Door, A Single Daddy Next Door Romance Emily is too young for me, but I can't shake how much I want her. I want to rescue her from her isolation. I certainly want to rescue her from that gold-digging little creep James. I want to love her and be loved by her, and wake up to her face every morning. And of course I'd love to make her mine. Even if our age difference didn't make me hesitate. James is doing his best to get and stay in the way. Even after Emily throws him out of her life. He's stalking her, he's stalking us. And he's way too interested in my little girl for comfort. I'm determined to have Emily in my arms. Safe from him and from the world's other predators. And when I finally get what I want, it's paradise. For a while, I don't think twice about that little brat and his complaining. But James isn't done. And as Emily and I work toward our first of what we hope is many Christmases to come, he's going to take his revenge. I'm a patient man. But when he endangers my love and my little girl, it is time for a reckoning. Book 3 Santa's Naughty Helper, A Bad Boy Christmas Romance Alexis is what I want for Christmas this year. And nothing will stop me until I make her mine. Things always go my way, and I don't pay the consequences. So, when I get into legal and financial trouble, I'm happy to take the plea deal to avoid a scandal. And what is that deal? Playing the part of Santa in one of the largest malls in New York. This is when I meet her. She's timid, innocent, and alluring. She should definitely be on the nice list. But I'll put her on my naughty list this holiday season. Lucky's Naughty Angel Chapter 1 Aaron Every day that I wake up a free man, I take a deep breath and thank God for it. Sometimes it takes me a minute to remember where I am, but it all comes back to me when I open my eyes and see my neat little trailer around me, instead of a cage. But before I can even do that, I'm stuck shaking off the shadows of the past. The guys at the bar would be shocked to learn that their six-foot-six six bouncer, who once flipped a Patron's Mini Cooper onto its roof when he wouldn't pay his tab, regularly wakes up gasping, shaking like a kid waking up from a nightmare. But that's me every damn morning. The worst part is that hazy instant before the nightmare lets go of me. For just that moment, I expect that I'll open my eyes and see the cell around me instead of my home, 
and I'll know that being free was just a dream, and I'm still in that same damn cage that I lived in for ten years. My personal hell is a real place on earth, that tiny prison cell where the lights would always glare down, shared with three other orange jumpsuits. In that hell, even though I knew I could flatten any of them, two of the three would leave me with scars. Every morning, the remembered nightmare recedes into the darkest parts of my head, where it belongs. This morning I sit up slowly, rubbing my eyes as the comforter slithers down my bare chest. It takes a few moments for my heart to stop pounding. It's cold in my trailer. I usually turn the heat off in the early hours and rely on my thick down comforters instead. That way, I don't have to dig into my savings by the end of the month just to pay for propane. Fortunately, even without a woman in my life, I've got some help keeping the bed warm. Moose looks up from the foot of the king-sized mattress barely squeezed into the trailer's sleeping alcove. The big dog yawns and whines, thumping his tail. I reach over and scuff his floppy, chocolate-colored ears. He's a bit like me, a giant muscular mutt that finally got out of his cage. First thing I did once I finished parole was rescue Moose from the pound so I would always have company that understands me. He and I took a road trip upstate to live in the trailer on land that used to belong to my buddy Jake. It's tough to start over with a felony on your record, so I went back to the one place where people actually know I'm not a bad guy, the town I grew up in. Phoenicia's a bitty touristy town in the middle of nowhere in the Catskills, so different from the halfway house in the Bronx and the hell I left behind that I don't really fit in here anymore. I'm a giant tattooed biker with a touch of a Bronx accent now. You would never know that I grew up here. Fortunately, the owner of the local bar is an old friend from school, just like Jake. He even rides himself on weekends, and he was looking for a big, intimidating guy to be his bouncer. That job, along with a place to stay, saved my life as much as the dog and my friends. Phoenicia is pretty. Clean streets, a selection of restaurants, even a couple of spots that are open after 10, which is rare around here. I make some of the tourists nervous when I wander around, especially with the big dog, so I do my best to soften my image. Sit down, talk quiet, smile. Leave the armor I grew in prison, which I started forming on the road even earlier, aside. It only works sometimes, so I spend more of my time alone than I would prefer especially when it comes to women. The ladies who go to Eddie's bar know that drunk or sober, they're safer with me around than without. Now and again, I get to take one home. But it's always a casual thing for them. Phoenicia considers itself high-end, so almost nobody wants a working-class boyfriend with a record. Moose hops down and shakes himself, knocking me out of my reverie, and I scoot out of bed and stand up, stretching carefully. I tend to knock my knuckles on the trailer ceiling if I don't watch it. I've spent years taking practical steps toward rebuilding my life, fixing up the trailer, then buying it, then buying the land. Only then did I move on from my original Harley and dog trailer to a big red cruiser with a sidecar, so Moose can ride in style. He even has his own helmet and goggles. The local kids love watching us roll through town. I spend a good part of my days working now, too, sort of. Volunteering at the church every week is as much for me as anyone else. It's hard to keep thinking of yourself as a complete piece of shit once you wear yourself out delivering meals, fixing a poor local's window, or digging their car out. I sleep whenever I get home, wake up in the late morning, and then spend some time volunteering at the church. I spend part of whatever's left of my time riding with Moose or my friends, and occasionally some of the local hobby bikers. This area has some of the prettiest wilderness east of the Rockies, and it all looks great when you're zooming through on a bike. That's my life now. Sure, it has its lonely spots, even though I have friends and moose to help with that, but it's also got its own routine. There's no woman in my arms most nights, and no one who wants to stick around when there is. I'm actually okay with that, though. Not because I don't want a good woman beside me. God knows I do after everything I've been through but because my heart's already picked one. One I can't ever possibly have, but who I think about every night when I close my eyes. As I shower in the tiny pod, I get my morning wood back just thinking about her, 
Julia, the preacher's daughter, and the brightest light in my life. The church I volunteer at is one of three in town, and the only one liberal enough for me to tolerate, and traditional enough that they take feeding the hungry and tending the needy pretty damn seriously. Reverend Alderson, the stiff but kind pastor in charge of the place, doesn't trust me too much. But he's still given me a chance to prove myself, and so I work hard on his food drives and repair program. However, he would definitely draw the line at me trying to date his daughter. Pretty sweet and young Julia Alderson is an angel, but she's barely old enough to drink, not that she ever would, I suspect. The girl has my heart, damn she's had it for the past two years. But her father thinks I'm dangerous, and she's too young and too pure for me anyway. She's little, barely comes up to my shoulder. She's got nearly a yard of soft auburn hair that she wears in a coiled braid when she's working, or in ringlets when she's feeling fancy. Modest, somber clothes barely do anything to conceal that robust young body of hers. And where her widower father's soft gray eyes are sad and tired, hers gleam brightly, full of life. I know she likes me, too. We're buddies, working side by side at every church drive, chatting and laughing together. She likes my jokes. She loves my dog. And for some reason I can't fathom, she thinks I'm a great guy who just got a shitty break in life. I've fallen so hard for her that I can't find my way back out to save my life. For two years now I've been her friend, worked with her to make Phoenicia better under her father's watchful and slightly suspicious eye, and close my eyes every night wishing she was beside me. No matter who I'm with, she pops into my head when I get turned on, and I can't bust without thinking about her. I open the trailer's tiny closet and look in on a mass of leather and denim. I grab a clean work shirt and black plaid from the drawers below, then hunt up a clean pair of jeans and my vest. I pull it all on over my thermal long johns. It's maybe 20 degrees out. Even Moose gets a vest before we go out, black leather lined in sheepskin like mine. He whines when I put his paw covers on, putting up a little struggle that would flatten a smaller man. Oh, come on. Don't be a damn baby about it, there's road salt everywhere. I grumble at him pointlessly as I finish dressing him and give him a belly scratch to calm him down. Moose is a good dog. He even looks it once you get past his size. He's as floppily enthusiastic as a puppy with his affection. He has a practically ear-to-ear -ear doggy grin, and he's incredibly gentle around small people and other dogs but of course he's going to cry a little about the weird doggy shoes that keep the salt and frost from his pads. As soon as we step out of the trailer onto the thin crust of snow, the icy wind hits me like a slap in the face. Damn. I put my collar up and pull down my watch cap with a sigh. The beauty of upstate has a brutal side, but you either adapt or you get out. Moose takes off like a shot across the field chasing after one of the brave squirrels that's being blown around by the wind. The fat little guy runs up one of my maple trees and stops barely out of reach, barking and chattering. They all know Moose by now, and they know that the one unfortunate squirrel he actually caught only received a slobbery bath, and that Moose dropped it and ran after getting a bite on the nose. It's hard to command fear and respect when even the squirrels know you melt in the face of cuteness. I put my gloved hands on my hips and look around, the leather of my coat creaking slightly as I move. It still smells of the factory, like leather polish and lanolin from the sheepskin lining. The air has that particular dry cold smell, sharp and almost dusty, tinged with wood smoke. My land is four acres and just across the creek from town. It's lightly sloped and is ringed and dotted here and there with maples, black walnuts, apple trees, and an assortment of evergreens. The land is stony and overworked, and I've spent time digging out the rocks, planting clover and plowing it under with borrowed gear, slowly building on it as I can afford to buy materials. It isn't much to look at yet. The heavy-duty fence is built from pallet wood and salvaged timber, bare now of its climbing vines with a gate I built myself. The land is mostly bare, though I've started terracing the back half with bluestone I dug up. A salvaged stone path leads up to the trailer door. Julia helped me lay the stones and gather moss to plant in between the cracks to keep out the cheatgrass. I told her she didn't have to, that she'd mess up her pretty little hands, but she just laughed and pulled on gloves. 
She's always trying to make me happy. I wish she'd stop. It makes me love her more, and I can't touch her. In fact, if I ever so much as kiss her, I know I'd end up doing whatever she asks after that. And then we would both be in trouble. She's 21, attractive and healthy. The way she looks at me sometimes makes me think I should get my eyes checked, those or my head. It's gotta be wishful thinking on my part, believing that I see an expression on her face that suggests that she not only likes me, but wants me. Stop torturing yourself. I go to check my bikes. That damn drunk of a building inspector gave me hell about permits, so I had to buy a prefab shed for my vehicles and workshop. It's an ugly chunk of corrugated steel and plastic, and it sits on the windward side of the trailer. Most days it cuts the breeze and snow pile up, but not today. Today the winter wind is swirling, hitting from weird directions as it angles off the mountains. Sometimes it comes from the northeast and it bites deep into my bones. There's definitely a storm coming. I better get the spare propane tanks from the shed, in case I'm stuck inside for a while. I'm headed for the shed, just stepping onto the gravel driveway in front when my phone buzzes in my pocket. Huh. I check the time. It's seven in the morning, two days before Christmas. Who is even up this early? Then I see the number and smile before I can stop myself and take the call. Hey Jules, aren't you supposed to be sleeping? The voice on the other end is musical and full of excitement. I can't. The food delivery's here early, and thank God because they just upgraded the storm enough to give it a name. We have a damn blizzard headed this way just in time for Christmas. I stop dead. Oh shit. Wait, wait, so we're doing deliveries today? We are doing everything today. Sorting, bagging, delivery. They sent too much stuff, and if we don't get it distributed, it will go bad sitting inside. The church had been approved for food distribution the same year that I fell in love with Julia. Three months later, the local eccentric, Dr. Whitman, donated enough scratch for us to expand the church basement and turn it into a food storage facility. It's pretty roomy and stocked with enough stuff to cover the whole town for weeks if there was a disaster. But the Reverend sees ongoing hunger as just as much of a disaster as a hurricane. And he's right. I might be a bad guy, but even back in the big house a lot of guys wouldn't have liked that idea one bit. A lot of them went hungry as kids themselves. My heart starts beating faster again, but this time it feels great. I'll have to shuffle some things around to spend my afternoon there as well, but I don't care. Okay. What do you need from me? You. The motorcycle with the sidecar. As many hours and as much gas as it takes. Her voice is so warm. I really can't stop smiling. Okay. I'll be over as soon as I can. I don't care if I go straight from there to work and fall into bed exhausted tomorrow morning. Spending the whole day with Julia makes the whole thing worth it. I hang up and look over at Moose. Come on, boy, we got families to feed. Chapter 2 Julia There's no way that I can get a rental truck four days early, not this close to Christmas. Dad sits back from his laptop with a sigh, rubbing his lean face. He looks so crestfallen that I go over and hug him. Don't worry, Dad. I called ten volunteers while you were looking for one and have them on standby. We've got one van, one pickup, seven cars, and Aaron's sidecar at our disposal. I deliberately use Aaron's first name, just to see that little twitch it puts in the corner of Dad's eye. I love my dad and I've helped him run the church since Mom died. I look up to him in a lot of ways but he has his flaws, just like everyone, the biggest one is that he prejudges people sometimes. He's not racist and he doesn't look down on the poor but he makes certain judgments about bikers, stoners, hippies, guys with records. And the guy he's judged the most harshly is the one I want to spend my life with. One day I hope to prove to him that he's got Aaron all wrong. It hurts a little that he sticks to his prejudices toward the guy who has done so much heavy lifting around the church for years. Especially because Aaron is so important to me. But all of that is secondary now compared to reassuring Dad that we're ready to get through this day. 20 degrees? Icy? 
hundreds of pounds of food to sort and distribute with a damn blizzard breathing down our necks. No problem. We're on the case. My dad blinks in surprise and then smiles tentatively. Good work, he says simply, and I hand him a fresh cup of coffee to fortify him for the day ahead. After a quick breakfast of eggs, apple pancakes and sausage, we're outside helping a small crowd of volunteers unload the delivery company's huge truck. I'm at one of the folding tables we have set up beside it, cutting open boxes of food and sorting the contents into smaller boxes to distribute. The tables are wedged into the space between the delivery truck and the weathered side of the church, so that the heaving wind can't blow the lighter things away. We're hoping to eventually add a covered bay along the side to make unloading in extreme weather easier, but we can't quite get to that project yet. There are too many more important ones in the way. The church is creaky and old, formerly a Dutch reformed church that was sold after Hurricane Irene flooded so much of the area. A lot of people moved out of town after that. We moved in, and fixing and updating the big wooden building is as much a part of our lives as ministry or charity. That's actually how I met Aaron Gates, former biker, current bouncer, handyman, dog daddy, and the man of my dreams. He is a guy who has spent a third of his life in jail or on parole for a crime he didn't commit, all so his brother wouldn't have to be put away for even longer. Now he keeps drunks from acting up in town by night and helps us with our church projects by day. I remember the day I met him, over two years ago. He was new in town, and my father, who believes in second chances, as long as they don't involve dating his daughter apparently, offered him a place in the congregation. Soon after that he started volunteering, and that was how I first crossed paths with him, him carrying lumber up to the steeple to reinforce it from within. He's a mountain of a man. Big, burly, solid, he towers over everyone I know, even my dad, who is a beanpole. He's actually the exact opposite of my dad, appearance-wise, a little scruffy with keen dark eyes and short hair that almost looks black and is constantly swept back. When I saw him stomp past, whistling with what looked like an entire tree's worth of lumber on one muscled shoulder, everything stopped inside me, and all I could do was stare. I don't really date. There isn't much opportunity. I don't have much time between church, volunteering, and commuting to and from seminary in Rochester, where I live for half the week during the semester. But every time I'm home, and even remotely near Aaron, he's always in my thoughts. Who would be better to spend the rest of my life with than my best buddy, the guy who gets things done, the guy to whom I can tell any secret and know that he will keep it? Yes, he's a lot older than I am, and there are some people in town who will never trust him, but I do. And I wish dad did. I get working as soon as I leave my dad, distributing frozen chickens into boxes, three to a box, along with a package of frozen ground beef. The vegetarians get beans, tofu, nuts, wild rice mixes, squash, and a couple of those horrible fake turkey loaves that apparently taste a lot better than they look. As I empty each box I set it aside, and the man himself lumbers out of the truck with another. So how's it going? Aaron asks with that tender-eyed smile, as he sets the big box on the table with a soft thud. I beam at him. We have enough food to give everyone half again as much as last year, take care of a lot of drop-ins, and then fill up our larders too. I don't know how Whitman did it all, but I'll take the early delivery if it means we can get it all out before the storm comes. I tend to chatter when I'm excited. Me too. Again I see that brief flash of a grin, a pretty rare occurrence. Aaron does smile a lot especially when he's with me, or with his dog, who is keeping some of the other volunteers' kids busy playing but he lights up when he's around me. People have commented on it before. My father has also commented on it, and not in a good way. However, in my dad's head, I'll probably always be 12 years old even after he's retired, and I've taken over ministry. Maybe he would keep any guy who looks at me like Aaron does under a microscope. I wouldn't know, because I don't notice other guys. Not like this. I've already decided to do something about this whole ridiculous, unresolved tension thing. Ridiculous because I'm an adult, we're both single, and we should really do something about this. Once the boxes are loaded up and closed, they go on a hand truck out to the volunteers' vehicles. The first cars are already coming back from their first set of deliveries, but Aaron has been stuck here, 
transferring cases of food and helping the less capable volunteers push their assigned hand trucks. I love watching him work. The man is tireless. I can only imagine what he would be like in bed, not that I know much about that sort of thing but hey, a girl can dream. I'm catching myself staring at him for the third time when Marion, one of my volunteers, comes up to me, brushing snow off her rust-colored parka. She's a tall older woman with a long, strong-jawed face, and she smiles awkwardly at me. Hey. Hi Marion, what's going on? I rearrange the contents of one of the boxes, making sure the loaves of bread don't get squashed, then fold it shut as I look up at her. A bit of odd news, actually. I'm just trying to find out who knows what. Did you hear about the mistletoe? Someone put it up all over town. Her lips twitch with a mix of amusement and baffled curiosity. I blink at her slowly. I've been here sorting chickens and canned goods since about eight. I haven't heard anything about this. What exactly did I miss? Mistletoe? Aaron frowns as he brings coffee over in two plain white mugs. He hands me one, looks at Marion, who has clearly been out in the weather, and hands his over to her without missing a beat. Thank you. She warms her long fingers around the mug, not even the thickest gloves will keep out the biting cold if you're out there long enough. Yes the town's thick with it. Looks like some kind of prank. I guess the church didn't get hit. Not as far as I know, I venture. That's because I took all those ridiculous sprigs down, my father sighs as he comes out entering distribution figures into a spreadsheet on his laptop. This morning, seven sharp on my morning walk. I'm all for a good prank but this is still God's house. I guess so, Reverend. Marion takes a deep swallow of her coffee, while Aaron patiently turns to get himself and my dad some more from inside. Seems pretty strange though. I wonder who would do something like that. My dad folds his arms, a faint disinterested smile on his face. I have no idea. You're no fun, Dad. I tease him once Marion goes back with her arms full, ready to start loading up her car again. He eyes me. Don't tell me you were in on this mistletoe prank. Apparently they're hanging everywhere in town. I need to invite Aaron into town. Ah, no, this is actually the first that I have heard of it. I'm kind of wondering who did it. There are some really fun weirdos in Phoenicia. Most of them were either priced out of Woodstock, got sick of New York City, or seemed to have just sprouted up here, like Dr. Whitman's son Jack. Now that guy is definitely my number one suspect for a Christmas-themed prank like this. After all, every year starting mid-December, his dad's lawn looks like the Macy's Christmas Parade, and his family throws a Christmas feast for the whole town and makes huge food donations. Jack was raised in a family that loves Christmas. Jack, who is attractive but can't hold a candle to Aaron, is the fun kind of idol rich. He's a skier with a rack of trophies, known for following the snow season across the equator to Australia, just so he can enjoy it longer. The half of the year that he's here, he parties and flirts his way through the mountains. Then as soon as the snow melts, he's gone again. He has the time, cash, and energy to double his father's food donation early, and yet right on time. He has just the kind of odd sense of humor, paired with a huge list of friends and the connections necessary, to see that our morning food distribution wakes up everyone early so they'll have to witness the prank, his prank, in town. The big weirdo may also have the world's only bulk mistletoe hookup, he probably got a reference from his father. I have to hand it to the both of them, about the donation part, at least. Most rich New Yorkers are alarmingly self-interested. But not those two. They're going above and beyond to spread the Christmas cheer, and maybe some kisses this year. I turn to eye Aaron speculatively as he comes back out with mugs of coffee in each fist. He hands one to my father, who thanks him a little stiffly and then comes over to me, slowing down with a look of mild worry on his face. What? I smile with all the innocence. Nothing. Chapter 3 Aaron. Sweet little Julia is up to something, I can just tell. She's smiling too much, and she's looking at me with this mischievous expression that leaves me just a bit concerned. Julia doesn't know how to flirt, and I thank God for that, because if she ever really came on to me, 
she would have me wrapped around her little finger in an instant. Hell, I'd be happy about it. Her father, on the other hand, would probably drive me out of the church. And besides, there's one thing about me that he's right about. I don't deserve someone as pure and hot and full of life as Julia. If she thinks that I do, she's selling herself short. But a guy can dream, right? As long as I remember that all I'm gonna be doing is dreaming. We make it to one in the afternoon before we run into our first glitch, which is amazing, given the huge amount of food we have to sort and pass out in a short time. But when things finally go wrong, they do it in a big way. What do you mean, we've lost track? How much food got loaded downstairs? Poor Reverend Alderson is managing to keep his voice quiet, but his eyes show that he's ready to tear out his own hair. Poor guy. Julia and I exchange glances, and she gives me a nod. We both hover around while the crisis unfolds, ready to step in. The bearer of bad news is Tom XMY, a kid who works at the gas station. He's a little bear of a guy in Coke bottle glasses, who squirms at the note of desperation in the reverend's voice. Um, well, enough that we're having trouble opening the doors. But we haven't even finished unloading the truck. He looks into the back of the delivery truck, from which boxes are still coming out, and over at all the volunteers' cars, which have all done at least three trips around the county and are loaded to the gills again. How did they fit it all? I can't believe I'm saying this, but this is almost too much of a good thing. Don't worry, Dad. Julia speaks up, walking over and offering to take his laptop. I'll go down to the storeroom and tally things up. I'll just need some help getting the door open. He relinquishes the laptop. You're sure? I have no idea what it's like down there right now. It might be a total mess. I'll manage. She looks over at me. Come on, I may need some help shuffling some of the stacks of boxes around. The truck's almost empty. Everyone else can take it from here. I nod and trail her inside, trying not to walk too close. Too much of that, and I know I'll be in trouble again. I can't be of use with the food distribution if I'm stumbling around with boner brain. You know, I know it's stressing, Dad, but having so much donated food that we lose track of it all is a pretty good inconvenience. We head through the kitchen and into the hallway, which is narrow and floored with peeling linoleum. I mentally add that to my repair list. I nod agreement as we head for the freight elevator at the end of the hall. Too many times, especially these days, food drives scratch along on almost nothing. You said it. But directing the whole event still has to be stressful for him. Always. He's too rigid and stuck in routines for his own good. Big changes always stress him out. She stops in front of the elevator, and I pull the lever, unlatching the pull-down safety gate and shoving it upward. She ducks in ahead of me. Thank you, sir. You're welcome, ma'am. There's that smile I can't fight again. The elevator's roomy and dim, with a high ceiling. There's an odd spicy green smell hanging around the air in the place. It's a little familiar, but I can't place it. Has someone donated a bunch of mustard greens to go with the other stuff in the fridges downstairs? On her way in, Julia pauses for just a moment, and I hear her let out a little laugh before she continues inside, as if she's just thought of something or noticed something. I step in after her and close the gate. So, she says suddenly as I'm reaching to throw the lever and send us down, you know all that mistletoe dad says he removed from the church. I pause, the naughty tone in her voice startling me, and look back at her. Yeah. She reaches past me and pulls the lever, closing the door on us and sending the elevator rumbling slowly downward. He missed a sprig. I look down at her and see her wide grin as she steps closer, got and then look up, straight at a bundle of mistletoe hanging right above me. Crap. I freeze, knowing what is about to happen and almost dreading it, knowing as well that I can't stop her, I don't want to. Oh my gosh. I'm in trouble. I don't care. Why did I ever hold back from kissing her? I have never felt anything so right in my life. It's sweeter than my first breath of free air. I have to have her. Now. Right now. Wait, what am I doing? 
I gently pull away, and she makes a small, disappointed noise in her throat. When I finally get control of myself, I stare down at her in amazement. Julia, what are you doing? What I've wanted to do for more than a year, she replies with a wicked grin. Baby, we really shouldn't, I start, and she simply moves closer, laying a slim warm finger against my lips. Shish. I'm doomed. The hairs on the back of my neck start prickling, and I let her go, breathing hard, moving back against the wall of the elevator, while she wipes her mouth and steps back as well. Someone's called the elevator, and will be joining us in a moment. The outer door rumbles up as we come to a stop, and my heart sinks into my boots. The reverend standing there, scowling at us both. Chapter 4 Julia The kiss was everything I had hoped for. Especially when I realized how enthusiastically Aaron was returning my kiss, he must have been crushing on me even harder than I was on him. I lied when I said that I had only wanted to kiss him for a year. It's been over two years. Since the first day I saw him. I went to bed that night wondering what his mouth would taste like. Now I know. He tastes like coffee and mint, and mixed with his warm musky male scent in my nostrils, he's intoxicating. Knowing only makes me want more. When he steps away from me I'm so dizzy and keyed up, that his sudden absence against my body hurts like a missing limb. But a split second later, I realize that someone has called the elevator, and we are about to have company. Crap. I wipe my mouth and move back against the wall, catching my breath. I definitely need some real privacy before I try this mistletoe trick again. The laptop's on the floor. I can't remember whether I set it there or dropped it, but I snatch it up and check it. No damage. Then the gate opens and I see that it's Dad, standing there with his arms folded. Shit shit shit. I give him a smile. I'm not actually doing anything wrong, after all. But overprotective fathers have to be reassured sometimes. Hi dad. Did you forget something? I thought I would come down here and help you tally, he replies after a moment of staring suspiciously at the two of us. I feel my heart clench, but after a few moments he relaxes and holds out his hand for his laptop. If a room that large is full of supplies, then it's not a two-person job. That's true enough, Reverend, Aaron responds with a touch of relief in his eyes. For a moment, I feel guilty. But then I remember how he shook when I kissed him, and how his whole huge solid body turned to putty in my hands. Oh no. We're definitely not done with this. I smile to myself before looking up at my dad and nodding. Let's get started then. Aaron and I settle back into our friendly rapport for the rest of the afternoon. By the end of it, we're stocked up, and so is everyone on our donation list. We're also both exhausted and sore. I gotta get a shower before my shift, Aaron groans, stretching and rolling his massive shoulders. For just a moment he shoots me a smoldering glance, which tells me he wishes I would join him. But being Aaron, he's back to not saying a thing. Probably because dear old dad planted himself right beside us, after he found us in the elevator, watching us both like a very irritated hawk in a clerical collar for the rest of the afternoon. Dad doesn't miss much. I know I'm in for a lecture when we get home. He's out of bounds but I'll have to take it anyway because he loves me and he's too stressed right now for me to fight it. But that kiss, it told me everything. I hadn't been deceiving myself. The guy I've been waiting for has been waiting for me too. My dad will have to find a way to cope with that eventually. I just don't want him to deal with it now. I also don't want to deal with him dealing with it now. I can only imagine the tidal wave of drama that will be set loose once I finally tell him my intentions, to be with Aaron forever. It's the damn holidays. I'm tired, I'm in love, and I want to be happy. I also want dad to be happy. Sometimes ignorance is bliss. Unfortunately, he's already suspecting something. When I finally get home, shower and get into my purple sweatpants and a giant pink flannel shirt, he's very quiet as he heats up the lasagna I fixed for tonight. He hasn't turned on his jazz station. That's a huge red flag, I'm definitely in for a lecture. 
I come down the narrow stairs with a little sigh, looking out each of the little windows lining the stairway as I pass them. Our house sits behind the church, a tall slim Victorian half hidden in the trees. Like a lot of buildings up here, it's painted white with green trim and a red door. Unlike a lot of buildings up here, it's surrounded by gravestones from the churchyard. It makes for an interesting view as the sun sets and the snowflakes swirl down. Just that nightmare before Christmas touch that I like best. I prepare myself mentally as I walk. All my life, Dad's been overprotective of me. But once we lost Mom he got brittle. But now, it's like part of him has frozen over, making him cold and stiff, and too easy to snap. I handle him carefully, not just because I hate the drama, but because I realize that these days, drama's really not good for him. I wish Mom was here. Mom would have loved Aaron. Her dad used to be a hell's angel, before he settled down and started his own motorcycle garage back in California. Grandpa took me riding a few times when I was tiny, and I remember Mom laughing as I squealed with delight, while at the same time Dad fluttered his hands slightly and made small, nervous protests. I've always wished that I could run off on some adventure on a motorcycle, like Mom once did, before I'd have to do the responsible thing and settle in for church duties and seminary. But losing Mom meant that someone had to step in and help Dad, at least part-time. That's what I do now, when I'm in town, and over the phone or online when I'm in Buffalo. It's good practice for the job I want, taking over this place and letting my dad enjoy his retirement. He'll still volunteer his head off of course. But once I'm the one wearing the collar around here, I can shoo him off to his books and jazz when he gets too overwhelmed. Dad knows I'm an adult and has seen what I can do, but he just can't back off with his hovering and protectiveness. I know why so I don't normally complain much. His head's still full of nightmares over mom's loss. He's scared to lose me too. Of course I understand. But sometimes, trying to fight against his overprotective fears makes me crazy with frustration. Thus, I take a couple of minutes to focus myself before joining him in the dining room. You did good work today, he starts off, as I settle into my seat across from his. Dad always starts and ends serious discussions with the positive, so we start with our ears open and end without wanting to keep yelling at each other. It needed to be done. Besides, it was just amazing. Everyone's fridge will be full well before the storm. I move our entree in front of me and set to work with a knife and spatula. He'd set out the lasagna in its baking dish, like a giant TV dinner. At least he remembered a trivet. He nods mutely and just watches for a minute, as I cut generous squares of lasagna for each of our plates. It's a one-dish meal full of beef, cheese, spinach, mushrooms, homemade red sauce and spices. I cook for fun, and to see the way the men in my life light up when I set a good meal in front of them. You okay, Dad? I ask him gently as he sits stiffly at his seat instead of starting prayer. I'm worried about you, Julia, he says very gently, and my smile freezes on my face. Here we go. Okay, what's got you worried? I told you I'll start saving for the four-wheel drive instead of that cute Kia. You're right, commuting to and from Buffalo in winter isn't safe in a small city car. He blinks and sits back slightly. Wait you did? I was very tired this morning. I nod. That's okay, maybe I wasn't clear. It's always best to pretend obliviousness to derail suspicion. Also, he is right about the damn car. He nods briefly, seeming just a touch more relaxed. At least he can see that I still have my common sense. Good. But no, that isn't what's worrying me. I knew you'd make the right decision about trading in your truck. Okay so what's the concern? I look down at my plate. My mouth is watering. We don't take a single bite before prayers in this house, which means I either have to resolve his worries quickly, or let my lasagna go cold. You and Mr. Gates. I'm concerned about his influence on you. He watches my face. This may be the twelfth time in two years that you've said that dad, and in that time Aaron hasn't been a bad influence on me. If anything, we've been a good influence on him. And Aaron has come back strong. I remember a time when getting him to smile or make eye contact was a Herculean task. My father rubs his face and then looks up at me, his eyes a little bleary from exhaustion and frustration. That's very likely true. 
I'm not discounting the improved state of Mr. Gates's soul, which has been remarkable. He does a great deal of good work for us, and since he's gotten back on his feet, he has asked for little in return. Then what's the issue? Seriously, Dad, you keep coming back to this, and then nothing ever happens to make us regret my friendship with him. I am trying to point out the history of his suspicions, and all the times he's cried wolf about Aaron. The guy cares about me. About you too for that matter, I add. That's different. He looks away. I just don't want you getting hurt. Why do you think he would hurt me? I'm genuinely astonished. Julia, he may care about you but he has a history of violence. He was in jail for 10 years for beating a man nearly to death. What if he can't leave that violence behind? He has. Dad, I've told you that he went to jail in his brother's place. He's innocent. If he's innocent, he would have fought for his freedom and his reputation. He tells a story about taking the fall for his older brother, but how believable is that? His frown doesn't waver. He's genuinely worried, and I'm not quite sure how to reassure him. Dad, this is a guy who gives all his weekends to us, provides the town with thousands of dollars of free labor every year, and has worked like crazy to leave his old life behind. He makes big sacrifices for others all the time, and for his brother. I believe him, Dad, and I think that time will prove me right. He winces and looks away, his expression so troubled that I fall silent. You're in love with him, he says very quietly. And so you're defending him. Just like your mother did with her father during his hell-raising days. His eyes rise to mine slowly. Did you think I wouldn't notice? Dad look. My heart is banging away and sending ice water rushing through my veins. Oh gosh please help me out here, I'm trying to ease his fears without treating him like a child. First and most importantly, it isn't that I thought you would not notice anything. It's that I thought you would trust me to show good judgment, and to know that if I trust Aaron enough to want him in my life, there are good reasons for that. That catches him by surprise, and he relaxes a little more, taking a deep breath. You're concerned that I'm worried because I'm not in full possession of the facts? I think that's part of it. But my dad doesn't want or need to be in full possession of the facts, not if some of them are non-essential and would hurt his peace of mind. Aaron didn't influence me to kiss him. He didn't push a kiss on me. I kissed him under the damn mistletoe, and I have no regrets. But it would still freak my dad out to learn about it. Fine. What facts am I not aware of? He looks down at the cooling lasagna and sighs. Briefly. The one you should most know is that he's anything but violent, Dad. Go into the bar sometime while he's working, and you'll see it in action. He has a job that could be violent if he made it so, he has drunks from three counties testing his patients all night. That catches his interest. He nods, brow furrowing. Go on. He has never raised a hand to any of them. He's trained in judo and just marches them outside, sometimes he even holds them for Earl when the cops need to be called. Nobody has ever complained of rough treatment, except for one guy who Aaron pulled off a woman who was calling for help. These things are important. All of them. Dad, I'm not asking you to take me at my word. I'm asking you to look at the man that Aaron is, the man he proves himself to be every day. Even if he was a bad man once, he's done his penance, and he's been seeking redemption. He's also a really responsible guy. This is going better than expected, but I still wish I could plow through and soothe myself with too much lasagna. He's old for you. That protest is a bit weaker. He is. I run into a wall for a moment. Come on, come on, you were doing so well a moment ago. But I want the kind of guy who is stable, responsible, wants to get serious, and has his own money. And I'm sorry, but have you met guys my age? College age guys often appear to be exactly the kind of people my father and I despise, faithless, thoughtless, and often seemingly brainless. Maybe I just have incredibly bad luck, but I keep running into guys my age who seem bent on being with the ministry student like it's a personal challenge, with no other interest in me at all. He lets out a soft laugh. Sadly yes. I was one. You have a point. I just worry. I admit, 
I'd prefer you settle down with someone who lives here rather than someone over in Buffalo. There isn't someone else in Buffalo, is there? I roll my eyes. Dad, we wouldn't be having this conversation if there were someone in Buffalo. He relaxes more and even lets out a little laugh. I'm sorry. I just don't want you making any decisions you might end up regretting. But dad, I say patiently, everyone has regrets sometimes. I know life's full of trials and disappointments, and I need you to trust me to be tough enough to handle it. Okay? He smiles faintly. Okay. But then he frowns, half theatrically. But don't let me catch you kissing that biker. Dad, if you catch me kissing that biker, there will be mistletoe involved. Because from now on, we're doing our kissing in private. He folds his arms. All the more reason for me to pull down every sprig of the stuff I see. Humph, my only response. But at least he's satisfied enough by my answers to say prayers and let us eat. We both go down for a nap after our very early dinner. Dad has to take some of his sinus meds and ends up conked out for good. I feel bad for him, except that it means he won't wake up for at least eight hours. I can do a lot in eight hours. I dress very carefully, I don't want to look too obvious with too much makeup or fancy hair. I don't want there to be any chance of gossip when I'm seen around Aaron. The warm sheepskin lining of my coat rubs softly against my skin, teasing me as I think about his hands on me. The thermal bottoms are a little scratchy, especially where they tuck into my snow boots, and so is the simple blue wool scarf I tuck into my collar at my throat. They do the job though. When I finally walk outside, the cold doesn't get through despite my modified outfit. If dad knew what I was doing, he would flip. But the thing that would make him flip the most is that I'm the one on a mission. I leave the lights on and bring my phone, pretending that I'm going out on an errand. If dad wakes up unexpectedly, that's what I'll tell him. We're out of eggnog anyway. The snow has stopped again, leaving a thin icy crust on the sidewalks. It's such a short walk to the gas station convenience store and the bar across from it, that I can excuse going out, without my truck and being in the area. From there, it's a short walk up the hill to Aaron's land. And his trailer. And his bed. I've never felt like this before in my life. I know it's because of him. That first kiss was off the scales awesome, definitely worth the wait. But now that I've had a taste of him, I don't want to wait anymore. Chapter 5 Aaron I know I'm in for a really shitty shift when I come in and hear a familiar voice yell, Hey Lucky, from the corner of the bar. I stop dead, squeezing my eyes shut, the euphoria from that kiss with Julia vanishing like smoke. There's only one guy around anymore who calls me that, and I never wanted to hear from him again. I open my eyes and look over to the voice, and see my big brother Daniel leaning toward me from his seat at a corner table. Older by almost twenty years, with gray in his hair, but with the same dress and manner that I remember. He's grinning wide enough for the scar on his cheek to crease like a bad seam in his leathery skin. Not again. Give me a sec. I send a beer over to him, then check in with my boss, Eddie, who nods at me and twitches a small smile as I approach. Hey, I'm in for the night. Any problems? Like with him. We both look over at Daniel, who is still grinning, obviously drunk, his face red beneath the rotan, and his overlong curls sticking wetly to his forehead. He looks like me if I was a foot shorter, ate nothing but cheeseburgers and booze, and got beat a few times with the ugly stick. He's also a jerk. But he's family, and he knows I make sacrifices for my loved ones. So the first thing I wonder is what he's here to ask me for and how much trouble he plans to cause until he gets it. That guy. No problem, except he should probably be cut off about now. He's kind of a jerk, but I saw the resemblance, so we didn't throw him out. My boss offers a lopsided smile. I wouldn't have taken it personally if you had thrown him out, I admit. I'll go deal with him. Yell if you need me. He nods, likely knowing it wouldn't be necessary. Being in prison has left me with an instinct for trouble. 
Even if Daniel wasn't my brother, I would still be keeping a closer eye on him than on anyone else in here, for just that reason. He's smirking as I walk over. It's all I can do not to grab him by the collar and haul him off his feet, and as he sees the look in my eyes, the smirk fades. Hey, he says in that used car salesman tone that he uses when he wants to talk me into something. I'd hoped never to hear it again. What the hell are you doing here, Daniel? I demand in a low, hard tone as I walk up to him. In response, he pushes out the chair across the table from him with his foot. Just a little talk. I take a deep breath. Eddie's watching us like a hawk between serving drinks, in case I need backup. I need to keep this job. I smile tightly, settle into the seat, and then say, we shouldn't be having a conversation at all. He chuckles. I'm hurt. Yeah, yeah, I know. You said after everything you did for me, you wanted out of the business and me out of your life. I get it, I do, and I know you're a stand-up guy. Not every guy will do a dime and change for his brother. I stare at him. The deal was, I do that for you, and then you walk out of my life and take the gang and all your crazy baggage with it. The guns, everything you dragged me into when I was 15 and too dumb to know better. Oh yeah, I get it, I do. And you got a pretty raw deal in prison, or so I hear. Only got one working kidney left, isn't that right? His voice has a wheedling tone of mock sympathy to it. Yeah, that's right. I lean forward, knowing three things. I'm bigger, fitter, and duffer than him. He's on my turf and drunk as hell, and he owes me way, way too much to be coming back for another favor now. Now, once again, why are you bothering me? Are you dying? Is dad dying? I don't know. Old man doesn't talk to me anymore. He shrugs nonchalantly and takes a deep swallow of his beer. And I know he hangs up every time you try to call. Doesn't he? My mouth works and I look away. He's right on the nose. Dad married his high school sweetheart, went to church every Sunday, and broke his back at a construction job. He taught me joinery, how to carve a chain from a stick of wood, and how to frame a shed. He's career military, retired now. A patriot. A good man. He doesn't deserve two troublemaking sons, both of whom are convicted felons now. He used to think I was a good man. But when I went down for Daniel after he beat the hell out of that banker, Dad didn't care that they had the wrong brother. After all, I didn't fight it. He never once called me when I was in jail or on probation, and after enough hang-ups, I gave up on calling him. Wow, that really did hit a nerve, didn't it? Daniel tugs on his pointed chin, his eyes full of sly mockery. So I was right. I don't know if he'd talk to me if I called him now. I haven't tried in years. I keep my voice neutral, ignoring the gutted feeling that thinking about Dad always leaves me with. That seems to surprise him. Thought you planned to go legit after we parted ways, get back in his good graces. There's no getting back in Dad's good graces after all the trouble you dragged me into. I blame Daniel for about 80% of it anyway. I could have said no. I could have run, could have let Daniel and the laughing boys hunt me. I could even have fought back and gotten beat. No, probably not, he replies thoughtfully. But that cat's been out of the bag for a while, hasn't it? Just spit it out, Daniel. Why are you here? It occurs to me that if I grab the son of a gun, bash his head against the table a few times, drag him across the floor by one leg, and pitch him out into the snow, everyone else here would simply ask me what he did. But I don't. I'm just not that guy anymore. I'm here to take you back with me, he replies simply. I stare at him. But that's Daniel, all balls, no sense, and absolutely no honor. I thought he had disappointed me for the last time when he left me to rot in jail without paying my bail and fines. It seems I was wrong. No. He cocks his head. Wait, did you just tell me no? Do you have any idea who you're dealing with here, baby brother? I push my chair back and stand, stepping around the table, looming over him. He hasn't seen me since I was that scared kid headed into jail. He has no idea what the past 18 years have done to me. 
I was thrown into the pit and I climbed back out with my fingernails. That changes a man. Do you? I ask him softly. It slowly seems to dawn on him that things have changed a bit. His eyes widen, and he goes quiet for a moment before smiling up at me. You're right, I do owe you big. And normally, I would leave you alone just like you want. But I need you down south, baby brother. I shake my head. No deal. I've got a life here now. I am not giving it up to follow you into the mouth of hell again. He starts to argue, and then his head snaps around to focus on the door as it opens, the bell on it ringing. His eyebrows go up, and I quickly turn to look. Oh shit. It's Julia. Beautiful, sweet Julia, bundled in her one good coat, a scarf covering her hair and throat and tucked into her collar. She looks around for me, and I wince. Crap. Not now. Not while Daniel is here. She sees me, and her face lights up. She takes a step in my direction, and then her face falls in confusion as she catches sight of Daniel. Quickly she goes to the bar instead, and I let out a small sigh of relief. I'll deal with her, after I deal with my brother. I just hope he hasn't noticed that. Friend of yours, he asks almost teasingly. Shit. Well, well. What is she, twenty? No wonder you don't want to leave. He gets up and starts sauntering past me, headed straight for Julia. I grab him by the arm and just stand there solidly. He stops short, and the sudden realization that he can't move past me or pull his arm free shocks his attention away from Julia. I look past him. She is watching us with a worried expression. What? he demands, getting a little loud. I just want to introduce myself. You're drunk and a jerk. She's a nice girl who doesn't need your kind of problems anywhere near her. Leave her alone. My voice drops to a growl at the last, and he gives me a shocked look. Holy shit, you really must like this piece of tail. He moves back to his chair. I let him go, and he sits down. Who is she? None of your damn business. He laughs. You know I'm gonna find out. My blood runs cold at his threat, and I lean down into his face. What you're gonna do is go back to New Orleans and leave me alone. I already did more for you than you ever deserved, just so they wouldn't lock you up and throw away the key. That was the last thing I'm ever doing for you. His smirk fades. I'm in serious need here. I was in serious need when I ended up in the system without anyone to visit me or throw me a lifeline. Nobody in the club. None of my family, not one of you so much as sent me a damn Christmas card. You want me to get you a Christmas card? Is that what this is about? His drunken bravado sets my teeth on edge. This is about you leaving. I rub the bridge of my nose. I gave you most of my life, Daniel, between the club and what happened. I'm done with that. You gonna shoot me for that, like you used to threaten. Go right ahead. He gives me a mock look of shock. I wouldn't dream of harming my own brother, even if he is being a giant ungrateful who forgets who practically raised him. You get my point. Just go, Daniel. You're not wanted here. He scoffs and stands, doing his best to stare me in the eyes. So that's it, huh? You want me to do this the hard way? Because I can still do that. You talk about how you built a life here. Well, that's fine. Maybe I'll just destroy every part of it, and then you won't have anything tying you here. There's ice in my veins now. My hands clench at my sides. You can try, I growl back. But you'll fail. And it'll cost you. He starts heading for the door, with me following right behind him, laughing hollowly the whole way. We'll see, he replies, and looks back at Julia one last time before I practically shove him out the door. Chapter 6 Julia I don't understand, I say to Aaron. My heart hurts, and the lambskin lining of my coat is scratchy against my back. I feel vulnerable, and a little sick from watching the bizarre exchange between him and the other biker. Someone from his past. You want me to leave? Every time that man looked over at me and smirked, 
I felt a chill run down my back that made me pull my coat around me closer, like a layer of armor. I didn't feel comfortable with him here, with the way he was talking to Aaron, or with the way Aaron reacted. I smelled trouble on that man, thick as body odor and beer fumes. Fortunately, he was only around for about five minutes before Aaron basically escorted him out the door. I sigh with relief once the door closes behind him, but it catches in my throat as I see the man walk over to one of the frosted windows and stand there outside, trying to peer in. Aaron comes over and tells me that I should leave. And I protest of course. He doesn't seem to know what to say. Look, he starts, then coughs into his fist and glances at the window. Things just got complicated. I thought they were already complicated, I say quietly as the bartender brings me my Irish coffee. They are. But God knows I don't want you caught up in any of what just went on, so we're probably going to have to take a break from each other for a while. I'll try to still be around the church to help out and stuff but we shouldn't, associate. He speaks so reluctantly that my heartache eases a little. How long? I ask in a pained tone and his hand brushes mine, maybe on instinct. Just a few days. We probably need to cool off anyway. Another regretful look. But you already know that. No I don't. I've never felt so sure about anything in my life. No regrets about this afternoon Aaron. None. He sighs through his nose and nods. You're really selling yourself short, sweetheart. I'm trouble. I don't mean to be, but it follows me around. Now I just want to hug him even more than I usually do. He's always the one to sacrifice for others. But I won't let him do it this time. Who is that man? That's Daniel, he replies in a falsely light tone, looking over at the window again. The man's creepy silhouette still stands there, his breath wearing through the frost. That's my brother. My eyes widen. Oh shit. He's warned me about his brother before. Aaron has told me a lot about himself, probably more than anyone else in town. It started back when he was drinking more and had just started to realize that he could tell me anything, the gang he was pulled into too young, the crimes he witnessed and had to play lookout for, Daniel's impulsiveness and violence. He told me about the day his brother beat a bank executive into a coma, because the poor man panicked during a robbery and couldn't remember the safe combination. Daniel, who owed crippling debts to some terrifying people, flew into a rage out of desperation. Only Aaron restraining him had stopped Daniel from committing murder. The man, addled by terror and an anxiety disorder, got the two brothers mixed up in the lineup, insisting that Aaron attacked him. The police detective had refused to believe it, he had noticed Daniel's criminal record and Aaron's lack of one. Aaron took the fall anyway. He told me that he did it because Daniel was two felonies in and was about to get life in prison without parole. I cried when I found out. Why is he here? I ask incredulously, keeping my voice low. He wants to take me back to New Orleans with him. He scratched his check, rubbing at his five o'clock shadow as his lips twisted in disgust. Back to the club. For keeps. How did they end up in New Orleans? I feel like I'm a step behind suddenly. I know I have no business expecting him to tell me every damn thing, but something crazy is going on, and I need help sorting it out in my head. The bartender brings him a single shot of whiskey, and he swallows it down like medicine. Daniel and the Laughing Boys couldn't hack it in the Northeast. So he led all five of the remaining members down the coast to the Big Easy three years ago. I only found out about it through one of the guys that left the club. And now they're having trouble in New Orleans, and he wants your help. No, absolutely not. There is no way I am putting up with him being dragged away when he's just starting to be happy again. Not when we're right on the brink of being together. That's pretty much it. He gets a regular coffee as his next drink. He's on duty after all, and I know that for him only the coffee is free. My brother knew where to look. I grew up here, after all. So did he. Difference is I always wanted to come back to Phoenicia, and I made the mistake of admitting that. We have to get him away from here. I want to cry at the thought of Aaron leaving, and it makes me want beat this guy up. But of course, 
I'm not really the type to do either. I would rather find some sane way of fixing the problem. You just let me take care of this situation, sweetheart. He's a drunk, he's violent, and he's not used to New York winters anymore. I don't think he'll be able to keep out of trouble, and I don't want you anywhere near him. His hand covers mine briefly, comfortingly. It makes me want to take him by the hand and lead him outside and down the street to his trailer. But he's at work, and I know I have to be patient. I suddenly feel stupid. He won't be free for hours, but when I left home, all I was thinking about was what I would do to him once he was done work. Maybe he's right, and I'm too damned young to be out here like this. And if I had not come, that creep would not know my face now or know that I'm associated with Aaron, and that will probably cause even more issues for Aaron. He is already talking about a cooling off period, even if it's short. What can I do? I ask him softly, brushing his fingers with mine. Don't let him get near you. Don't let him follow you home. Do you have your truck? His voice sounds harsh, full of worry. I blush. I walk down. It was almost clear out, and I was stiff from earlier, so I needed it. Crap. I really am naive sometimes. Though really, how could I have anticipated that a dangerous jerk from his past would be here? Shit. Okay. Can you get a friend to take you back? He glances at the window again. Daniel is pacing slowly, hands behind back. My stomach flips and I nod. Good. I can't leave my post and take you back home right now. Okay. My heart's in my boots now. Stupid. I just wanted to see you. His smile looks too forced for my comfort. Normally that wouldn't be a problem. But there's just too much going on. With you with this. He looks so tired. I've got to finish my shift without anything else crazy happening. I understand. I'll just stay right here until my ride picks me up. I swallow a lump in my throat and cover my unhappy look with a big gulp of coffee. He touches my back, leaving a tingling spot in its wake. Thanks sweetheart. I'll catch up with you as soon as I can. He leaves me as I start looking through my phone to see what friends in town would still be up after nine, and I'm fighting tears. This isn't how things were supposed to go. There's only one thing in this world that I want just for me and that's him. Cute cars, a rich lifestyle, and some boyfriend thrown at me by my father with his stamp of approval are all luxuries that I can live without. But more and more it feels like I just can't live without Aaron. I'm starting on my second cup of coffee when the door opens, making me jump. It's not Daniel though, but chubby lovable Dr. Whitman, decked out in a forest green coat. He smiles at me warmly as he approaches, and stops by the bar stool that Daniel vacated. Is this seat taken? It is now. I have to force my smile as he settles onto it. How are you doing, doctor? I'm doing well. Though I think I should warn you that it is going to be quite a snowy Christmas. He winks. But at least less people will be going hungry and cold than before. Yeah, about that, I venture carefully, grateful for the sudden and important distraction. Do you have any idea how much the company you hired actually sent over? I still can't quite believe that anyone wealthy would be so generous without any encouragement. I've never seen it before, except with the Whitmans. But perhaps that's part of what makes them special. His smile becomes part wince. As I understand it, they were both early and generous. I apologize about the early part. I let my son make the arrangements this year and he's always been a touch mischievous. I nod slowly, feeling vindicated. I knew it. Jack's responsible for all the mistletoe around or they're in it together. But I keep that thought to myself. It's okay, a whole lot of people now have food and fuel and time for Christmas in the storm. That's more important than anything else. Pass on my apology to your father, will you? The old man's tone is so gentle. I nod, dot and feel my chin trembling. It's been a long day. I'm kind of emotional, especially after coming down here like this, making myself vulnerable to rejection, dot and walking right into drama that I never expected. Clearly Aaron, who stands stiffly at his post by the door, didn't expect it either. Are you all right? 
Whitman asks. You seem rather sad for someone who was just talking about a stroke of luck. I press my lips together and look down. This old man is our own version of Grandpa Woodstock, another New York legend. Everyone confides in him. But this is something I can't even bring up to my own father. Not comfortably, anyway. I need to ask you something before I get into anything like that, I hedge, needing time. Are you responsible for the mistletoe all over town? I can't help but ask. I saw tons of it on the way up, one more over-the-top element of Christmas in Phoenicia, which only makes me suspect the Whitmans even more. There's bushels of the stuff strung up on the eaves of houses, on the awnings of businesses, in doorways, everywhere. His eyes twinkle as he accepts the change of subject. Do you like it? It got me my first kiss with the guy they first like, so yes. But I was wondering the reason why you and Jack put that stuff up all over. His smile widens, and I hesitate. You dot did dot put all those plants up, right? I never said that, he replies cagily. In fact I neither set them there with my hands, nor paid for them with my money. Did Jack? What is going on? Whatever it is, he seems to be way too amused by all of this. I'm afraid that you would have to ask him, is his infuriating answer. But you aren't actually upset over some handfuls of mistletoe, are you? I hesitate. But then I look over at Aaron, who glances my way but stays impassive. Pain grips my heart and I shake my head. Well the short version is, I've met the guy that I first want to marry and he loves me back. And thanks to the mistletoe trick, we kissed earlier. But the guy's older than me, he's got a past, and he doesn't think he deserves me. Neither does my father. I was about ready to just start dating the guy, and face the consequences later. But now his jerk brother is in town, trying to make him go away with him forever. My voice gets a little squeaky at the end, and I stop to fight back tears. Oh dear. Well that won't do at all. His brow furrows as he glances out the window at Daniel's silhouette. The man is starting to rub his arms and hunch over. It's amusing, but it doesn't make me feel much better. I'm really worried that this creep will blackmail him into leaving. Or do something worse. My friend is strong, but he's the kind of man who will sacrifice everything for someone he cares about. I can't let him leave to protect me. I need to find a way to help him stay. He looks over at Aaron as well, and then smiles knowingly. Have you told this man how you feel about him? I kissed him. I look at him in confusion. He chuckles. Oh I understand. Well kisses can mean many things. You need to tell him everything. Give him the reasons why you offer your heart. Give him a reason to stay so that he will never give up. I don't know if he's incredibly wise or drunk as hell, and determined to sound profound, the whole town knows he has a weakness for schnapps, especially around the holidays. It works though. I know what I have to do suddenly, as if a puzzle piece has finally snapped into place. Thank you, I say quietly. That won't be easy to do but I'll find a way. If I can. You're quite welcome. Now as I understand it, you probably want a ride out of here so you can avoid that nasty little fellow on the sidewalk. He winks, and I manage a smile. Thank you. Yes I would. I am going to stay out of his way, and work as hard as I can against his purposes, by taking Whitman's advice. I try to sleep for a while after I get home. I manage a nap, still half in my clothes, the covers pulled up to my chin. Around midnight, my father stumbles past my door on the way to the bathroom and peers in, as if confused by the open door. I pretend to be asleep, and he moves on. Later, I roll over and look at my phone. It's 3.30 in the morning, half an hour to last call. Dad won't be out of bed until it's time to clean up for late morning service. I shouldn't do this. But Whitman's words ring in my ears. The terrible sense that time is running out, and that I have to act now to make sure that Aaron stays, haunts me as I pull my coat, scarf and gloves back on and stomp into my boots. I don't quite beat Aaron home. Fresh snow is scraped off on the steps leading up to his door, and his lights are on. I walk up to the door stealing myself and knock twice. I hear excited barking and then footsteps. 
A few moments later the door opens, spilling warm air out onto my chilled face, stinging my skin. Aaron barely has his coat off, and his hair is still must from his hat. His eyes widen when he sees me. You shouldn't be here, he protests, and I just smile and brush past him into the trailer. Moose ambles up, thumping his tail. I give him a friendly scratch as Aaron sighs and closes the door. Damn it, Jules. I think I should be here, I insist softly. I think we have some unfinished business. We can't. I can't. He moves past me, settling onto the tiny brown built-in couch and dropping his shaggy head into his hands. I'm flattered as hell but, he starts. I scowl. Don't give me that. You want this as badly as I do. I know that I can put an end to this argument right away, in a way he's not going to have much power to resist. Mostly because he won't want to. But as I move closer to him, and I see the bleak look in his eyes, I can't help but hesitate. I want him on board without any kind of influence. Look, I say softly as I stand over him. I've had a crush on you since I first saw you, okay? Then you became my friend, but I never stopped wanting you. It's only gotten worse over time. He closes his eyes and tips his head back like I just slapped him. I wonder how he spent so long alone. How could any woman see that look and not want to hug him and make it better? Because he's big and scary looking. So is Moose, and he spends a quarter of his time being cuddled by small children. It's been that way for me too, he admits, and my heart aches at the desperation in the back of his eyes. I don't want anyone else, ever. I want you. No lie. But I'm not good for you. You deserve. I deserve to make my own damn decisions about who I choose to be with, I reply insistently. I want to be with you. I want you to stay here and build your life here like you've been doing, but I want you to build it with me. You know we'd be great together, we always are. He stares at me in amazement. Please, I say softly as I walk right up to him, reaching over to run my hands through his shaggy hair. Don't let anyone get in the way. Not Daniel, not my father. We both want this, don't we? I want it, breathlessly. Even if it ends up hurting. He's in so much pain and he's so isolated. I want to fix it. I don't know much about relationships, but when you really want to sleep with the guy who makes you happier than anyone else, isn't that a good thing? Especially if you're both single and into the idea? That gets me a thin smile. Normally, yes. But you're forgetting that you're the preacher's daughter, that you're in training to replace him, and that in general, you're an angel, while I'm. You're what, Aaron? I glare at him. If you say you're just like Daniel, you're going to catch hell for it. He holds up his hands, shaking his head. No, but I'm not great. Even though I didn't touch that guy they popped me for, I've broken the law a lot. I'm not innocent of wrongdoing. I was the club's lookout. I helped guard their clubhouse. I didn't go to that bank knowing Daniel planned to rob it, but I was still there. And I stood there too long yelling at my brother to stop instead of stopping him. The guilt in his voice tells me that's the real reason he's still so ashamed, maybe even the reason he accepted the jail sentence. He didn't save an innocent man from his brother's fists. He was a bystander instead of a hero. And you think that I deserve someone who would jump in to protect me right away. No hesitation. He nods slowly. Yeah. Yeah, I do. It's funny, because you're one of two people in my life that I trust completely to do just that. Otherwise, I would never have fallen in love with you. He flinches away from my smile like he's staring at the sun, and I wait patiently until he looks back before going on. That big bad part of you that you think would scare me off, it only comes out when you need it. I don't know how you were when you were 24, but I know that that part of you would jump to protect me, or any other innocent person around here now. He can't speak right now or look at me, so I bend over and hug him tight because I can't hold back anymore. He wraps his arms around my waist and pulls me against him, burying his face against my chest. The feel of his breath against my skin, even through the weave of the scarf, makes me tingle. I tremble slightly, knowing he is about to discover a secret I've carried most of the night, just for him. 
if anything can pull him from his grief and doubt, it's that. Maybe I am a better man now than I was then, he mumbles. But I still don't deserve you, baby. If you want me you should leave that decision up to me, I murmur soothingly, stroking his hair. It's my choice. It's yours too. Respect that. And then I let out a little laugh, and finally unleash my confession. Besides, I'm not perfect. He blinks up at me slowly, astonishment gradually replacing all signs of self-loathing. Well damn. I lean down and kiss him, and he squeezes me tightly against him before his mouth runs down from mine, sliding over my throat. My eyes roll closed. Oh yes. Then his mouth moves lower and he unties the scarf and throws it aside to get it more of my skin, and stops dead. He notices, finally, that there is no collar to unbutton. The skin beneath is bare. Chapter 7 Julia Holy shit, Aaron mumbles as I slowly tease open the coat to reveal myself. It took all my nerve and willpower to walk out my door like this, and the look on his face is worth it. I'm still blushing, and hoping he's too captivated by the view to notice. You, were really committed to this idea, he murmurs in a tone of delighted shock. I have to press my lips together to keep from giggling. Deep breath. Um. Well yeah. I barely know anything about this sort of thing, but I thought I could get your attention by being a little, creative. He looks up at my face and chuckles warmly, shaking his head. You're blushing like crazy, baby. Yeah, well, I say a little more seriously, if I have to go out of my comfort zone to catch your attention, it's worth it. He swallows. You've got all my attention. Always have. I nod, feeling some of my embarrassment fade. Good, because if it had been five degrees colder then I would have frozen off. Oh gosh no none of that. I don't want anything bad happening to any part of you. My knees get wobbly at once. Oh boy. It must have taken a lot of strength for him to pull back from what I hope will become his favorite pillows. But he looks up at me again and says, Wait, Dot are you using your body to convince me to stay here? Kind of sinful, isn't it? Half amused, half dubious. I'm here because I love you, and you make me weak in the knees you big dope. I do, he mumbles. I'm crazy for you. I'll blow my savings on a ring tomorrow if you want. Don't you dare. I don't want anything that fancy. My heart is absolutely singing, and from the way he's practically vibrating out of his clothes, I suspect it's the same for him. Chapter 8 Aaron I watch Julia sleep, my whole body still shaking. I haven't ever busted so hard in my life. I think I started screaming. That's all right. The trailer's well insulated, and there's no one around for a half acre on either side. And as I lie there, feeling so light and loose that I could float off the mattress, I think to myself, I could go for another round of that. Every night, for the rest of my life. It's more a taste of heaven than a man like me deserves, but she's offering, and I'm starved for it. I still don't feel like I'm good enough for her. I'm not sure that any mortal man could be, but then again, I'm biased. And since she keeps insisting on pushing the issue, I figure I had better just find a way to be an even better man. I brush stray hairs off her forehead as I stare down at her. I knocked her out. Poor baby. I didn't even mean to. But that look of astonishment she wore before her eyes rolled closed told me volumes about her inexperience. I'm humbled that she chose me to be her first. Damn, I'm glad I held out so long. But seriously, this is the first time that my brother's nickname for me doesn't seem ironic. I doze for just a little while, bundled with her in my comforters, before her warm curving softness and her scent wakes me. It's still dark. I should be waking her up, and telling her to dress and sneak back home before her father wakes up. I start kissing her neck instead, but suddenly I jump out of bed when Moose starts barking. It's got to be some time later, there's faint light coming in from outside. I can hear the anger in my dog's bark as I yank on my clothes and grab my bow. Then I hear the thumps as of someone trying to bust in my garage door, 
and I know. Screw Daniel. I come walking out with Moose on a leash in case my brother has a gun. Daniel is there, trying to get in my shed door with a crowbar. He's getting nowhere against the heavy-duty lock. Idiot. He sees me and then sees Moose, and his eyes get very wide again. Once again the guy's been drinking, and it's messing with his judgment. What are you doing, Daniel? I demand. It's not even dawn yet. Well below freezing. My spit crackles as it hits the grass, and I walk in his direction quickly, the crossbow I'm not supposed to have pointed at him with my free hand. He drops the crowbar and steps back. I told you I'd make trouble for you until you agreed to come with me, he stammers, his eyes glued to Moose, who has stopped barking and is now just growling. And I told you that was not a good idea, Daniel. I've got you on my security cameras, breaking and entering. I point up at the deer cams I have hidden in the pines on either side of the shed entrance. You'd set the pigs on me. They'll put me away for life. Moose's growling drops an octave and jumps several decibels in response to Daniel raising his voice, and my brother presses back against the shed door. Now you listen here, you little shit. Back when I was an idealistic kid whose life you wrecked, I thought I owed you because we were family. But then I went in the hole for ten years and served four years parole for a crime I was trying to stop you from committing. He holds his hands over his head, eyes huge now, as if suddenly realizing that he's put himself into deep, deep crap, and there's very little he can do about it but beg. Hey, now come on. I'm desperate here. I need your help. Don't you get it? Oh, I get it. You've screwed up in yet another state, and you want me around to keep you safe from however many hoods down in New Orleans want to kick your butt. But as I was saying, I've already gone above and beyond for you, and that was the last time. I advance on him, short-leashing Moose so he can't take a chomp out of my brother before I have my say. If I had gone down for something I'd actually done, that would be one thing. But even all of that was shit you dragged me into. I owe you nothing. In fact, you owe me. And the credit store is closed, brother mine. Back off. He swallows, taking a deep, shuddery breath. You know... I know you have me on camera trying to get at your bike, but ah, uh, you're also on camera with a crossbow, and you've got a felony record just like me now. His eyes glitter. I stare at him coldly, unable to believe that this dumb son of a gun is still pushing me. Okay, fine, we're at a Mexican standoff over that. You still can't really mess with me. You've got nothing on me that can force me to leave. The door to the trailer clicks open, and Julia walks out sleepily. Her hair is must, her eyes are drowsy, and she has a love bite showing where her scarf is askew. My eyes widen slightly. Shit. Daniel looks between her and me, and a slow grin breaks across his face. Yeah, I do. I've been asking around, brother mine. Isn't that the preacher's twenty-year-old virgin daughter? Twenty-one, I say defensively as she sees us and freezes. And not a virgin anymore, I'll bet, he laughs, and my heart sinks. Chapter 9 Julia What do we do? I can't quite keep the panic out of my voice. I've just made it that much easier for Daniel to uproot Aaron from here. All Daniel has to do is tell my father, and even if Dad doesn't drive Aaron out of town, he'll probably make Aaron so uncomfortable that he'll flee on his own. I'm finding out the hard way that nothing kills a good afterglow like being caught by the wrong person. But I'll be damned if I let some drunk, corrupt bastard mess up my future with Aaron. Well, either I find my brother and beat him up before he can talk to your dad, and maybe I'll go to jail for it. Or I let him spill the beans to your dad, and I probably get run out of town. He sounds so frustrated, that I feel like a complete idiot. I got him into this. We're cuddled together for a few stolen moments on his couch, before I have to hurry home and grab a nap before Dad gets up. Let me help. I can reason with my father. He shakes his head. How the hell are you planning to do that? I'll find a way, okay? Besides, it's better that he hears about our relationship from me 
than from some horrible jerk who is just saying stuff to drive us apart. My voice shakes as I plead with him. He frowns and folds his arms. I certainly think we had better warn your father and some others about Daniel being in town. Not the deputy, though. Earl will just think I invited Daniel here and that things went south. Darn it. Earl. I sigh. I'm getting sick of prejudiced people, even if they generally mean well. One day, I'll get every last one of them to stop judging people they barely know. Honey, you're not going to be able to work miracles, he says sadly, but I shake my head. I believe people around here can be better, or I wouldn't want to take over my dad's job. I look him firmly in the eye. Meanwhile, I'll go home and warn dad about Daniel. If we're lucky, maybe people will be madder at him for stirring things up during the holidays than they will be at you for having a shitty brother. I kiss him goodbye, aware of his taste in my mouth, his scent all over me. I feel like I'm carrying him with me, and it gives me strength on the dark, cold walk home. Strange things are happening in this town, and I have no idea how to take some of it. I don't mind pranks, windfalls of food, even the odd blizzard. But a drunken older brother who is scheming to take away my man? I can't wait to see the back of that bastard Daniel. I'm worried I won't notice him if he's following me on the walk back, and I take a circuitous route just to make sure there's no one behind me. I'm walking back down the hill toward our church when I hear a scuffle up ahead. I carefully move up to the corner and peek around it and see Daniel getting his butt kicked. Not by Aaron, though. The woman in question is a tall, statuesque redhead, way underdressed for the cold, and currently beating Daniel over the head with her Fendi bag while screaming at him at the top of her lungs. Lights are already going on in the houses nearby. What the heck? Just give me your purse and stop making problems. Take it then. She thwacks him with it so hard that it sounds like she's got a brick stowed in her little purse. Then she yanks out an honest-to-God canister of bear mace and blasts him with it. I just stand there staring. Oh my gosh. Who is this crazy city woman, and where did you find her just in time for this guy to get a much-needed stiletto heel up his butt? Daniel goes down yelling and holding his face. The redhead starts stalking off. I'm still hesitating about stepping in when Earl, out cruising the town for lost drunks, bleeps his cruiser siren and pulls up to the biker. I draw back behind the corner, blinking slowly. Then I call up Aaron. Hey sweetie. Before you go back to sleep, uh, I think we won't have to worry about your brother for a few days. I leave him laughing as I walk the rest of the way home. The reprieve is more than welcome. It means Christmas without interruption. It means that if we're very lucky, Earl and the guys at the state police will check warrants in New York and New Orleans, and that will be the last we see of Daniel. It really looks like Aaron's luck has changed. And I know that mine sure has. Dad is still passed out in his room when I get home. I'm slack from exhaustion and satisfaction, and I have to wrestle with a faint sense of guilt as I walk past his door. But as I change into my flannels, most of what I feel is contentment. We'll find a way to work this out. God willing, we'll even find a way to get Dad on board. I don't shower. I go to bed with the scent of Aaron on my body and fall asleep smiling. The next two days are a busy, happy blur. Holiday festivities mix with storm preparation, and by the time our small Christmas dinner comes around, both my father and I are ready for a reprieve. Unfortunately, the break we get is thanks to a big Christmas snowstorm. Are all the storm windows in place? My father frets a little. Is the snow removal gear inside? It won't do us any good if it's out in the shed. It's fine, Dad, I handled it all. Compared to my dad, I'm so calm that I could be floating on a cloud right now. I snuck out to Aaron's trailer early this morning again, and we made love until we both couldn't move. I would be doing that again tonight, but the damn storm's coming in. Two to three feet of snow expected in 24 hours. At least it gives me an excuse to sleep in tomorrow. I come to stand with my dad and look out the window at the big flakes starting to swirl past outside. The sky is leaden, the wind keeps rising to a whine in the eaves, and my father tenses up each time the windows rattle. So this brother of Aaron's made bail? 
He's trying to make conversation, but I can tell from the topic that he's looking for reassurance. Yes, he did, down in Kingston. I know it wasn't Aaron who paid it. I wish he was here. I would just feel safer with my man around now that his brother is loose, even if he's an hour's drive away in a growing blizzard. Are you sure? He eyes me worriedly. Pretty sure. No one's matter about that creep being out than Aaron. He doesn't want Daniel anywhere near here. Well, he'll probably get his wish, at least for the night. Only a crazy person would be out driving in this. My father rubs his face. What did they say the chances are of a blackout? We have three generators now, and Aaron's bringing by two more in a little while. I just got off the phone with him. If people end up blacked out at length, we can have heat, light, phone charging stations and food for them for three days. I touch my father's arm. He's starting to answer when someone knocks hard on the front door. That must be him now. I cry out excitedly and run down the stairs. It's a stupid mistake. The kind that makes you wish you could rewind the world by 30 seconds and make a different choice. I'm inexperienced, in love, and have underestimated the determination of a crazy person with a vendetta. None of those things are really an excuse. I throw the door open before checking through the peephole, and before I can do anything, Daniel is shoving his way inside. Chapter 10 Aaron I'm doing the most exhilarating mental calculations in the world as I stick both generators in my sidecar. If all she wants is an inexpensive ring, I can go down to the city and buy a nice one as soon as we're through with this storm. I can do that on this next paycheck without dipping into savings much. Moose looks at me and whines. Sorry big guy, no room for you in the cargo. Once he's seen to and shut up in my trailer with the heat running, I take the bike down to the church. I'm determined to make sure that whatever happens with this storm, Julia and her dad will have power, heat and light to spare no matter how many people shelter there. As I drive, I'm going over my speech. Reverend, I have to come clean with you. Your daughter and I are crazy about each other and I want to marry her. Simple, straightforward. It's probably best. Especially since, if I ask for his blessing now, it won't matter anymore what Daniel says. I'm starting to feel almost optimistic about my talk with the Reverend when I see a car parked almost sideways in the church driveway. It's a brown sedan battered one tire flat and the side window cracked. I stare at it, knowing a stolen and drunkenly parked car when I see one. Daniel, you son of a gun. I park my bike and break into a run through the snow, thinking fast. I know the grounds, I know the building, I know that the storm doors on the house's basement coal chute need to be replaced and will be unlocked. I run around the side of the church toward the house, headed straight for that rust-colored slanted door. I pull it open as quietly as I can and scramble down the steps beyond. The basement is black, but I always have a light on my belt. I don't have any weapons, I think, as I sneak up the basement steps and listen at the door. I can hear faint voices, probably coming from the living room, by the sound of them. I quickly push the door open and sneak into the kitchen. For a moment, I am tempted. The knife block on the counter is within arm's reach. I could grab the biggest knife or the cleaver. I could end this in a very final way. I could kill my brother in front of the love of my life and her pastor father who is already nervous around me. Absolutely not. I'll find another way. As I make my way down the hall, I hear the conversation going on and my heart sinks. This isn't a family meeting, Julia insists. This is a hostage situation. You're not wanted here. The only reason we have to sit here is because if we don't, you're gonna beat the hell out of both of us. You said it yourself. That's right, Daniel laughs. I did. See, Reverend, my poor dumb brother is gonna leave with me tonight, and we're going down to New Orleans where the Snow Queen isn't on a cocaine binge and working overtime. If he doesn't, I'll make his life a living hell. Starting with rearranging his little skank girlfriend's face. How dare you talk about my daughter this way? The Reverend sounds ready to fall over in fear, but he's still standing up for Julia. 
I admit, I'm a little proud of him. Outside, the wind is starting to really howl. It worries me, but nowhere near as much as the idea of my brother and Julia in the same room together. I do a quick check around the door frame and see Daniel sitting with his back to me, idly holding Julia by the hair. His coat is off in a pile on the floor. He doesn't have a gun. He does have his hands on my sweetheart, though. You tell your daddy what you've been doing, you little skank. Don't make a liar out of me, or I'm gonna start knocking your teeth out. Let go of me, you creep. Dad already knows I'm in love with Aaron. Daniel lets out a laugh as her sharp cry of shock or maybe pain cuts off her words. But does he know you're sneaking around behind his back sleeping with Aaron? Oh damn I think, wincing. Everyone's voice erupts at once, exclamations, arguing, total chaos. I see my chance and bolt into the room. Julia turns and sees me coming. Her face lights up, and she immediately elbows Daniel in the side and pulls away from him when his grip loosens. I crash into him from behind, a second later. Daniel yells in shock as I lift him entirely off his feet, what the heck? Sorry I'm late, I tell the Reverend and Julia as my brother kicks and wiggles in my grip. I was having trouble fitting both the generators in my sidecar. How the hell did you get inside the house? Daniel is still struggling like a kid, but he's getting nowhere. I've worked on the place for years, I reply coolly. I look over at the Reverend. I'm also sorry for any trouble this jerk has caused. He's on his way out the door. The Reverend gets over his shock quickly and heaves a sigh of relief. Yes, please get him out of my house. Wait, wait, wait. Come on now. Do you really want to take this guy's side? He's a felon. We're in the same club. Daniel probably weighs a ton as he twists around, struggling, but I'm so angry I can't feel it. Instead, I'm fighting the urge to break his damn back. We were in the same club, I growl. I gave up my freedom to save yours, and now I'm done with you and that life. Oh, shut the hell up. You chose to be a damn martyr. You chose to take the fall in my place. Yeah, I told you to do it, and I promised to take care of you while you were inside and to leave you alone once you were free. But you were the one who was dumb enough to believe me. His taunts hit home, hard. My muscles start to tighten around his ribs. I can literally break him over my knee, if I want. Julia and her father are watching me. I stop tightening my grip. So it's true, the Reverend muses. He accepted incarceration so that you would remain free, when he did nothing to that man. I told you, Julia sighs and goes quiet, shaking her head. Look. Daniel waves his hand still looking ridiculous dangling from my grip. We're both criminals. We belong together, well away from decent people like you and your lovely daughter. If you're gonna throw me out, throw him out as well. My heart sinks. I sigh and look at the reverend. I'll leave if you want. He scowls at me, surprising me. Don't you dare. We have a lot to talk about. As for him, I'm calling Earl to come pick him up. He walks over to the coffee table and picks up his phone. His hands are shaky but he seems all right. I nod and cart Daniel over to the door. You can wait outside, I tell him, doing my job even though it's my night off. But wait, my jacket, he protests as Julia gets up to unlock the door and open it for me. Come on man, I'll freeze. Earl will be up in five to ten minutes. This town is tiny. I reply patiently as I step out onto the porch. It's ten degrees out, he yells in a final protest. Exactly. I pitch him off the porch and into a snowbank. He lands safely but sinks deep enough that he's stuck flailing like a turtle on its back. I go back inside and shut the door on him. Good riddance to that relic of my past, now to face my future. I square my shoulders and walk back in to face the reverend. Everything I rehearsed has fled my mind, but I still manage to look him in the eyes. I'll explain everything I start but he shakes his head. I don't want to hear it, he replies in a low, tired voice. I know I misjudged you in many ways. But whether Daniel's accusation about you and my daughter is true or not, we're not talking about that. I already have a headache. 
Julia sits quietly in a chair nearby, looking both nervous and determined. What should we talk about then, Reverend? We're going to talk about the fact that you are not laying another hand on my daughter, unless you lead with the ring. That is one thing I will never compromise on, and if Julia weren't so wildly in love, she'd likely agree. Julia speaks up. Actually, I do agree. The Reverend blinks at her. Oh. Then he looks between the two of us. And you? Are you ready to commit to her, and wear a symbol of that commitment? Damn. This is all happening fast. Except it isn't. We've been in love for years. We've only just started finally admitting it, and doing something about it. I guess I'm just surprised that you changed your mind so fast, I admit. I haven't changed my mind. Not entirely. But when I discovered that Julia was in love with you, I prayed for a sign. Tonight, I got it. He takes a deep breath. You had every reason to run in here and do some violence to your brother that would silence him and vindicate you. He just taunted you more. And while he confirmed that you truly are a better man than he will ever be, he also admitted just how little he valued the biggest sacrifice of your life. The reverend goes over to the china cabinet and fishes out three snifters and a bottle of brandy. He pours one for each of us as he goes on. You did not avenge yourself. You just subdued him and got rid of him. Outside we can see flashing red and blue lights as Earl picks up my lightly chilled brother. For the first time in a long time, it doesn't make me sick inside to see signs of a cop around. I can't claim to be a better guy than I was and then not act like one. Well, I'm glad you did. He coughs into his fist and starts passing out glasses. Now, I am going to have a nice brandy and then go to bed because I have absolutely had it with this evening. I expect you two to behave while under my roof. Yes, Reverend, I chuckle as Julia, wearing a look of deep relief, comes to sit beside me. We clink glasses and I take a welcome drink. It's going to be a test of my willpower to stay out of bed with my new love until the storm is over and I can buy her a ring. But her father is right, it's what she deserves. The next year is going to be amazing. I can just tell. Even if the rest of the year is full of storms, we'll weather them together. Her hand slips into mine as her father turns to put the bottle away, and I give it a squeeze. Now I will have two things to thank God for every morning. I'm looking forward to it. The End The Orphan Next Door Chapter 1 Emily As I stare out the window of my new mansion as a handsome man kisses my neck, the only thought in my head is that I wish he would stop distracting me. The thought shocks me as soon as it crosses my mind, James Parrish is beautiful, blonde, and dashing, but it's true. There's something about his hands on me, his lips pressing softly and wetly on my pulse, which leaves me feeling soiled, like he's leaving behind some sticky residue wherever he touches. He's trying harder than usual to be seductive, but after everything that's happened, it's all I can do not to flinch away. I have to hide my discomfort. I had to tell him that it must be the trauma from being on the streets, and the fact that I'm not used to being touched. But afterward, I felt so much worse about myself that I've since made sure to never let on that I don't want him again. It's ridiculous that I have to work so hard to spare his feelings when we've only been together for a little while, and when he's never spared mine. So I continue to let him kiss me and play with my beady Y through my sweater while I distract myself. I stare out past the drops of rain clinging to the glass and down the long grassy hillside to my neighbor's backyard. Grant Norton is out there in the rain letting his two golden retrievers, Pogo and Mike, run. I smile to see him, a warmth running through me that James can't evoke anymore. The trick works, James chuckles, thinking my smile is meant for him, and pulls me closer, nuzzling my cheek as I hold him limply in my arms. He thinks I'm a slow starter when it comes to romance, and I am, having no real experience with any of this. But if I stay cold and still and don't smile, he'll get insulted again and sulk, and kick up drama. So I look at Grant to get my heart racing, and since I can't have him, I turn around and settle for James. 
Ah, come on, Red, what's so interesting out there? He wheedles, tugging at one of my strawberry blonde curls. I look back at him and smile. Everything. It's true. After a life filled with institutional halls and filthy alleyways, my house in Woodstock is paradise. Looking out the window at all that green, gold, and crimson would soothe my soul even if Grant wasn't out there. I drink him in with my gaze as I lie across the bottle green velvet couch that dominates my living room. His tall, broad shouldered form stands under a black umbrella as he tosses neon orange squeaky balls up the slope so the dogs can race after them. His dark hair ripples in the breeze along with his black overcoat. His strong face is a tanned blur at this distance, but I can picture his strong features in my mind. Grant is the best part of living in Woodstock, besides being able to afford it, that is. After spending a chilly spring on the streets of Brooklyn, an amazing stroke of luck six months ago changed everything in my life. Now, I have a big house in the woods, an attractive neighbor, a fridge full of food and a life to look forward to, once I recover from what I went through before it took a turn for the better. Grant, watching him in his yard, talking to him, having lunch with him and his adorable daughter Molly, makes me happy to get up in the morning. His existence in my life reminds me of all I now have to be grateful for, and all I still wish I could have. His pale green eyes, so startling against his tan skin, are full of kindness, and his smile is contagious. A few minutes of conversation with him helps my mood no matter how bad things get. Hey, are you listening, baby? James whines, and I look back up into his blank blue eyes and force a smile. I'm sorry, I didn't really sleep. What did you say? He rolls his eyes, the corner of his mouth turning up. James is almost ethereally beautiful with smooth skin and the face of a marble angel. I used to find that babyish look cute, but I'm starting to get tired of it, along with his whiny tone when he wants something. I said baby, order us up some pizza. I'm getting the munchies, and I know you haven't eaten all day. He's right about that last part. I'm still getting used to the idea that I can fill my belly whenever I want, and have a bad habit of neglecting that need. It's almost as disorienting as looking at my account statements and wondering at all those zeros. It all still seems so foreign to be able to satisfy my hunger whenever I need to. Okay, okay. I dig in my pocket to see what cash I have, none. I usually don't carry much cash around. It's an old habit too, but this one's too smart to leave behind. I can make the order, but I have no cash on me. Can you get the tip? It's a simple request, it's only five dollars. But the petulant look on his face deepens, making my heart sink immediately. Oh come on baby, you know I'm broke until my app rolls out. It's just another few weeks. And I know you're good for it. He gives a charming smile, and my stomach clenches with the sudden urge to tell him to go away for good. I know I have more options in the romance department than James wants me to think. But no matter how many options I may have, none of them are the one I want. None of them are Grant, who is a widower twice my age with a little daughter, and who, as far as I can tell, does not date. I've had a crush on him since I moved in here, well before James got in my face two months ago and refused to leave. James tells me that he's crazy in love with me. He tells me that there's never been anyone like me before, and that he wants to spend the rest of his life with me. Then he comes over and plants himself on my couch for hours. I don't know what love is supposed to feel like exactly, but I'm pretty sure it's not meant to feel like this. I think it's supposed to be more like how I feel when I'm around Grant, or when I see him with his daughter. All warm inside, with no reservations. Right now, there's a chill deepening in my womb as I sit up, using it as an excuse to pull away from him. Fine, I sigh. What kind of pizza do you want? Hawaiian, you know what I like. He waves his beer at me like he's ordering from a servant, and I shake my head as I pull out my phone. Pineapple doesn't belong on pizza. I order a medium chicken pesto with mushrooms and olives for myself and a medium Hawaiian for him. I have stocked the fridge with beer, though I barely touch the stuff myself. I know deep down that these are not the sort of things that a girl should be thinking about with her first official boyfriend. But even though I'm 19 and he's in his 20s, James is definitely the less mature one in our relationship. 
He's very charming when he wants to be, but right now it's clear to me what he thinks. He thinks he's won me, and that he doesn't have to put in any effort at all to keep me. But is he wrong? Why am I still putting up with this? I already know. I don't like thinking about it. Part of it is that horrible, empty ache of loneliness that will yawn inside of me like a canyon the moment he leaves. The other is a deeper worry, but one that has nagged at me more and more. What if he won't leave when I tell him to? I place the pizza order and put the tip on my card along with everything else. By the time I look back outside again, Grant is gone. So baby doll, how much time do we have to play before our food gets here? James drapes his hand over my shoulder and reaches down to touch me. He gives it a squeeze that he thinks is friendly, and while it doesn't hurt, I have to force myself not to squirm. Twenty minutes, I make up, knowing it's more like forty, and he grunts in disgust. That's too little time, he grumbles. Hey, you were the one who wanted pizza, I remind him, and he finally shrugs and nods. Okay, fine. I'll just do you with you twice later. He offers a sleazy grin, and it's all I can do to force an answering smile. Chapter 2 Grant Is Emily coming over to trick or treat with us? Molly wrinkles her nose as I dab on her grease paint. She decided to go as a cat burglar this year, which, to her nine-year-old mind, means a fuzzy white and cream kitty outfit with a robber's mask across her eyes. I'm going to ask her, though I don't know if she's had time to come up with a costume. Hold still, sweetie, I'm trying to get your kitty nose straight. Her whiskers were hard enough. Molly is incredibly energetic, even channeling it into martial arts training hasn't cured her of the wiggles. But Scorminus won't stop me. I'm determined to do daddy-daughter costumes justice. And thus, I am going trick-or-treating with Molly as McCavity from Old Possum's Book of Practical Cats, one of her favorites. It took some planning behind her back, but it turned out well, and Molly squealed when she saw it. A cosplayer friend made it for me. I'm dressed in a black Victorian evening suit, with a stripy orange tail hanging out between its coattails, a top hat with kitty ears, another robber mask and white gloves. I drew the line at face paint. Woodstock is tiny, its houses scattered, anyone who wants a real trick-or-treat haul in the eastern Catskills has to be willing to drive from town to town. That is more than fine with me, I love to drive, and I am hoping to take my sweet neighbor Emily with us. Emily is beautiful and kind, but she has no one. She's modest and hardworking as well, and Molly loves her. As for me, I'm starting to as well. If it wasn't for our huge age difference, I would love to pursue more than friendship with her. But that's not why I want to take her along tonight. It's a lot more complicated than that, actually. I want her with me because I'm trying to pry loose a giant smarmy blonde leech that has attached himself to her. Emily is young and big-hearted, but clearly traumatized and new to having money and a place to stay. The new boyfriend, James Somebody, has circled in on her like a shark smelling blood in the water. He's local and a little notorious, a slacker with half a job delivering bread on his bike three seasons and shoveling driveways one. Like a lot of the spoiled sons of rich Woodstock residents, he lives on other people's money and only works so his mother doesn't know how much he's buying. Woodstock is big on gossip, especially when there's dirt to sling around. James is the son of a Hollywood producer and his trophy wife, his rich dad stashes him here with his mom to keep them out of the spotlight. James, who lives with his mother, with whom he shares a forgettable last name, between girlfriends, looks to be trying to make himself into a trophy husband. I hate gold diggers of either gender. It's one of the reasons I have never remarried. Molly deserves to have two parents, but at least my wealth allows me to stay at home for her, except when one of my businesses has an important meeting, of course. And now, thanks to Emily, I don't even have to worry about vetting a stranger to babysit Molly while I'm gone. I wish I could shake my growing desire to keep her. As easy as it would be to place the blame on anyone else, I can't say it's entirely Molly's fault that I started becoming attracted to my 19-year-old neighbor. She didn't mean to put the idea in my head when she told me I should marry Emily so she could stay and take care of both of us. She just likes Emily and wants to keep her too. 
Molly does not remember her mother, and I'm very glad of that. When we separated, Alicia said that going through with giving me a daughter was what had ruined our relationship. I don't fully understand her reasoning, but she complained that having a baby made her feel too old. I urged her to get counseling. I suspect to this day that it was postpartum depression. She simply wasn't like that before, wasn't like that when I fell in love with her. But Alicia was stubborn and too proud. She refused to acknowledge that she had a problem. I still remember the night she broke down and started shouting at me, while Molly wailed in her bassinet, still too tiny to have any idea what was going on. She hated me, she hated Molly, she hated being sore and having stretch marks, and she hated her life with us most of all. I demanded that she seek treatment before her behavior started endangering herself and our baby, and she just laughed at me. I ended up doing all the caring for Molly, while Alicia refused to bond with her. Three months later she simply drifted out of our lives. I woke up, she was gone, her things were gone, and our joint account had been cleaned out. I went a little crazy trying to find her, her family wasn't cooperative, and the private investigators I hired turned up nothing. I had a newborn and felt, at the beginning, that Molly needed her mother. But Alicia vanished for an entire year before resurfacing again, in an obituary. Persistence and a few bribes had gotten me the full police and coroner's reports. Molly's mother, whom I had loved for half my adult life, had been found semi-nude on a beach in Majorca. She had died out on the beach that lovely night, of what may have been a deliberate overdose on uncut cocaine and medical-grade morphine. Further investigation indicated that she had spent the year and our money jet-setting around Europe, pursuing every pleasure she could get her hands on, unaccompanied by anyone regularly, and contacting no one from her old life. She had been hospitalized for two previous suicide attempts, one in London and one in Amsterdam. I've always shielded Molly from the truth about her mother. She only knows that her mother is dead. Not that she abandoned us and destroyed herself. And certainly not that I half blame myself for not taking steps to get Alicia into inpatient treatment before she disappeared. Since then I've left off dating, focusing on two things, raising my daughter and getting my head back together after learning the truth about Alicia. I don't rattle easy, but that genuinely haunts me. I didn't want to go into a new relationship dragging a lot of baggage, so I haven't even thought about it until recently. Then along came Emily. And now I think about it all the time. Seeing Emily bond with Molly in a way that Alicia never could, makes it even harder not to imagine her as a permanent part of my life, of our lives. But Woodstock loves gossip, and I know what would happen if I actually made Emily that kind of offer. The idea of a rich billionaire marrying a girl half his age, who also happens to be his babysitter, would be tasty gossip fodder. I don't care what the local biddies think of me, but Emily and Molly would have to live with any fallout as well. To spare them, I forced myself to avoid even the semblance of flirting. But I do care for Emily, and I do really want her. She's a good person, and she deserves to have people around her who care about her. Instead, she's sticking with that leech James, who is taking advantage of her inexperience and loneliness. It's the one thing about her that frustrates me, and I can't blame her for it. Her heart is too big, and she expects too little from others. Far less than I would give her if I had the chance. I rarely want to punch a guy in the face on first meeting, but this James guy gets to me. I've had a close encounter with someone like him before. Just thinking of James pawing at Emily in public makes my back teeth ache. Emily may not be mine, but someone has to look after her. That may mean stepping in where James is concerned, so I'm always watchful. I don't want to get in her business unless invited but I'll chuck all decorum out the window if he hurts her. I step back and look at Molly, whose cream stripes and little pink nose are all even now. There we go. Go have a look. I point at the full-length mirror across the bright bathroom, and she hurries over to it and squeals. I lose the fight against grinning. So did I do good. Definitely an A-plus job, Daddy. Now are we gonna pick up Emily? She rocks on her heels, and my smile fades. 
I'm a little worried that Emily's too caught up in James's web and will let him keep her home. Let me call her and find out when. I don't want to presume and end up putting both Emily and Molly at the center of a tense and awkward scene. I punch in Emily's number as we walk out of the bathroom toward the rambling Victorian mansion's giant living room. Both our goldens sprawl out on the couch. I spent two good hours wearing them out by throwing balls and letting them run up and down the grassy slope that separates Emily's house from my own. Neither of them raises their head as we come in, but both start thumping their tails against the couch cushions. Molly goes over to pet them while I wait for Emily to pick up. It takes three rings. As I wait, I feel my blood pressure going up as I imagine her with James trying to answer the phone. James pulling the phone out of her hands and going back to whatever inept act he's imposing on her. I have seen her discomfort at the way he paws at her in public. If there was ever a rosy glow of new love between them, he must have spoiled it quickly with all his butt-grabbing antics. My sister Catherine is still on permanent vacation in Majorca, recovering from the scars that her own version of James left her with. As for my brother, he's always been a version of James. When Emily picks up finally, all the air whooshes out of me in relief. Woo. Hey. Ah, uh, it's Grant. Molly wants to know if you'll come trick-or-treating with us. Oh, oh, hi. Her voice perks up at once, and suddenly I'm calm again, feeling a mix of warm fuzzies in my chest area and a tightening in my groin. Um, well, I, she starts, and I hear the sudden worried hesitation in her voice. I'd like to. I hear rustling in the background, and then a door opens. Who is it, babe, says a young man's voice, and my eyes narrow in annoyance. My neighbor needs a hand taking his little girl trick or treating, she replies in a voice that sounds a touch too cheery. My smile goes lopsided at her small display of cunning. I never said anything about needing her help with Molly, but if anybody asks me, I'll back her story in a second. What? Ah, oh, come on, baby, you have a boyfriend now. You've gotta stay home and take care of me. His deep voice wheedles like a kid's. Take care of you. You're a groan, she sighs, and I hear her stop to take a deep breath before going on. Just go ahead and yell at him, honey. He deserves every bit of it. But she doesn't, instead answering him with frustrating patience. Look, James. We already talked about this. You're going to your mom's tonight. She speaks slowly and carefully, as if to a child with a volatile temper, and my heart sinks. Screw my mom. I want the, he starts, laughing off her concerns, trying to sound charming. He's the kind of guy who is used to letting his pretty face get him what he wants, just like his mother. She'll be drunk by three in the afternoon anyway, she'll pass out before the servants bring out dinner. It doesn't matter. James I sat there and listened to you promise her, she urges, but he just laughs some more. I hear rustling again, and a small sound of discomfort from her, and a hot flush of rage runs through me. Let her go, you son of a gun. I want to say it aloud, but yelling through a phone is pointless. Should I go up the hill and rescue her from Mr. Won't Take No for an Answer's grubby paws? I hesitate, my fist clenched, wanting to do just that. Then a small hand tugs at my pant leg. I look down and see Molly gazing up at me solemnly. She holds her hand out for the phone. I shake my head, but she stamps her foot insistently. I've got a plan, Dad. I pause, wondering what my imp is up to, and then hand her the phone. Molly listens for a moment, frowns tremendously, sticks her finger in her ear and yells, I want to talk to Emily right now. The argument over the phone stops at once, and I'm suddenly grinning again. I should be telling her that that's not an inside voice. I don't. She smiles. Hi, Emily. We're dressed as kitties, and we need you to come help us trick or treat. So tell your stupid boyfriend to go back to his mommy. You've got other friends and he's just being selfish. My grin fades and I stare. My daughter surprises me regularly these days, but this one's a big one. How are you nine? On the other end of the phone, Emily is laughing, and I hear James go, ah shit, almost sheepishly. Cute plus angry can be a potent combination. Duty calls, sweetie. We've already got plans for tomorrow anyway and you're out of clothes. 
Now that wouldn't happen if you let me leave some stuff here, he complains, but she cuts him off gently. James, I haven't even gotten used to living indoors yet. Give me time before I give up my privacy entirely, okay? Her voice is tender and patient. Dotton is the exact same voice she uses with my nine-year-old. Unfortunately, James is less reasonable than even Molly at her angriest and most overtired. Oh come on, don't be a coward. I love you. We should be together. All the time. You mean, your money and I should be together all the time, you damn parasite. My back teeth are still grinding together, and I hold myself still as Molly hands me the phone. Don't do it Emily I mouth, but if he hears me, he'll make even more trouble for her. You shouldn't call me names, she says quietly. It's something Molly says to mean kids on the playground, but in Emily's mouth it is grave and edged with tension. James starts to stammer an answer, but she simply raises the phone back to her ear. I need to get changed. You're doing cats. Ah dot yes, cat burglars actually. She laughs a little. That's cute. Pick me up in 15 minutes. I give Molly a thumbs up and snort as she bounces in place. Sounds good. See you then. She hangs up, cutting off James in the middle of a protest, and I tuck my phone away, chuckling. James zero, Emily and people who actually care about her, one. So when do we pick her up? Molly asks, eyes bright with anticipation. We leave in 10 minutes, I announce cheerfully. Yay. She hugs me around my waist, and we sit down on the couch to pet the dogs as we wait. Twelve minutes later, we pull up to the curb outside Emily's house. It's one of the other huge old Victorians dotting the woods around Woodstock. She's having the old house refurbished bit by bit while she lives in it. They're not going to finish by winter, but all rooms are livable, and some are already gorgeously restored. She told me once that the house was like her, falling apart in some places but becoming new and lively again. No wonder James keeps trying to move in there while she struggles to keep him out. When I first found out that a New York State lottery winner was moving in next door, I expected some brash, newly rich kid. Someone a little bit like James. Instead I got Emily, endlessly grateful for every bit of her new life. She's told me only a little of the nightmares she's gone through, but I can see a lot of it in her eyes still. She has the haunted expression of someone who spent most of her life so isolated and starved for love that even crappy fake fast food romance like the kind James is offering feels good to her. The door bangs open seconds after I pull up, and I see James come stomping out. He doesn't seem to notice my white SUV, which has darkened windows. Hands shoved deep in his pockets, he turns the corner and walks quickly down the street, shoulders hunched against the deepening cold. I watch him fighting the urge to laugh at him as he retreats back to his mother's house where he belongs. He disappears around the corner at the end of the street, and I sigh with relief. Well, that's one problem out of the way. Temporarily, anyway. Then the door opens again, and I look up, my heart lifting. Emily comes out, her strawberry blonde curls shining in the dying sunlight, a pink puffy overcoat not quite concealing her slim curves. She's not in costume, but as her soft sea blue eyes settle on my SUV and light up, I see she has a sparkly tipped cat teaser toy in her hand. Chapter 3 Emily I know I shouldn't let myself feel guilty about leaving James behind to fend for himself this Halloween. It's not my fault he changed his plans the moment he discovered I had some that didn't involve him. If I ever do anything he dislikes, he makes it seem like I've committed a crime against him. When we first got together, I was so starved for love that I was desperate to please James. Any dissatisfaction he showed was my signal to scramble to make things better, so he would stay, so he would still love me. But soon I noticed that all that attention, work and support I was giving went only one way. He never gave anything back. I've started getting stomach aches whenever I think of James. He is still beautiful, he can still coax a smile from me, and he has tons of friends around town that he promises to one day introduce me to. But after months together, I keep looking at what he says he'll do, and what he actually does, and I'm finally seeing the huge differences between the two. The problem is, the man I really want is too good for me. 
But right now, sitting next to him in his car as we drive around Ulster County looking for houses with welcoming lights, I can pretend that's not true. I can pretend that this is my family. All right, Daddy, don't forget to turn up the road ahead. If we don't get the big house at the top of the hill, you won't get your booze cordials. Molly is using a pen light to peer at a makeshift trick or treating map on the clipboard in front of her. Grant chuckles. Wouldn't want that. He sounds just a touch embarrassed, and I smile in the safe warm dimness of the seat beside him. James doesn't understand that there's a difference between someone who has never been loved and one who has never loved. I might scramble after affection like a starving dog, but that doesn't mean I'm not wary of being poisoned. In the end, like the dog, I have to make a choice, take the risk or spend another night hungry. Without Grant around, I might have been desperate enough to cling to James. But right now, when no one is making demands on me aside from company and a bit of babysitting and car watching, I have something to hang on to besides him. Not just Grant, but the very idea of family, of closeness, of spending time out with people you love, and of holidays that mean something. I can't help but think back on all those desolate years in the group home, with not a single card on Christmas, and only dirty snow clinging to the windows and turkey loaf for dinner. I could never understand why nobody wanted me, but even foster parents would not take me. Instead I was stuck trying to live peacefully in a place where the rejects go to live. But instead of being a violent kid, or disabled, or too defiant to survive anywhere like a lot of the other kids at the home, I was just dot shy and ordinary. I meant no harm to anyone. Yet even the craziest bullies left me alone once they found out about my past, found out that I used to be called Ebony Christchurch. As horrible as it is, I actually wish I had known about my parents before I grew up. That whole time, I had no idea why nobody wanted to adopt or even foster me. Now I know they were just afraid I would turn out like John and Ellen Christchurch, the biological parents, I can't remember. One of the things I like most about Grant is that he knows, but he doesn't care. He's told me more than once that it doesn't matter who my parents were, it only matters who I am. I have always tried to be kind, gentle, thoughtful, not like my father. And not a worm, like my mother either. So what's the hall look like so far? I ask Molly cheerfully, forcing my attention away from thoughts of my past. Two and a half bags, including four full-size Snickers. Molly declares proudly, and I hear Grant chuckle beside me. Definitely an improvement from last year, except that Mrs. Exeter is now doing fun-sized M&Ms, down from full-sized last year. Gonna have to downgrade her house. From her tone, she believes this to be a real pity. Then she flips back a few pages on her clipboard and actually marks a checklist. It's all I can do not to giggle when Molly gets going. She's precocious, smart, cute, and sometimes a bit of a pain in the butt, but she's nine after all, and it's never that big of a problem. Grant has done a good job with her. Sometimes, when Molly begs me to stay longer, I wonder if she wouldn't do even better with a mother figure around. But I'm not her mom, I'm her babysitter. I've never had a mom myself, how could I possibly know how to be one anyway? You're very quiet, Grant says speculatively as we pull up at the next house. It's James's mom's mini mansion near the hilltop. My throat tightens. That's James's house, I start, and then go quiet as I realize I have no idea at all how to explain why I don't want us going near it. I'm not sure his mother is giving out candy. Might as well try. Molly chirps and opens the door, bounding out before Grant can follow. Hey, hey, hold up. He looks back at me. Stay in the car where it's warm, I'll take care of this. I nod and he shuts the door, shutting out the chilly air. I sit back against the cushioned seat, sighing out all my air, and watch through the tinted window as he trots after his speedy daughter. She's knocking before he's halfway up the walk, and the door opens. James's tall, blonde mother, face so taut with plastic surgery that it looks stretched over a frame, appears with a pumpkin-colored bowl of candy. She smiles down at Molly, and then something happens that startles me so badly I don't know how to react. James pushes the door wide open and all but shoves his mother out of the way as he grabs the candy bowl. He crouches down to address Molly with a strangely determined look on his face. And he starts asking her questions. 
I can't tell what he's asking exactly, but between his expression and the quick way she takes a step back from him, I'm suspecting it's pretty aggressive. His mother puts a hand on his shoulder and pleads half audibly. He shrugs her off and keeps hammering Molly with questions as she backs up another step. Oh damn. She's a kid, what the hell is he doing? Horrified, I reach for the door, but Grant gets there before I can step outside. James looks up as Grant says something and his eyes widen. He scuttles backwards through the door as if Grant took a swing at him. Molly points at him and laughs. His mother shoves him out of sight and comes forward with the candy bowl and an apologetic look. I sit back in the seat and close my eyes, sick to my stomach. My face is burning, being associated with James in any way mortifies me right now, and I don't even know what he said. Oh God, what did he do? As they return to the car, James's mom stands at her door with her hands over her face. Molly is still giggling and Grant is seething. For a moment, used to being the scapegoat, I expect him to start yelling at me. Instead, as Molly snickers and buckles her seatbelt, he sighs. I should have listened when you tried to warn us about this house. Has James been jealous this whole time? He's speaking in as calm a voice as he can manage, but I hear the edge to it that his giggling daughter misses. Jealous? Oh no. Not this again. He's jealous of everyone I spend time with who isn't him, if that is what you mean. Not that kind of jealous. He turns a tight smile on me. He just interrogated Molly about the nature of our relationship. My heart pounds even harder. I'm blushing so hard it hurts. Am I allowed to hate James for this, when he's the only one who has ever loved me to any degree? I'm sorry. I should have been more clear. Don't be sorry. It's just that times like this make me wonder why you're with him. He sounds far more worried than annoyed, and I have to fight back tears. It's times like this that make me wonder why I am, too. Admitting it eases some of my confusion. We should talk about this. But not right now. He touches my arm and my lips tremble as I squeeze my eyes shut. Molly snorts as she goes back to sorting her loot. He's dumb. He kept asking me the same question over and over. I don't think he listens too well. No, he doesn't, I admit slowly. Really, he seems a little dot out of it sometimes. It's all the pot and cheap alcohol, mixed with the crazy hours he keeps. I'm almost sure of it. Molly giggles again. He wanted to know if you were sleeping with Daddy. My mouth closes suddenly. Oh gosh. Grant nods his jaw set. That's not the word he used, either. I go very cold inside. What did he say? Chapter 4 Emily You repeatedly asked my neighbor's nine-year-old daughter if I was sleeping with him? Are you completely crazy? We're on my narrow, covered front porch. I've shut the door behind me to keep the heat in and James out. I'm in my fluffy rose-colored robe over a flannel nightie, and the icy wind cuts through both. My voice echoes down the street and off the hills. Two doors down, one of my neighbors turns off his music to listen. I don't care. I'm not going inside until James is well away from the porch. He's not coming in tonight. If he keeps this up, he's not coming in any night. Calm down, baby, James replies casually with a little smirk on his face as if he's amused by how upset I am. He rambles on, oblivious to my reaction and smirking with his eyes half-closed from all the pot, while I turn to ice and stone inside. I can't even understand the noises coming out of his annoying mouth anymore, and when I walk toward him, he doesn't seem to notice. I don't know what I'm going to do until my palm slams against the side of his face hard enough that it goes numb. He lets out a squawk as he loses his balance on the railing, his once casual stance turning to flailing as he launches off the short stairway. He lands on his butt on the walkway below, with his smirk crumbling into a confused look. Somewhere down the street I hear howls of laughter. I ignore the laughing and walk slowly down the stairs toward James, all hell and fury in a pink fluffy robe. He blinks and looks around as if trying to figure out if he tripped, and then the blood returns to his cheek and he claps a hand over it. Ow. 
I stand over him while the wind plays with my hair, my whole body feeling like it's burning inside. His eyes widen as it dawns on him what the hell just happened, and he fixes me with an astonished look. He outweighs me by half, and I'm usually all that is timid and retiring, but suddenly, he's on the ground, and my tiny butt is hovering menacingly over him. I wonder if he thinks he's gone crazy. Finally he stammers, you dot you slapped me. Yeah I did. And there's more where that came from. I move closer to him, and he actually scoots back away from me as I approach. Good. You do not call any girl a little skank, let alone one who is a literal child. If you ever say or do anything inappropriate to or about Molly or any other child in this town, I will track you down. I will beat you up, and then drag what's left of you down the hill to the police station. My fists clench and my voice trembles, and it takes everything I have not to bend down and hit him again. All he is doing is staring at me, blinking. He isn't making a single bit of effort to get up. Are you on bath salts? He finally mumbles. I guess he never realized the volcano of anger I've been fighting down inside me for so many years. He seems terrified of it now, and is still trying to rationalize my rage. I laugh bitterly. Whatever gets you off my lawn and out of my life, you can feel free to believe. But you really messed up tonight, and since you can't even figure that out, it's time for you to go. I ignore the deep panic welling inside of me and just point down the walk. Let your mother deal with you from now on. I'm done. You're breaking up with me? That finally gets him to his feet. His smile wavers back onto his face and he lets out an incredulous laugh. You're kidding me. Over a kid. No, not over a kid. Over your being so inappropriate with the little girl that I babysit that I will never allow you around her again. And God help you when her father finds out about this. I take a step towards him. He smirks and stands his ground, dot and when I don't hesitate, he scuttles back like he did from Grant earlier. Look, okay, I get it, he says as he backs up with his hands spread in front of him. You're obviously upset about something. You're not explaining it well because you're upset, and I don't know, maybe you're premenstrual. I glare at him, and his smile crumbles the rest of the way. I'll come by tomorrow and see if you're feeling better, he mumbles in a rush and turns to hurry off down the street. Don't bother. I call after him, but inside my guts are already curdling as I feel the connection between us start to fray. Loneliness yawns like a chasm in my future, and for a split second a wave of terror overwhelms my anger. There will never be anyone once this one is gone, whispers the fear in the back of my head. The cold starts seeping into my bones and I almost slip as I hurry back inside and lock the door, tears already streaming down my face. I can't get warm even though I know the heat is on full blast. I huddle in my gown and robe on my couch and feel the chill like a patch of ice deep inside me. But despite my panic and despite my pain, I don't call James. He spent months making me realize that sometimes the loneliness I fear is safer than being with the wrong person. And James isn't just wrong for me, he's wrong for the other people in my life, few though they may be. If he was just a danger to me or to my wallet, that would be one thing. But he showed no consideration for that poor child and didn't even seem to be aware that he was doing anything wrong. Or maybe he just doesn't care. One of the things I learned during all those lonely nights of my childhood was to force myself to stop dwelling on how unfair it was, I had no one to care for me. Self-pity has only ever brought me down. But right now, it is so hard not to fall into a depression that I feel like I'm being haunted. Every room in my huge house yawns around me like the vacuum of space, deepening the chill inside of me. In my mind I'm not here, safe in my home anymore. I'm on the street, sleeping beside a dumpster now that I've aged out of the group home I grew up in, scratching bed bug bites that leave scars on my skin for almost a year. I'm starving, having lost 20 pounds in two months, not a pound of which I can spare. I'm outside with another group of street kids, nearly getting stabbed over a dry refrigerator box in a rainstorm. I'm sitting through Christmas morning on my bunk, watching a dozen other kids tear open gifts from distant relatives and charities. My hands are empty. 
I'm in the library, reading old news articles on the computer as I linger there to stay warm, and coming across the story about my parents and how they died. Then my phone is ringing in the pocket of my robe, and I'm back in the present again, heart pounding as I pull it out. Hello? I mumble, my lips still numb. The feelings from my past recede enough that I can think and talk, even with my face streaked with tears. Hi there. Not James, thank God, but Grant, sounding concerned. I heard yelling. Are you all right? My throat tightens and I squeeze my eyelids shut. I don't want his pity. I don't want to look like a basket case. I don't want to scare him off by seeming needy. I can't risk having one of the only people I actually feel good being around walk out of my life right after James. Emily. Sweetheart. His voice chides me very gently, and I shiver and swallow hard. No lies now. Do you need me to come over? I sniffle and then start sobbing quietly. Yes, I finally admit. I'm on my way. Chapter 5 Grant I can't leave my little girl alone any more than I can leave Emily alone. So I go to Emily's to pick her up and bring her back to my home. The moment I walk into her house and see the lost look in her eyes, I know I'm doing the right thing. Within five minutes, I'm ushering her in my door, having wrapped her in a down coat over her robe and helped her into proper shoes. Molly's sleeping, I warn in a hushed voice as I shut the door behind us. She swallows and nods, and I lead her into the house and take her coat. My house is a bit smaller than hers, but it's fully decorated, mostly in warm wood tones, cream and touches of blue. The dogs have woken up and come padding down the stairs to greet us, feathery gold tails wagging hard as they see Emily. Hi guys, she says in a weepy voice as she crouches down to hug them and get some doggy kisses. She's breathing raggedly, fighting a fit of tears with all her remaining strength. I don't know exactly what's wrong but I can guess that it has to do with James's supremely creepy antics earlier. I got an earshot of him within a few seconds of seeing that little creep crouch down to confront Molly. Just that one same question, over and over again. Hi honey. If you want candy, I gotta get you to answer something, is he sleeping with her? No no tell me first, then candy. That's the deal. Is. He sleeping with her. It was all I could do not to lay him out at his mother's feet with one punch for exposing Molly to that. And now it seemed, I have to clean up the rest of his mess. At least it is Emily that needs caring for. That is hardly a chore. As I lead her over to the couch with the dogs trailing after, I can feel her shaking. I do my best to keep calm and keep my voice low as I help her sit down and then sit down beside her. Can I get you anything, sweetheart? I ask, covering one of her hands with my own. The dogs flop down at our feet and watch us, both doing the worried eyebrow wiggle dogs do when they sense tension. She smiles sadly. In a little. Right now, I probably won't be able to keep anything down. Emily, this isn't good. This guy. I hesitate, seeing her lips start to tremble. Okay, look. How about you talk, and I listen? I drag a box of tissues closer. Her smile is thin and wobbly, ready to go away with the slightest hint of additional pain. But I'm not giving it to her. It's why I'm not sitting there crying about the jerk who has latched onto her. Pressuring her to kick James to the curb wouldn't work anyway, too easy for her to view it as criticism of her for being victimized. I confronted him about what he did to Molly when he tried to come over. He wasn't even supposed to come over that late. But he didn't care. He started complaining about his mom smothering him, but I know he basically wanted a booty call. The corner of her mouth tugs up a little bit, as if she's taking bitter satisfaction in what happened next. I smile at her encouragingly. So you gave him hell, huh? Thanks for that. I'm afraid if I did it he'd end up in the hospital, and me behind bars. I'm not lying when I say that the guy deserves it. You're probably right, he tried to say that it was fine to talk like that to a nine-year-old. Then he insulted her, and I… She trails off, going from pale to red and then back again. Sort of, might have committed assault against him. 
I stare. You punched him. Slapped. She's red again, but fighting down a tiny naughty maybe even proud smile. I um knocked him off the porch. He didn't want to come too close to me after that. Holy shit. She should have dressed as Wonder Woman tonight. I blink at her several times, not sure what to say, and then I have to stifle a laugh behind my hand before I wake up Molly. You're kidding me. Um no not at all. He actually was very surprised. But he wouldn't stop no matter what I told him, and he wanted to get into my house when I had already decided not to let him in tonight. She runs a hand back through her tangled curls which have all but escaped her ponytail. Is this his usual kind of behavior? I thought that you were pretty serious with him. I can't keep the concern out of my voice. He's never been this bad. I think that for a while, he was on his best behavior, until he could take a guess at how much Bull would put up with. But he was wrong. She wipes a tear away with her fingers, and I hand her the Kleenex box. You seem pretty upset for someone who just dropped about 170 pounds of dead weight, honey. I can't help but move closer and slip an arm around her. She shivers, and for a moment I hesitate and almost pull away, but then she moves closer and throws an arm around my chest. It takes everything I have to ignore my body's immediate response to her warm softness pressed against me. I haven't had a woman in over six months, and I'm suddenly remembering how much I miss it. I force myself to just sit there, enjoying her sweet smell and her shining hair spilling onto my shoulder as she lays her cheek against me. He's the only one who's ever loved me, she mumbles, and I go cold. I hesitate. If I say that wasn't love, it could throw her deeper into despair. I could confess my own feelings for her, and hope that she trusts it. I have to step carefully, because as loving and thoughtful as Emily is, she is also inexperienced as hell, and scarred. She's confided some about her lack of a family, and I've done the research on her biological parents. The newspaper articles, the morgue reports on her father's victims, the murder-suicide. I have always hoped that maybe she hasn't actually read all those things, but I know it's a vain hope. It's her personal history, after all. Sweetheart, I'm sorry but you're wrong, I say finally, reaching over to stroke her hair as she clings to me. He's not the only person to love you. He's just the first person, and he isn't very good at it. He doesn't treat you well, or the people you care about. And anyone who can't be trusted around a kid, probably can't be trusted with your heart or body either. She presses her lips together and those sea blue eyes get bright again, and I just want to cuddle her until this all goes away. But I can't, can I? I'm too old for her. You don't see me as a kid, she asks softly. Ha. Huh. Oh. No no I don't. I never have. You're younger than me, but you're far from a child. Have I treated you like you are? She thinks about it a moment. I don't have much experience, she admits quietly. Not with people treating me like I'm dot not just grown but acceptable. A sudden ugly suspicion fills my head, and she looks at me in alarm as I tense up. It's okay, I mumble and start stroking her hair again. I just need to ask you some things about James. If it turns out that that bastard has been playing on her insecurities to get his way, I may just beat the hell out of him, grieving mother or no grieving mother. I don't even care if she sues me. She raises her head from my shoulder, her eyes bleary and confused. What is it? Does James know about your past? I ask her softly. I'm praying that I'm wrong about all this, and he's just another dumb kid with no self-discipline or social skills. I told him I was an orphan and grew up in a group home. He knows I'm here because I won the lottery, and that I was on the streets for a while before that. She still sounds confused. Why? Did you tell him anything about your real name or your parents? Like you told me. I am keeping my tone as gentle as possible. I can't just tell her that this G's bad for her and expect it to stick, or expect her to feel strong and supported enough to act on it. I can already tell that James isn't going to let this lie. Not after today's drama. He's a dumb, arrogant kid with an attitude problem, he won't know when to let something like this go. More than that, he's a parasite, 
and he'll be reluctant to give up someone he's using. He was spoiled as a kid, and learned to bank on his looks and manipulation to get everything he ever wanted. He won't believe for a second that slap or no slap, Emily actually meant it when she dumped him tonight. Her coppery brows draw together. No, I didn't. I mean, I almost told him my old name, since I don't think he even knows how to do a Google search. But I never told him that part of my life. Not one bit of it. A huge wave of relief runs through me. To someone like James, a secret like Emily's murderous parents would only be ammunition. If he ever finds out the whole story, I know it will be all over Woodstock in a matter of days, dot and poor Emily will suffer because of it. So you trusted me with that information, but not him. Why? Again that puzzled look, as if she hasn't given much thought to it before. Instinct, she says quietly. That and, I'm taking care of your kid. If you found out I was hiding something like that, you might not trust me anymore. I give her a supportive smile. I want to think that I would understand better than you think, sweetheart, but that wasn't my point. I rub my chin. Let me put this another way then. Would you ever trust James with that information? No, she says immediately, and then pauses. I can see her mind chewing all this over, and she doesn't seem very happy with the conclusion she's drawing. He's used the homeless and orphan part against me in arguments, and when he's wanted something. Telling him my parents went on a killing spree and then finished each other off before the police could catch them would, he. Her eyes widen, and even though I feel bad I have to put her through this turmoil to bring her to these realizations, most of what I feel is relief. She's getting there. Look sweetheart, I know it's your life and I admit I have some ulterior motives but the bottom line is, I care about you. I don't want to see you hurt by this guy or anyone else. We're cuddling again, and her eyes are dry now as she gazes up at me. She has relaxed a little bit. I told him to go away, she murmurs, and I nod at her. But is that good enough? No, no. I'm sorry, but chances are no. Chances are he's going to show up with flowers or bud or some gift that might actually be thoughtful, and he's going to try every day until he wins you back. I feel terrible telling her all this. So he's devoted, not but only because he wants something from me. Money. She laughs sadly and has to reach for another tissue. I'm sorry, sweetheart. It's part of why I keep saying that you deserve better. Because you really, really do. You deserve to be with someone who will make you happy. Someone like me. It's on the tip of my damn tongue, but I can only imagine the emotional whiplash that would cause. How do you know so much about what James will do? She doesn't sound suspicious, just surprised. You don't seem like the kind of person who would end up treating a girl like that, even when you were James's age. I've got about a decade on James, which of course is a lot of time for growing up, but something in her tone catches my attention. How dot old did James tell you he is? Three years older than me. 22. She gives me a blank look as my heart sinks. Why? Sweetie, he's almost 30. Her eyes widen in horror. My heart sinks at the horror in her tone. She really doesn't like older guys, I think, with a mix of disappointment and self-disgust. Look, I know you have lived in Woodstock for a lot of years, but I... Her eyes track back and forth in shock and horror. Yeah, well, he's a local kid, and he's always pissing somebody off, so word gets around. He's a bad case of arrested development. A very bad case. Always in denim and hoodies or skaterwear, dressing like a teenager, acting like one too. Working shitty low-level jobs because he has no focus. Hanging out with younger kids and pretending to be one because he can't keep friends long and the new crop will think he's cool because he brings the smoke. Woodstock has always been full of people like James, male and female, never wanting to grow up or support themselves or anyone else. I love my town but it's got problems, and James is absolutely one of them. Oh gosh how, I mean dot how can someone get to be almost 30 and be that childish she says in shock disgust. I understand him maybe being spoiled as a kid, and I know people my age don't always make the best decisions, but ease. She trails off, hands over her face, and I pet her hair and wait for her. Finally she lifts her head, 
still looking a bit sniffly and red-eyed. You never answered my question. How do you know so much about guys like James anyway? I hesitate. I don't want to bring up my idiot younger brother Evan, unless I have to. Not yet. I have seen guys like James before. I went to Yale with a ton of them. They don't have money of their own since they won't actually work, but they're really used to living lavishly off other people's money. So once their parents get sick of them, they latch onto someone else. I gesture for a moment, trying to come up with the best way of saying this. You are new to being wealthy, you are very young, and you have very little social and romantic experience. You also tend to withdraw from people. I say this as kindly as I can, but she still looks a little embarrassed and has to wipe her eyes again. James is a predator and an opportunist. He probably thought you would be an easy target. I'm just really glad he was wrong. Me too. She takes a shivery breath. Love shouldn't hurt this much. I don't know much about it, but I do know that much. No, no, it never should. Something is wrong if it does. I wish I could have found her before James, so I could have helped her build up her sense of self-respect before he had a chance to pounce. I'm so glad I never said yes to him moving in, she murmured in breathless horror. Maybe I should take a break from dating. I've even thought about just giving up and being that spinster lady with a million pets, she mumbles. The amount of alarm I feel as she states this is almost ridiculous. A please don't do that. At least not the spinster part. I laugh awkwardly and she blinks. I speak hastily. Every unmarried man in the state of New York would be disappointed if you did that, including me. Now she really is staring at me, because I really did just put my foot in it in a gigantic way. I just gave away everything. I feel like an awkward idiot. She just broke up with someone. Even if I wasn't twice her age. She darts forward suddenly, and I feel her soft little lips caress my own. I freeze in place, absolutely astonished, and stare down at her, blinking. My whole body is thrumming with the urge to return the kiss, dot and do a whole lot more. But instead I hold still, my arms still around her but letting her call the play. I'll keep that in mind for when I'm over this mess, she says softly, and I feel my heart leap with relieved amazement. Chapter 6 Emily I'm sleeping in my bed, but somehow I'm also back in Grant's living room, curled in his arms with the dogs at our feet kissing him. Everything is hazy and sweet, but underneath all that is my hunger to feel more of him. What I feel for Grant is far more real than what I felt for James, because there's nothing forced or uncomfortable about it. James's attention lured my starving heart, lured me all the way into bed with him. It's not that I didn't feel any desire for him, he is handsome, and I did want him at first. Love isn't supposed to be like that, Grant reassured me on that weepy night I broke up with James, and more than once in the week since. I believe him. And after his admission and that kiss, I'm starting to understand what it might feel like with the right man. He's twice my age. People will talk. I don't know if I could ever be a good mom to Molly. But still, here I am on the couch with him again, for the third night this week. We kiss like we're starved for each other, our hands working under each other's clothes, and I remember again that beautiful, delirious hunger I felt my first time, before James ruined everything. But this time it's far stronger and far more pure, with no misgivings, no fear. The lights go out. The feeling of his hands on me grows vague as my dreaming mind gropes for tender sensations, Dodden finds no memory to pin these feelings on. Instead, we kiss and kiss endlessly, until I feel his weight sink down over me, and my desire and bliss grow so sharp and strong they wake me up. I sit up, gasping in the dark with my whole body trembling. The fact that it's a dream disappoints me deeply, Dot, but I know it's for the best. Grant is interested, and so am I, Dot, but I have healing to do. Grant and Molly have invited me to Thanksgiving and Christmas, I tell my financial advisor, Aura Northman, during our monthly check-in a week and a half later. It's my first time, um, celebrating. Aura is in her forties and built like a fertility goddess, with long jet-black micro-braids, bronze skin, generous features and intense dark eyes that stare at me shrewdly. 
Emily, the more you tell me about that group home you grew up in, the more I think they were crazy to put you there. How does that place still have its license? I don't know. Grant sometimes talks about suing them. But I'm wondering if exposing them wouldn't do more. I have enough money now. I don't know what I would do if I had the kind of money Grant has. I can hardly figure out what to do with my millions, never mind a couple billion. I know he's invested heavily in many charity and community programs and that he has a huge trust fund for Molly, but my 18 million after taxes is more than enough for me. Especially with Aura guiding me in how to manage it. That's an interesting idea, but you have to do it in a way that won't lead to them suing. Though provoking them to make the first move legally might actually be shrewd if you're planning to see them in court anyway. She winks, and I fight a smile. Maybe. Right now I have some more immediate problems, and I well. I squirm in my plush velvet seat as I sit across the desk from her. The chairs are done up in rosewood and deep burgundy, and the velvet hisses slightly against the back of my forest green wool dress. Emily, you know I told you to come to me with anything. I know you're kind of short on friends right now, since you're out on your own for the first time. It hasn't been that long. I'm just glad to hear Grant and Molly are stepping up. Now what's this about that boy James? I broke up with him, I say, and she cracks a smile. Well it's about time. We'll have to celebrate. Her eyes twinkle, and I know what that means, sugar-loaded cappuccinos at the coffee shop on the corner. Her office in Poughkeepsie is home to a lot of cafes, being right near the college campus. Sounds good. Grant doesn't need me for Molly until late morning tomorrow, so I don't mind a late drive back. I'm proud of myself for getting so used to driving. I have gotten good at it with Grant and Aura's careful help. Good. She checks the figures on her laptop. Well, we're seeing the same kind of slow but steady growth on your mixed investments. Precious metals will be up all through this half of the year thanks to the holidays and end-of-year investments, so you'll see a bonus here. On a conservative estimate with your mixed portfolio, you'll be seeing roughly $1 million a year after taxes. How much that grows will depend on how much you reinvest. I nod, struggling to follow along, as my head is still full of gossip about James and Grant. It's a staggering amount. I can't even imagine how I could spend a million a year. Probably at least half of it. That's wise. She types a few notes as I sit there thinking. And then it comes to me. The mess that James has left me with leaves my head altogether for one amazing moment of clarity. I've got it. You've got what? Aura raises an eyebrow, and her hands drift toward her keyboard. Buy it. She blinks once, and then both her eyebrows go up. By Cranberg House. The group home where you grew up? If I sue them that place will collapse completely, and the kids still stuck there will have nowhere to go through no fault of their own. If I buy the owner out, fire any of the staff who are part of the problem, and take over. Aura's face brightens, now this sounds like an actual plan for your future besides recover from everything in my new house like you've been doing so far. She leans forward, fingers steepling. Tell me more. By the time we leave for the coffee house, we have the basic outline of a plan to approach the absentee owner of Cranberg House about selling. We both order peppermint mochas with ridiculous amounts of whipped cream and a pair of cannolis that threaten both my outfit and my waistline, but at the moment, I barely care. Even with the mess of my breakup, I have things to look forward to now. The gentle heat that's growing between me and Grant. My growing investments. My developing life goals. The list of good things coming my way keeps getting longer. And as for my past, well, it will be a great help knowing that the place that stole my childhood won't have a chance to do that to anyone else. Maybe I really can handle this whole adulting thing after all, and maybe I'm more than just a lucky lottery winner. Maybe it will all be okay, if I can get rid of James for good. So, I know we didn't have time for it during your hour, but I was wondering what happened with your now ex-boyfriend. Have you seen him since you threw him out? Aura slices the tip off one of the cannolis with the edge of her fork and scoops it into her mouth. Every single night around midnight, 
he gets drunk and tries to come by to make up. The neighbors have called the cops on him twice. I sigh and take a sip of my drink, then wipe cream off the end of my nose. So you've never let him in? I shake my head. I have managed to stay strong, mostly because of Grant and Molly. Molly needs to be as far away from James as possible, just like me. As for Grant, unlike James, who half-assed everything, Grant's actions, his words, that kiss, all tell me that he is offering the real thing. I am tired of living on emotional scraps. I want this. I don't want James. No. Once I found out he's 28 and has been scamming rich women for a decade, I was done. He's 28? Her perfectly lined brows go up before crumpling in disgust. You. I suddenly find myself rushing to defend something. It's not his age. I would actually prefer someone more mature than me, but James lied. He's also less mature than me by a lot. Yeah, I'm getting that impression. So what about this guy Grant? You're spending the holidays with him. I know he's a little old for you, but have you ever thought? Aura props her chin on her hand and gives me a thoughtful little half-smile. I mean, it sounds like you're already becoming a part of his life. I take a deep breath and come out with it. Aura is very observant and doesn't like her intelligence being insulted. I love him. And I know he likes me. He's even attracted to me. I just don't know. I chew my lip and then distract myself with a few bites of my cannoli. You don't know what, honey? Aura sits back, an amused look in her eyes. It sounds pretty straightforward to me. You love the guy, and he sounds good for you. As for James, well, his mom can take care of him since she's the one who spoiled him. A weight lifts off my heart at her words, but the apprehension behind it doesn't quite go away. I haven't ever been in love before. What if I mess things up? She gazes at me with those shrewd eyes and I feel a little foolish, but she's still smiling. Then you apologize, learn from it, and try again. Relationships don't usually die on one screw-up, honey. They die from people's refusal to grow and learn to do better by each other. Chapter 7 Emily I'm still thinking about Aura's advice as I pull into my driveway. I drove happily the whole way home. Under the bright moonlight and the glare from the highway lights, I listened to soundtracks from some of my favorite movies, so lyrics didn't distract me from the road. My heart was full of optimism thanks to my time with Aura, and that feeling lasts up until the moment my headlights splash across James lounging against my garage door. For a moment, I fantasize about hitting the gas instead of the brakes and sending him flying through the heavy wood door. I can afford a really good lawyer now, after all. But then I force myself to stop and calm down as best I can. I'm not like my father. Still, I'm good and angry when I finish locking my car and turn to go up the walk. I walk right past James, ignoring him as he tries to talk to me, and only hesitate when I reach the edge of my porch. It's even colder than the night we broke up, my breath misting and a few flakes of snow drifting down. Hey, he calls after me, sounding shocked and outraged. His hand grabs my shoulder, and my skin crawls as I immediately struggle to shake him off. Come on, Emily. You won't even talk to me. I spin around, breaking his grip, my eyes flashing. Do not put your hands on me. You've lost that privilege for good. His hands go up as his eyes widen. Holy smokes, don't hit me again. I put my hands on my hips to keep them from going around his throat. You are pushing 30, James. Do not pull this scared little boy shit with me. And don't play stupid either. You know why I have a problem with you right now. So get the hell off my land. I don't know how I keep my voice down, but apparently the look on my face is enough to unnerve him. But he still stupidly stands his ground. This isn't fair, Emily. So I lied about my age and wasn't polite to some stupid kid you're babysitting. Screw that Brad and her dad, it's not like you need the paycheck. Fear of consequences is not the only reason to be a decent person, James. But if that's the only thing that will work for you, then fine. I'll get a restraining order. Or a seconded Grant's opinion that I should get one, and after this, I'm sold. A restraining order? 
The incredulous laugh in his voice makes me sick. That's completely crazy, Emily. Come on, baby, don't be like this. Don't do this. I love you. No, you don't, okay? Stop it, James. You want my money and my body. You don't want me. And you don't even need any of that, because if your mother will keep putting up with you after you accost a child right in front of her, she is never going to cut you loose. How am I keeping my voice so even? Wrong. Jeez, you are so wrong. The laugh in his voice sounds more nervous than mocking now. Of course I want you. Your money and your booty are all just part of the package. And I like the package. He gives me a sleazy smile, and my stomach lurches. But you don't care about what's inside, I mumble. I turn to walk away, and he tries to grab me again. Neither of us have raised our voices. Neither one of us has knocked anything over. Yet somehow, someone has noticed us. I discover that Grant has let his dogs off their leash mid-walk, when two big, barrel-chested streaks dart up the walk and skid to a stop right beside me. Pogo and Mike stand at each of my flanks, and one of them, Mike I think, lets out a deep growl. James skitters backward again, and I glare at him. Look. You had several chances. You messed up, you lied, and you keep doing both. You never learn. I cannot deal with that in my life. Go back to your mother and let her take care of you. I need to take care of myself. His mouth works, but he hears Grant's heavy tread coming fast through the dark and looks down into the snarling faces of two very protective dogs. And finally, he backs off, shooting me a petulant glare. You know, I get it. You're gonna be a skank to me for a while because you like kids and I don't. That's fine. I'll find a way back in. Hey. Grant shouts, his voice as growly as those of his dogs, and James darts off into the night like a scared boy half his age. There's a pause, and then to my shock, Grant runs right past my gate after James. Oh shit. Everything seizes up inside of me, and I worry for a moment that this is going to end very badly. Grabbing both dogs' leashes, I let them tug me to the end of the walk, but no further. Heel. Thank God they both agree. I can't see the pair on the dim street beyond my front yard, but I can hear their hushed, harsh conversation. Look man, what is your problem? James whines. Stop stalking that girl, comes Grant's cold reply. Leave her alone. Do not bother her again, or I'll make sure you do a lot more than sit in the drunk tank until mommy picks you up. What the heck, hey, that's my girlfriend. We're just going through a rough patch. Mock indignation replaces James's wheedling tone. It's none of your business. It is my business. She's my neighbor, my daughter's caretaker, and my friend. She dumped you weeks ago. Now lay off with this stalker crap and go home. Hey, screw you, man. She is mine. You're not moving in? The sudden sound of a scuffle cuts off his voice for a few moments. Ow. Man, what the heck? You're the idiot who accosted my daughter with inappropriate questions and then doubled down by calling her a little skank. She is nine. I have already described the incident to the local cops. Believe me, they are watching your every move now, and if they don't get you, I will. There's so much danger and rage in Grant's voice that it even scares me. Yet somehow most of what I feel is gratitude. Look, I was drunk. That's no excuse. Get out of here and stay off this street. I hear James's footsteps scrambling off down the damp sidewalk. My heart is beating so hard that I can't move. I realize that their conversation waded into violent territory, and it scares me. Then Grant walks into sight and comes toward me with worry in his eyes. You okay? I shake my head. I'm so tired of this. I never know when he's going to pop up outside my house. He takes me into his arms and hugs me tight, his down coat rustling under my cheek like a pillow. I'm sorry, sweetheart. I'm glad I was outside when he started this. The cold makes voices carry. I cling to him, closing my eyes. I don't want to be alone tonight, I whisper. He freezes for a moment and then draws in a long, shuddering breath. Then he leans back to look down at me. Okay then. Let's pack you a few things. 
You're staying at my place tonight, and in the morning I'll drive you to the police station to file that restraining order. Thank you, I mumble into his chest as the dogs mill around our legs. Chapter 8 Emily Grant insists on being a gentleman. He gets me in my clothes bundled into one of his guest rooms, has a drink with me, and tenderly kisses me goodnight. Then drives me up the wall by leaving and going down the hall to climb into his own bed. Both dogs are in with Molly. I lie there in my bed in the cute mint green silk nightie I packed, and hopeful, and wonder if I dare go down that hall as well. I lie there trying to sleep for several long minutes. Finally I get up, trembling in anticipation as much as with nerves, and creep down the hall. His door is ajar. I listen at it for a moment, and then slip inside, closing it quietly behind me. His bedroom is enormous, dominated by a huge sleigh frame bed with elaborate carvings and a nest of down comforters. He breathes softly in its embrace, and I move to his side, staring down at his sleeping face. I hope I'm not overstepping myself, but maybe he's been waiting for me to make a move this entire time. Chapter 9 Grant I didn't let Emily go. James still can't be persuaded to leave her alone, but since he has not actually been violent, we couldn't get her an emergency restraining order, and the regular process was delayed by the holidays. So as a solution, Emily came to stay at my home full-time. She's staying in her own room, while we try to figure out what to tell Molly. Emily has moved many of her clothes and her laptop in, though she never actually sleeps in that guest bed except to take naps. She sleeps with me, well, eventually she sleeps. We ate Thanksgiving dinner together, and talked about what we wanted to do for Christmas. Emily looks after Molly, while I go to meetings, and when I scramble around looking for a proper Christmas gift for the woman I hope to propose to soon. I don't want to rush her. But every time I wake up to her face, I know that Emily is my second chance at a real love match, and someone who could love my daughter as much as I do. And she seems so much happier with us, she's even stopped having nightmares. No thanks to James though. I hear him banging on the door downstairs and open an eye, checking my watch. 2.15 exactly 15 minutes after the last bar in Woodstock closes for the night. Emily stirs and I kiss her temple, whispering in her ear, shush, I'll take care of it. James is blocked on Emily's cell phone and her house phone now. We have two of my security guys from the city looking after her house, in case that idiot decides to throw another rock through her window. I personally deliver Molly to and from play dates, doctor appointments and school, and every time that idiot James tries to tail us anywhere, I swing right past the police department and he scurries off. The police are getting as tired of his crap as we are, and every time I call them on him, his mother ends up crying on the phone to me about having to bail him out again. I'm losing patience with her as well. Nobody should ever have this big of a blind spot about their offspring. I just pray I can do a lot better by Molly. I'm in flannel pajama pants with my robe hanging open when I show up downstairs and look out the spy hole. James is out there, eyes bleary, face red and hair must. He's forgotten his coat and his breath is misting. He steps forward to bang again, and I open the door and step outside in my slippers, ignoring the chill. Get off my porch, I instruct James in a low cold voice. He stares at me angrily, and I see he's drawn a member in the snow on my SUV windshield. Leave James, I sigh and he spits at me. I duck aside and it strikes the door and I take a half step forward. He scrambles backward away from me, his face screwing up petulantly. You stole my girl you piece of shit. Nobody stole anything from you. You drove Emily away and now you're stalking her. I didn't steal her, I'm protecting her. From you. I stare into his eyes but there's no recognition there. He can't even see that what he's doing is wrong. No, no, you're tricking her, and you're keeping her from me. He stabs a finger in my direction, spit spraying from his lips. And you better give her back before I take away someone of yours. I go cold and feel my fists clench hard enough that my knuckles crack. One, she's a person, not an object, and you're the one who drove her away. Two, 
If you ever threaten me or mine again, the police will be picking you up from the hospital. He stares back at me defiantly, his chest heaving, and I take another step in his direction. The little coward darts away, leaving me standing there shivering more with anger than with cold. We don't hear from him again for weeks after that, as the year rolls on toward its close. Christmas decorations go up, and we get a live tree like we always do, which we'll plant among its fellows on one side of my yard. I make sure to make the yard ablaze with light from Christmas decorations, leaving as few shadows as possible that James could hide in. I don't trust his silence, even though it means Emily gets some relief for a while. It's the first week of December when she belatedly gives me the best idea for a Christmas present. Would you mind if we visited Cranberg House over Christmas? She asks softly. Some of those kids won't get gifts this year. We should bring them Christmas too since you came from there, Molly agrees firmly, and I laugh and nod my concession outnumbered. I'll make some calls, I promise. Locked in my office, I phone up the director of Cranberg, who is on vacation. Most of the staff too. The skeleton crew left includes Marcy, a new caretaker who sounds younger than Emily and a little baffled. It takes her some persuading, including some compensation for her time, but finally she agrees to make the arrangements. We all go into a whirlwind of buying and preparing as we grab everything ten kids will need for a good Christmas, food, gifts, a tree, games and all. Their dinner will be on the 22nd which is the closest day to Christmas where we can get enough staff to take a shift to help us pull it off. Late that morning the three of us busy ourselves running back and forth to the SUV, packing it full of everything we need to roll up to Cranberg, bringing the party with us. We're about halfway through, the dogs are locked in the basement playroom to keep them from getting underfoot, and I'm lugging a stack of boxes out the door when Emily says suddenly in a high, nervous voice, Where's Molly? For a moment my train of thought derails, and I feel a chill roll down my spine. She's probably in the bathroom, I try to tell myself, but I know Emily's instincts for danger are keener than mine. Molly! I call out from the porch, at the top of my lungs. Silence. My world seems to freeze around me, and then a surge of white-hot adrenaline roars through me, thawing me in an instant. Molly! Stay here, I order Emily in case Molly wanders up while I'm running around like a madman. I start looking around everywhere, the house, the yard, the neighbor's yard. Nothing. And slowly, my mind comes to the only conclusion it can, James. His threat rings in my head as I race around the side yard back toward Emily. It's James, he must have grabbed her, I growl, pulling out my cell to call the police. I then notice she already has hers out. What are you doing? We didn't hear a car, so he's on foot. It's been under five minutes, and I've been watching the street. You would have seen him if he tried to cut through the yard, and both your neighbors have dogs. So he must be hiding with her nearby. That just angers me more. Molly. I call, and listen hard for an answer. I'm gonna kill this guy. Are you calling the cops? No, she says with a grim tone. I'm unblocking James and calling him. He can't be stupid enough to not mute his phone, I start, and then remember who I'm talking about, and suddenly feel a bit better about my daughter's odds. A few seconds later, twerk it, blares out loudly from a nearby neighbor's bushes. I cross the street in about two long steps, and dive into the mass of branches. James is there, crouched with his hand over Molly's mouth and staring at me in wide-eyed panic. I'll hurt her, he warns, and then yells in pain as Molly bites his hand. I yank his arm from around her, and she bolts out of the bushes, running for Emily with a high-pitched scream. Still holding his arm, I use it to yank him all the way out of the bushes and into the middle of the street. He sprawls on the blacktop, then scrambles up, looking between me and Emily with growing worry. His jaw sets and he takes a step toward my girls, as if planning to try and take a hostage again. My fist crashes into the side of his head before he's halfway there. He wobbles completely around, stumbles, pitches forward, and lands in a heap at Emily's feet. He looks up at her blearily, and Molly steps forward and kicks him between the eyes. Jerk. You smell too. And you're stupid. James just lies there, probably playing dead so no one will hit him again. I pull Molly back into a tight hug, and she wiggles a bit before relaxing. 
She's still more furious than scared, and I'm proud of her, just as I am of Emily. It's a bad lesson to have to teach Molly. Violence doesn't solve anything, unless it's something like a complete idiot trying to kidnap you from your family. Then violence is often what's needed and deserved. I just wish she could have been a little older before she had to learn that. Emily hurries to my side. I grab her with my other arm and hug my girls tight. Sorry, sweetheart, we're gonna be a little late bringing dinner. I gotta drop this guy off with the cops first. She nods, sighing tiredly. That's fine. I know we'll get there. We get there at 7, and order massive amounts of pizza so the kids aren't waiting for us to roast the turkey. There are 10 of them, all ages, all kinds, most disabled in one way or another. Some of them can't stop fighting even during dinner, and eye us suspiciously when we bring gifts. None of them remember Emily, and the staff has turned over so much that nobody there that night was working there when this was her home. But several of the kids do seem happier for our visit, and that's good. They're going to be seeing a lot of us, soon. Three days later, I wake up around dawn curled around Emily from behind and look out the window to see snow falling past the panes in thick feathery flakes. Molly hasn't stirred yet, I know because as soon as she's fully awake she'll be in here like a shot demanding presence with two rambunctious dogs on her heels. I smile and settle back in, burying my nose in Emily's hair. She stirs and rolls over, opening her eyes blearily, and I kiss her on the nose. Good morning, I murmur. Emily smiles. Good morning. It's been a rough three days. We're pressing charges against James for his kidnapping attempt, but his mother's being a pest about it and will likely hire him a very good lawyer. It will be something of a long haul to get rid of him for good, but that's fine. I'm willing to fight for my new family. As if on cue from outside my door we hear, Dodd? It's Christmas. Emily bursts into giggles as I back off and grin sheepishly. Or not. The End Santa's Naughty Helper Chapter 1 Clay Bottom line, Larry, how bad is it? I ask impatiently. Stop giving me the runaround and tell it to me straight. There's a pause on the other end of the line, followed by a sigh. It's not good, Clay, that's how it is. You know the IRS frowns upon tax evasion. How do you think so many CEOs end up in prison? He laughs, but I don't join in. I'm guilty and don't want this to blow up into yet another scandal. In the past few years, my name has been in the headlines more than once. From hooking up with the wrong women to getting involved in the wrong foreign trades, it seems I can't stay out of the public's eye. Not that I care what they think. I have more money than I know what to do with, and so far it hasn't held me back in my ambitions. Even the bigger issues I've faced haven't stopped me from getting new business partners, investors, and people asking me to invest with them. I can have any woman I want any time I want, discard her in the morning, and move on to the next. Honestly, I've been on top of my game throughout my 20s and well into my 30s, becoming one of the youngest self-made billionaires in history. I'm not seeing what's funny about this, I say dryly. The laughter stops, and he clears his throat. No, there is nothing funny about this at all, he says. But it also doesn't make sense to stress out about something you cannot control. You are the one with control over this. I snap. They said you were the best lawyer in New York City. I'm depending on you to get this entire thing swept under the rug and kept out of the papers. That is the ultimate goal here. I know you're stressed about this, but don't be. There's a reason they call me the best. If you can just settle down, all of this will go a lot smoother, Larry replies condescendingly, and if he were in the room, I'd likely punch him. I hate working with lawyers. They are all the same. More focused on what they can gain out of the case than actually helping me get out of situations. I don't give a damn how good he looks at the end of the day. I only care if my name stays out of the headlines and off the streets. I'll settle down when you tell me I'm not going to end up in prison. Trust me on this. 
I am an expert at negotiation. I'll make absolutely sure you won't go to prison. His voice hangs in the air, suggesting he wants to say something else but can't find the words. And he clears his throat. Larry, you aren't doing either one of us any good by keeping secrets from me. Can you keep me out of prison or not? If I end up incarcerated after you tell me I'm not, rest assured there will be hell to pay when I get out. Well, that's the thing. You can stay out of prison, but I need your full authorization to act as I see fit, he says. Meaning, since you will not show up to any of your trials, you have to trust that I can work things out on your behalf. No questions asked. Besides, you haven't even been convicted. We can hope that it will not come down to being guilty, Larry says optimistically. And what are my chances of that actually happening? There is another long pause on his end of the line, and I wonder how he reached the status of being the best lawyer in the Big Apple. He seems like one of the worst I've dealt with, and that is more than I care to admit. Larry, you aren't doing yourself any favors here. Slim to none. They have the bank records. They have the phone records. If you were going to get out of this, you should have covered your tracks better. But stranger things happen in the courtroom. Yeah, cover my tracks better. Some advice coming from a legal advisor. Hey, I'm trying to be as transparent as possible here. Let's be honest, you are the one who really can't afford to take this hit, Larry points out. Once more, my temper boils. I wish he was in the room with me, so his face could meet my fist. Sure, that's not the best way to deal with your legal help, but he's pissing me off and I'm Clay Jordan. I don't have to deal with this shit. Take care of this as quickly as possible. I'm straining not to display the tension in my voice. Can you at least make sure that happens, or do you need someone to stay on you about that too? I'm working around your court dates. You want this over with yesterday, but the system works differently. It may be months before something is worked out with them that satisfies everyone. Months. It all depends on what the conviction is, what the judge offers, and what I'm allowed to take, Larry recounts. He pauses, and I know he'll once more ask for my permission in a roundabout way. Do what you need to keep me out of jail. This shouldn't blow up and put me behind bars. If you can do that for me, I don't care how we get there. There's a loud sigh of relief on the other end of the line, and cheerfulness once more returns to my lawyer's voice. That's what I like to hear. Mr. Jordan, your cooperation is appreciated. It'll be your best bet. His flattery is unnecessary, his reassurance somewhat unreliable. There is enough doubt about him. Does he have what it takes to pull this off? But my business partners have told me he's good, and I hope he's able to deliver on his promises. All right then, Merry Christmas to you. I'll get back to you after Monday's court appearance. Larry's cheery voice comes through the phone. Screw Christmas. Now who's the Scrooge here? Larry asks, but I hang up on him. Holidays haven't mattered much to me for years. From Thanksgiving through New Year's Day, I stick my head in the sand and try to forget about the entire thing. The holidays were never a big deal in my family. My father was always gone, my mother always having an affair with another man and never home. I was alone, and it's better that way now. My fingers intertwine, and my head listlessly turns to the window, watching the snowflakes fall from the sky. From thirty stories up, they have a long way before they land on the street below. I bury my face in my hands and take a deep breath. Perhaps Larry will come through, and this nightmare will all go away. How he does it is not important. I just can't go to prison. Chapter 2 Alexis Sir, would you donate a dollar to the Alyssa's Friends Foundation? It's a non-profit meant to, okay. Oh, miss. Excuse me, would you like to donate a dollar to the Alyssa's Friends Foundation? No. Okay, Merry Christmas anyway. Walking back to my place in the corner of the mall, I hold my flyers and stand next to my empty table. I sink into my seat, thinking of a new way to approach people. 
No one has donated in the past three days, and even before that, a measly $50 has been raised so far. After several weeks, I'm stuck in the mud with the wheels spinning. It's Christmas. It's supposed to be the season of giving, yet I'm watching the shoppers walk in and out of the stores, all of them loaded up with bags of junk. The true meaning of the season has been lost on the world. Buy what you can, show off to your friends and family with your gifts to them, eat as much as you can, drink, and it's all in the spirit of the holiday. That's not what Christmas is about, it's exhausting me. My little station was set up here in hopes to raise money and awareness for the charity I am trying to start. As a junior in college, it's not easy to find the time to work on my own charity or to volunteer with ones I'm already passionate about, but that doesn't stop me from trying. Now that it's Christmas break or rather winter break, there's more than a month to throw myself into my passion and finally get this charitable trust up and running. That is, if someone walking by my table will pay attention. Most of the time I just get strange looks from passers-by. Often they wave their hand and shake their head, not bothering to hear me or wish me good luck. Would any other 22-year-old sacrifice their entire break to single-handedly start a charity? So why not spare a few moments of your time? Hello sir. I start again, seeing a prospect coming out of a store. He immediately hits the Bluetooth in his ear, and I don't know if he's really talking to someone, or if he's merely avoiding me. Either way, he's unapproachable now. The mall is very strict with their policies on who you can and can't draw near with your service, and people who are on the phone, conducting business, or signaling they want to be left alone are on that list. I sit back in my chair and look at the table in front of me. There are a few little things I've got set up, detailing my idea as well as my upbringing. My sister Alyssa's smile catches my eye. She is the reason I want to start this foundation, and she's the reason it's going to succeed. We were twins, inseparable, identical. We loved all the same things, shared all the same secrets, and vowed we'd never be torn apart. Yet, when we were nine years old, she was diagnosed with leukemia. It was a tough battle, and she fought with all the might she had, but after three long years of torment, countless treatments, hours at her hospital bed and enough tears to fill the ocean, she quietly passed away the night before our twelfth birthday. It left me devastated to this day. And there is not enough research to find a cure for this terrible disease. Sure there are foundations and hospitals dedicated to helping children with such illness, except for me, that is not enough. It wasn't enough for Alyssa. If more treatments were available, she might still be here today. To me, her death is not just another statistic. Alyssa's memory will not be another sad story. My charity will make a difference, and my sister's face will be headlining it. I envision the time it will be completed and become a genuine charity. Everyone in the world will know who Alyssa Simone is. Good evening, ma'am. Do you have a moment? Could you contribute to a humanitarian charity? It's Christmas and this is for a great cause. An elderly woman hears as she departs from one of the most expensive stores in the mall. What is it? Thank you, the name is Alyssa's Friends Foundation. It's for children who are battling leukemia, my heart skips a beat. The goal is to fund more research and hopefully find a cure. Oh how tender. Unfortunately, I have spent all that is possible today. Have a very merry Christmas and she keeps on. Something tells me to pursue her, to hound her like the men who sell the manicure kits, but I can't. She has given me her answer, although she holds hundreds of dollars worth of absolute rubbish, she will not change her mind. Miss Simone, how are you today? A voice from behind gets my attention. I turn with raised eyebrows. I recognize Mr. Scott immediately, he is the general manager of the mall. He wanders around throughout the day, talks to customers, speaks with the staff, he makes sure things go smoothly. It's rare for him to give me a second glance. Perhaps he's got some good news to share? Mr. Scott, it's good to see you. What can I do for you? I ask smiling. How is your fundraiser going? He asks as he critically examines the table, lingering over the empty jar next to my sister's picture. It's going well, I lie. Aha. Uh -huh. Unfortunately, the mall has a policy if you rent a space for more than a couple of days, 
it should be something that generates revenue for the mall. You see, the other vendors all pay a commission on what they sell. You are not. My heart sinks. This is the last thing I need to deal with, on top of everything else. Oh, I didn't know that. Since it's for such a good cause and it's Christmas, perhaps you would consider making an exception. I'm afraid not. Other vendors know you aren't paying for your space. We believe in equality, which at times means we need to impose rules on those who aren't living up to what everyone else is doing, he replies. I understand, but there's no other way I can get direct contact with the public. My voice quivers. Rules are rules, Miss Simone. I'm afraid we will impose them, or they aren't worth a thing. Either you pay for your space or pack it up. There's no way I can afford this. I can barely make ends meet as it is. It's tough enough never to touch the money raised for the foundation. Although my morals are high and nothing will change them. No matter how inflexible things get. A forced smile appears on my face. Sure, thank you for the chance. I turn to break down the table but note a surprised look on his face. Clearly, he thought it would be more difficult to get rid of me, but making a scene has never been my thing. I believe in peace not violence to get my point across. Thank you, he says. He turns to go but barely takes a few steps before he turns once more. You know, there is a way to make an exception. What do you mean? I look up with surprise and hope. We are about to set up the Santa Claus display, and we need a lead elf. If you are willing to take the position, you'll be contributing to the business, and you can ask the parents about donations while their children are photographed, Mr. Scott said. I'll take it. Thank you, thank you. He holds his hands up to quiet me. This isn't exactly protocol, but I admire what you are doing and would like to help if I can. Be here early tomorrow, and we'll get you fitted into a costume. Oh, and here, he looks around to make sure no one is watching then hands me a $10 bill. For your charity. I smile, fighting the tears welling up in my eyes. You have no idea what this means to me. Merry Christmas, he replies. He clasps his hands behind his back and walks off with the same regal attitude he always has. Merry Christmas, I whisper, shaking my head in disbelief. Perhaps this will be a good holiday season after all. Chapter 3 Clay Walking back and forth in my office, my stomach is in a knot. When will the phone ring? Larry has to tell me how the trial went, but those can drag on for hours. I was more than welcome to join him, but wish not to be anywhere near that courtroom. The paparazzi will not hound me as I'm led out of the courtroom in handcuffs. Too many celebrities have been in that situation for me to recognize that that will not be me. I've been in and out of scraps with the law before, but never gotten locked up for it. Mr. Morgan is on line one, Mr. Clay. My secretary interrupts over the intercom. Take a message, please. He says it's urgent. I said take a damn message. I speak so loudly, she can hear it on the other side of the glass office. She looks in my direction. I will not make eye contact. She's on my payroll, not the other way around. I call the shots around here. If she has a problem with that, she knows where the exit is. My staff members are expected to obey me as soon as the order is given. Without question, without delay, and certainly with no argument. Great privilege comes with being the boss, and I take full advantage of it. My thoughts wander back to the trial. Once again, the knot returns to my stomach. There is no way to eavesdrop on what is being discussed. What is Larry telling them? Will they convict me? Is there a plea deal? He was adamant that I should trust him. What is up his sleeve? But again, all my business partners affirm he's the best of the best and say to trust him. Pardon me, Mr. Clay, someone is here to see you. My secretary's voice comes through the intercom again. Damn it, Claire. I told you to leave me alone until I say otherwise. Is that difficult to understand? I understand, sir. I wasn't sure if that also meant those who are here in person, she replies with uncertainty in her voice. 
Leave me alone means leave me the F alone. What would you like me to tell them? To go to hell. She's looking toward me once again, but has the sense not to glare. She rises from her seat and disappears around the corner, probably to get rid of the unwelcome visitor. I don't give a damn who has come to see me. Anything they want can wait at least until this afternoon. How can Claire can be so stupid at times? I really question whether it was a good idea to give her the position. At the time, it was her décolletage that sold me. I never touch her, but the daily eye candy is enough to put up with her incompetence. Shaking my head, I resume walking back and forth, my hands clasped behind my back, my head held high. Anyone looking into my office might think I'm making some great business decision or grappling with an offer for some investment. The employees do not know what's really going on with me or that my sweaty palms and slow breathing are indicative of my nerves. My personal phone rings, slightly startling me. It's rare for me to be anxious, but I'm so on edge it does not take much today. My temper is flaring over every little thing, and I lack patience for any kind of stupidity. Or any interaction, for that matter. I see it's Larry calling and quickly answer. Larry, how did it go? The words fly out of my mouth before he has a chance to greet me. In some ways better than expected, in other ways not so great. I roll my eyes and let out a loud, exasperated sigh. He always beats around the bush, never giving a clear answer. What's the verdict? Am I going to prison or not? That is why I'm saying things didn't quite go as well as we would have hoped. His tone is hard to read. My heart races and the knots in my stomach grow. This is the worst-case scenario, and the nastiest thing about it is the fact there is no way to change it. What do you mean? It seems like a simple enough question to me, so please give me a simple answer. Am I going to go to prison or not? In spite of a long battle, the jury returned with a guilty verdict. And we put forth enough evidence for reasonable doubt, but the case is nevertheless closed. So I'm going to prison. Great, Larry. You get one job to do and you screw the whole thing up. How you had to do it was not important. You could not even achieve that. He mumbles, but it's too upsetting. How long will they lock me up for? Huh? What is the fine they imposed? Surely you need to be paid for your incompetence, regardless. Larry at last musters up his words, cutting into my rant. Hold on there, Clay. I said they gave a guilty verdict, not that you were going to prison. That sounds more hopeful than what I originally thought. So what then? Take a deep breath and please do not interrupt me, he requests. This will sound bad at first, but you need to trust it's all worked out. Give it to me, Larry. Quit stalling. With a guilty verdict came a five-year prison sentence. Larry! Hold on, do not interrupt me. I asked for your full permission to work out anything I could. There was a reason. My heart is racing, and it's tricky to control my breathing. Meaning? We struck a plea deal. You might not like it, but it's better than an orange jumpsuit. What is it? Get to the point already. It turns out that the Berkshire Mall has been struggling lately. And they need a Santa Claus for the kids this month. What the hell? You will fill the part, but you will do it out of the goodness of your heart. Any proceeds, and trust me, a Santa isn't cheap, will go back to the mall to keep it going, you see. Larry announces cheerfully. You did not want a suit at all, but wouldn't you rather take St. Nick over prison stripes? I hate Christmas, and I hate children. How the hell am I going to pull this off? Is there something else I can do? I asked with a tone of indignation. Go to prison, Larry replies dryly. If you don't fulfill this, meaning you have to be there every single day, from the time it opens to the time it closes, living to the standard of the company, then you will go to prison. Damn it. It's a pretty sweet deal, actually. How the hell do they consider this worth five years of prison? Just out of curiosity. The mall is a historical landmark, Clay. No one wants to see it go under. 
Besides the greedy corporate businesses, no offense. You will go there first thing in the morning. A special clock in and clock out code will prove your requirements are fulfilled. Then you go home, crack open a beer and count the days until Christmas. Great. That sounds so jolly. That's the spirit. Larry intentionally ignores my tone. Trust me, Clay, this is the best option. And who knows? It might do you some good. I highly doubt that. One thing's for sure, he says in his still annoyingly enthusiastic tone. What's that? You're going to look forward to Christmas. Chapter 4 Alexis How do I look? I ask with a wide smile. My elf outfit is adorable, and I'm even more thrilled to get the chance to promote my charity while guiding the children and their parents to Santa. You look great. Let's just hope our Santa actually shows up, Mr. Scott comments. As usual, he's standing with his arms clasped behind his back and surveying the busy room. The mall isn't doing as well as it could be financially, but there are still many people milling about. Some stop to look at the sign we've set up next to Santa's chair. The children are all very excited to see him, though there are still some parents who don't look entirely thrilled. This might be hectic. There will be a lot of parents eager to get it over with, and they will push and pull, getting their kids to the front of the line. I've never helped with anything like this before. Hopefully I can manage it without much trouble. I hope he does too, I reply. Although it didn't sound like he had much of a choice, from what you mentioned. He'll be here if he wants to stay out of jail, Mr. Scott replies. That makes me chuckle, and he gives me a confused look. What's so funny? It's rather strange we're using someone who broke the law as our Santa Claus. It just seems a little ironic. He smirks and nods. I agree with you on that one. Tell me again who he is. His name sounds familiar. Clay Jordan, Mr. Scott says with a shrug. He did something with his finances and the IRS found out. It's redundant. Let's just hope enough parents bring their kids to see him so we can make some money. Plenty of people will be here. After all, who wouldn't want to bring their kid to see one of the richest people in New York? You have to keep that in check, Mr. Scott reminds me. This is Santa Claus we're talking about, and the kids will have to be sold on that. Once he puts on the suit, he'll be the jolly old Saint Nick we need him to be, I say optimistically. After all, he's trying to stay out of jail, right? That's something else you need to keep to yourself. Mr. Scott calls out over his shoulder as he walks away. This is meant to be professional. I roll my eyes. Being professional is not a problem, and it happens when I feel like it. Except I will not pretend this guy impresses me. He's not doing this because he wants to. He is being forced into it. He's just a spoiled rich brat, and someone I prefer not to be involved with more than what is necessary. I might be the head elf, but my focus will be on spreading the word about my foundation and promoting my sister's memory. Who cares if some rich guy is here while I do it? Maybe he'll actually draw a crowd big enough that the donations are bigger. And this is Alexis. She'll be working with you and keeping the kids in check, Mr. Scott announces as he returns. You must be Clay. I hold my hand out to the stranger next to him. I am, he says shortly. Alexis will show you the dressing room where you'll find the suit. It's hanging up inside. I hope it fits, Mr. Scott cuts in again. I smirk not at all hiding the fact that I'm staring at this guy's body. He is a lot more attractive than I imagined, and I like what I'm looking at. He's a typical tall, dark and handsome guy, and something about the look on his face screams that he is wealthy. He's clearly not hurting for confidence either, and he openly looks me over as well. Shall we? I motion for him to follow me. He walks with the same confidence and I square my shoulders taking the lead. I feel Mr. Scott staring at us but I don't turn around. He's clearly impressed with this man. There are plenty of people out there who need money, and this greedy man committed some tax fraud to keep more than he should. At least that's my judgment. The suit is hanging up inside. Just put it on and come back out to find me. 
We still have a few things to do before we can lower the ropes for the kids, I say with a toss of my hair. Are we doing that today? He asks with annoyance in his voice. Today, we need to set everything up. You will help, of course, but you're also going to smile and wave at the kids. We are not officially opening the lines until tomorrow, but that doesn't mean we can't drum up some excitement, I say with a sly grin. Looks like he doesn't want to be here, and I'm going to eat up every moment of it. This will not only do him good, but it will be nice to watch someone who is so full of themselves be open and welcome to people he would not give a second glance on the street. Great, he replies. Just get into the suit and find me. If it doesn't fit, we'll be able to work around it. But it looks like it'll be fine. Here you go. I hand him the fat suit with another grin, and Clay snatches it out of my hand. I'm looking forward to it, I say, walking out of the room. I'm going to enjoy this way more than I should. Chapter 5 Clay I don't have high expectations for how this will turn out. I don't want to be here, and I have made that utterly clear to everyone involved. Scott is someone I've crossed paths with before, and he's all right. I'm not sure about this sassy brunette he's got working with me nonetheless. She hasn't spoken about her past or the reason for being here, though I get the feeling she's one of those women who gets involved with charities and the spirit of the season. Not that I disagree that the world should be nicer, but I'll never like this time of year, and I'm not afraid to point that out to anyone who listens. How's it going? Mr. Scott asks as he walks up. Are you all ready to have those kids telling you what they want from Santa this year? As ready as I'll ever be, I reply, shaking my head. This is the weirdest sentence I've ever had. I don't know much about your situation, obviously, but this will be a lot better than jail. You don't want to spend Christmas behind bars, do you? I can't say it would bother me much. Scott gives me a sidelong glance. He's trying to figure out if I'm serious or not. Oh well, I'll let him wonder. It's true, it's better to avoid having another scandal on my record or having a ton of fines. If this is the way to stay out, then I'll put up with it. I not necessarily happily, but I'll put up with it. I hear some reporters will be here today, Scott continues. Reporters. The displeasure shows in my tone. Do you think we won't be hit with those who try to capture the warm fuzzy feeling for the rest of the city? Come on, you know how they are. Scott gives me another strange look. Again, I can't say it's thrilling. Oh come on, it's not so bad. Why don't you embrace this? Be the guy who loves giving back to his community. People go crazy for things like that, Scott reminds me. Whatever for. Because you know how gossip works. If any of the parents recognize you, they will talk. Give them something good to talk about, he suggests. I roll my eyes. Let's hope no one recognizes me. How about that? Sure, you can hope for that, but if you're working with Alexis, the first wouldn't plan on remaining completely anonymous, he teases. It might take some convincing on her end. She seems far more worried about convincing the kids. What is her deal, anyway? Is she one of those super charities? Sort of. She's trying to get her own organization off the ground. Not many people are willing to give her donations, and she's having a tough time. I let her work here and promote her charity as long as she draws people in, Scott explained. Although, in reality, a lot of the work is going to fall on you. What sort of charity is that? My tone is mocking. Is she saving puppies from a shelter? To make sure they all have a home by Christmas? That wouldn't be too far off the mark, but no. It's something in memory of her sister. Leukemia, I believe it was, Scott says as he looks down at his phone. Excuse me, I really need to take this. He walks away, putting the phone up to his ear. A part of me feels like a jerk for making fun of Alexis's charity. She strikes me as someone more worried about the puppies and kittens than anything that is truly an issue in the world. Will you stand there all day, or are you coming up to see the kids? 
Alexis's voice fills the air behind me, and I turn. She looks me over from head to toe. I guess you'll have to do. I slip the beard over my face, adjusting it in the mirror, before turning back to her. Aren't you supposed to be getting the crows psyched or something? You are the preppy one in this operation. I don't care to be referred to as preppy, and they are pretty excited as it is. My job is to make sure you hold up your end of the bargain, she says, putting her hand on her hips. It might surprise you how much your performance report depends on my findings. She gets me chuckling. Mr. Scott asked you to motivate me. Because I know Larry wouldn't have come to you in a million years, especially not for something like this. What you think of me is irrelevant, but please treat me with more respect than that. I'm capable of supervising you and a lot of other things, she retorts. So I hear. She looks at my smirk questioningly, but I ignore her. The last thing I want is for her to try to hit me up as a sponsor. My company does not do that shit, and she won't go crying to Mr. Scott about something petty on my account. Of course, he can't force me to hand her my money, but he might make this go as roughly for me as possible. Okay, Santa Claus. When we get out there, you are the chubby guy in the red suit. A lot of little kids want to see you, tell you what they want for Christmas, and renew their faith that you exist, Alexis says as we walk through the hall. As if they need that sort of reassurance. How old were you when you quit believing in Santa? She shoots back. Oh, I never did. My parents were always upfront and practical with me, and didn't lie to me about the presents under the tree, I reply with a nonchalant shrug. She laughs, and it seems she's laughing at me more than anything. That's one of the most pathetic things I've ever heard. It's not lying to your kids, it's believing in a greater good. By the looks of it, you could definitely use some of that. She shakes her head with a bemused look on her face. I suddenly want to shove her against the wall. It's difficult enough. She's so good-looking, but all that sass makes it difficult to stay focused around her. There are many women in my life, and I can take any one of them to bed. Nevertheless, something about Alexis makes me think she wouldn't be so effortless. In fact, I get the impression she'd like the thrill of the chase, but she'd complicate things to make any real advances on her. And that only makes me want her more. This woman will be in my bed, that will happen. She'll play hard to get, but the way she looks at me gives me a sense of what's going on in her head. She doesn't want to admit it, but she likes me. She desires me. Try to make this believable, she says, as I hold out my arms to the cheering children. I turn so my back is to the crowd as I start up the stairs. Just try to keep up, I smirk. Chapter 6 Alexis By the end of the week, everything has gone better than I thought it would. Clay seems to make the effort, at least to the kids' faces. At times he has a look on his face that proves how little he wants to be there, but he doesn't want more trouble with the law, so he endures it. Thank God it's just an hour until closing, I say, looking at the clock. It takes effort to be a little easier to get along with, though it's far from easy being around him. He's an arrogant jerk and does not hold back from that fact when we're alone. Sometimes it seems like he's flirting with me, then other times it's obvious he just wants to get in my pants. And neither is going to happen. He can flirt all he likes but I don't respond and will not. He's much older than me, some 15 years. He comes from a world of selfishness and greed, while my life has been dedicated to helping people. He borderline mocks me when we're unaccompanied, acting like my work is a lost cause. People like him are part of what is wrong with this world. Glad to hear that, he replies without looking up. Are you going to the party tomorrow? I ask, trying to sound uncaring. Party, he replies. He is fully aware of the party. Mr. Scott has invited the entire staff in the mall. It sounds like it'll be a lot of fun. I like the kinds of parties that aren't upper class. The ones where people can cut loose and have some fun, without having to stand on ceremony to impress anyone. I take it you're going? Clay reverses the subject. Of course. 
These people are my friends, I reply tartly. But if you're too good to be around us, it's probably best you stay home. I didn't say a thing about staying home. What makes you think this is a party I want to attend, when there are countless other events I've been invited to? Don't get me wrong, I'm sure it's going to be cute but it's not my scene. Clay's tone is insulting. Cute is not how one would describe it. Mr. Scott does a great job planning these things every year. This is the first time I can be present at it, and I look forward to it. I stamp my foot on the ground after saying it. Clay looks at me amused. He's clearly hitting my buttons and enjoying doing it. I have to be careful not to give him details or show weakness. This guy will use it to his advantage. The rest of the evening passes quickly. We finish with the set, and Clay gets ready to go to the dressing room but I push my way past him. Whoa, someone is in a hurry, he says with another grin. It might appear you don't want to talk to me. I don't. People who are too good to hang out with others aren't worth my time. My life's work is to make sure everyone is treated fairly in this world. It's people like you who make that difficult. My hands are on my hips as I'm speaking. He laughs and immediately my cheeks flush crimson. Why is this man getting under my skin so much? What's so funny? You, he replies with a shake of his head. I open my mouth to get more details but Mr. Scott interrupts us. The two of you should know that we've been doing better this year than we have in ages, he says with a grin. That's great. I say enthusiastically, turning to face him. Clay will get the cold shoulder, and he'll see I can be warm and welcoming. If he's going to be difficult, then he'll wind up alone. Did you hear about the party we're having tomorrow night? Mr. Scott turns his attention to Clay. You should come, you are part of the reason we're doing so well. Actually, you are most of the reason. Clay isn't sure he can spare the time with the likes of us, I answer. We were talking about that very issue. Oh really? That is a shame. If you change your mind we're going to have a lot of food, a lot of booze and a lot of conversation, Mr. Scott says smiling. Can he tell how much I dislike Clay? Or rather, how much I try to dislike him? I'll think about it, he replies and the two shake hands. I'll be there, I volunteer with a grin. We know how to have a good time. I look forward to it, Mr. Scott says with a smile. I give Clay another look before heading back to get my things. I just wear the elf dress to work. I don't mind looking like an elf when my shift is over. The people seem to like it. Walking to my locker to get my purse, I feel Clay's eyes glued on me. What is going on in his mind? His gaze is so penetrating, it seems he can look into my very soul. I fight to keep from blushing every time he does so, and it seems he knows he's doing it. He's not the type of guy who is intimidated by women, let alone a woman like me. But he doesn't need to know that. I ignore him on my way back out the door, eager to make it to my car before he comes out to the parking lot. There are times he's not hitting on me openly, more than likely because we are on the clock, and I have no clue what I'd do if he did. It would be tough not to be receptive to it, although I still am determined just to ignore him. I start my car with a sigh and let it warm up in the bitter cold. Clay comes out, but he doesn't wait for his car to warm before he pulls out and drives away. Sitting in my parked car, I stare after him as he drives up the street and vanishes out of sight. I admit, I really hope he comes to the party. I don't want to even act like I care, and I'm not going to. Clay might be able to seduce the world, but if there's one thing he won't do is read me. Even with a stone-cold poker face, when it comes to him and his interest in me, it will not be reciprocated. He might have glanced in his rearview mirror as he drove away. My heart races, and a wave of excitement washes over me. I've had suitors in the past, but no one with the same kind of attitude Clay Jordan has. He looks at me so intently. It is so primal, it sends waves of anticipation through my entire body. I put my car into drive, shaking my head, and slowly make my own way out of the icy parking lot. What has come over me? What have I been thinking? That man is here temporarily. More than likely, we'll never see each other again at the end of the month. 
We are nothing more than two volunteers. Well, one of us is voluntary anyway. The looks and the flirting might add to the excitement, but we'll not go further than that. As he commented, we come from two different worlds. Chapter 7 Clay I finish adjusting my tie, looking in the mirror, but cannot decide where to go. There are plenty of holiday parties, many of them laden with champagne, beautiful women, and business connections. I planned on going to Harley Mann's party, down at the bank. He is one of the wealthiest men, and he can be helpful in getting me out of this scrape. For some odd reason, the party at the mall keeps returning to my mind. What would be appealing about it? On paper, absolutely nothing. In reality, a young woman is possessing me. How she treated me the day before about the event was incredibly sensual. She does not seem the kind of a woman to back down, and apparently she doesn't care who I am. By the look she gives me throughout the day, or when she turns her face away every time I give her a compliment, she wants me. I know she does. I can go to any party, and the odds are in my favor, I'll be going home with a woman. However, I don't want to go home with any woman. I want to take Alexis home with me. She's young, noticeably inexperienced, and I want to be the first to really blow her mind. What is her experience, anyhow? My phone chimes. My driver has arrived. Whoever I end up seeing, I plan on getting married and won't deal with driving back on the icy roads. Walking down the stairs, my mind is still spinning with indecisiveness, and it's not until the cab driver asks for the destination that I can give an answer. What the hell? Take me down to the Berkshire Mall. He gives me a look. He's driven for me before, and he's aware of the parties I like to attend. The Berkshire is definitely out of character, but he knows better than to comment. We ride along in silence, and I stare out the window at the swirling snow. It's already dark, but the lights capture the tiny flakes and glint with sparkles. It's peaceful, but I can't shake my disdain for this time of year. New York gets cold, and I'm beyond ready for the holidays to be over and summer to return. There you go, mate, my driver says, bringing me back to the moment. Thank you. I pay him and slip out of the vehicle. Why am I feeling nervous? I never feel nervous, but right now, there are butterflies in my stomach and my palms are getting damp. These are folks I would never associate with, but there is a particular woman I really want to see. Clay. You made it. Mr. Scott walks over with rosy cheeks and a glass of champagne in his hand. I didn't think you were coming, but you son of a gun, you made it. I might not stay long. Several other venues may require my attention, I say quickly. But it won't hurt me to stop by for a few minutes. Excellent. Help yourself to the champagne and food. Of course, mingle your little heart out as well. You don't have to sit on that throne tonight, he points to the seat behind him. I smile silently. I want to ask him if he knows where Alexis is, but that's not really my style. If she's around, she'll notice me at some point. And I'm right. Well, look who graced us meek mortals with his presence, she says coolly as she walks over, a glass of champagne in her hand as well. She's in her twenties but still looks out of place with alcohol in her hand. As though she's too young or perhaps too innocent. I thought I'd see how things were getting on here. Care to walk me to the champagne table? She looks surprised and distrustful. Looking at the glass in her hand, she swirls the liquid and shrugs. It's not like you can't find it yourself. No, but if I came to socialize, it won't do me much good to lean back in a corner, will it? She gives me another look. Distrust is still on her face. She's probably worried I'll ask her out. And perhaps not because of the question itself, but due to what her response will be. Come on then. She doesn't bother to hide her annoyance. Something about it makes it feigned. She's not attempting to annoy me, she's not bothered. In fact, she's putting up a wall to defend against her own feelings. We walk over to the table, and I grab one of the glasses, turning to her and swirling it in my hand like a gentleman. 
She's checking out my suit, and I take the moment to openly compliment her gown. It's tough to recognize you when you're not dressed like an elf. She blushes but tries to look exasperated. I don't always wear that outfit. Good. Because you look much better in this. And you look a lot better in a Santa suit if you ask me, she says with a mischievous grin. My heart skips a beat. I knew she'd flirt if we were alone. Why do you say that? Not a fan of nice abs. I ask, patting my stomach. She visibly blushes and looks away. She's probably wondered what was hidden under my shirt all this time. Not exactly what I was getting at. She's not hiding the sheepish grin on her face. I'm about to ask her what she meant when we are interrupted by Mr. Scott. Oh dear. Everyone. What did I tell you? He calls out. We look at him in surprise. He points above our heads. I knew this was the best place to catch a duo eventually. We look up and Alexis gasps. We are directly below a mistletoe, something I didn't even think to check when we walked over to the table. By Alexis's reaction, she also had no idea that it was there. You know what that means. Scott presses. Both of you owe us a kiss. Oh, I don't know about that, Alexis argues. Won't it be weird if we have to work together again? Kiss. 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 Scott starts chanting, and it's not long before the rest of the room joins in. Alexis looks undecided. This is my chance. I put the champagne on the table and turn to take her in my arms. She doesn't fight me. In fact, she is trembling beneath my touch, her body full of anticipation. There is no doubt what her desires are. If there was a way to rip her clothes off and take her on the table right now, that is a fantasy for sure. I press my lips to hers and she lets out a slight moan. It's soft enough no one else hears it, but her flushing cheeks tell me she didn't mean to let it out. She looks embarrassed as she pulls away from me. They are all cheering. It's so effortless to entertain people with champagne in them. I have to go, Alexa says softly. She grabs her glass of champagne and disappears into the crowd. I don't follow her. The way she reacted to my kiss, it's just a matter of time before we catch up again. It's better not to bring it up. It's the first step to what I want to do with her. Perhaps my wish of taking her home with me tonight will come true after all. It will be a Christmas miracle. Chapter 8 Alexis Rushing to the back room, praying Clay doesn't follow me, I am angry with myself for not noticing the mistletoe hanging above the table. Mr. Scott told me earlier he would hide it in the room, and we agreed we'd abide by the rules if we were caught beneath it. To be fair, standing under there with Clay never crossed my mind. It was a surprise he showed up. I certainly didn't think we would be together when the plant was revealed. I drain the rest of my champagne and throw away the glass, pushing my way through the door and into the dressing room. I hold my breath for a moment to hear if anyone else is there. My heart races and with shaky hands I pull out my phone. Hello, the voice on the other end of the line sounds sleepy. Sarah. Do you have a minute? For what? She's groggy. Has she had a few too many herself? Where are you? I ask, not answering her question. I just got home. That party was wild, she says, sounding a little more awake now. Where are you? What's going on? I'm at the party at work. Well, I'm in the dressing room. I just got caught under the mistletoe. I hold my breath once more, still listening to see if I'm alone. Oh. Hopefully with some hottie, she teases. Oh shoot. You didn't get stuck under there with Mr. Scott, did you? He'd love that. I chuckle. Of course not. But I almost would have preferred to get stuck with him. Who? The janitor. You aren't being helpful. All right, all right, no more teasing. Seriously though, who was it? Mr. Jordan. What the heck? 
You got to make out with one of the richest men in the city? How was it? You don't get it. The guy is here on criminal charges. He's here because he didn't want to go to jail. I can't get involved with him. Not to mention he's like 15 years older. What is the big deal? He's gorgeous, and if you got to make out with him, take it as an accomplishment. I'd love to be caught in that situation. I roll my eyes. Sarah has always been more open with her life. Even when we were in high school, she did what she could to get with the teachers. Apparently she did it on more than one occasion, though it is hard for me to know if she is lying. I don't want to get involved with him. All right then don't. The sleepy sound returns to her voice. It's not that simple. Why not? Oh, she says. You like him, don't you? Not like that. I protest a little too quickly. She chuckles once more. You always do this. Why not cut loose and have some fun? Who knows, you might end up with a nice paycheck after this. You are of no help, I sigh. Well, I have had a lot of fun tonight. You should get back out there and see if you can lure him under the mistletoe again. Have some excitement for once in your life, Sarah says yawningly. I will not get much else out of her, so I hang up with another sigh. Sarah has been one of my closest friends since grade school, but she's also trouble and not the best person to get wholesome advice from. That doesn't stop me from going to her whenever I am in some trouble, but she always tells me the same thing. Cut loose and have some fun. But then she doesn't live the same way I do. She'd be thrilled to find some sugar daddy to care of her. She has little ambition to pursue a career or make a name for herself. She wants to be taken care of, and she doesn't understand why I don't feel the same. Alexis. Mr. Scott's voice fills the dressing room. Are you in here? Yeah, I had to make a quick phone call, I say hurriedly, stepping out of my stall. Is everything okay? There is concern on his face but it's tainted with alcohol. I can probably tell him just about anything right now, and he likely won't remember it in the morning. Of course, I just get overwhelmed with all the people out there that's all, I say with a grin. Now let's go party. He relaxes and puts his arm around me as we head back. I can't believe the turnout. Can you believe Clay came? It is a surprise, I say blushing. I hope he's having a good time. He had to leave. Said there was some other business to attend to, Mr. Scott sighed. I wish he could be convinced to get more invested in this place. He said there isn't much to offer him here, I say without thinking. There's a look of disappointment on Mr. Scott's face. Of course, he's not the sort of man to look at what really matters. Perhaps he'll come around before the season is over. Mr. Scott replies hopefully I have my own doubts about Clay, so do not say a word. I wish he hadn't left. Or that I hadn't run following the kiss. It'll be awkward the next time we meet. He'll probably make some comment that'll make me uncomfortable, and I'll have to pretend like it's nothing. It was nothing, wasn't it? Was he able to feel my body shiver at his touch, or were my lips trembling when they met with his? The entire situation was so steamy. It'll replay over and over throughout the night, dreams of him and how he tasted. Oh good, you didn't leave. Buddy, the janitor says as he walks over. He has champagne in his hand but nods toward the table, seeing I do not. Do you want to get some more champagne? I laugh, shaking my head. That's subtle, buddy. I've been caught under the mistletoe enough for one night. Damn it. I hoped you wouldn't see through that trick. He shakes his head. I can't get anyone to go over there with me now. I'd be surprised if anyone else gets caught under there again, I say with a chuckle. That was a little surprise for all of us. It was nice to watch. His eyes linger and I excuse myself. It's been no secret over the past couple weeks what he wants to do with me. He's much older and very not my type. I flirt with him because it's safe and fun, but have no intentions of taking it further. I won't get caught under a stupid mistletoe again. I mingle, keeping the conversation going while avoiding talking about the kiss with Clay, but it's difficult at times. Several staff members tell me it's clear there's chemistry between us, 
and I can't help but wonder how obvious it is. Who is the bigger offender? Clay has an open, intimidating attitude. I, on the other hand, prefer the softer approach and try to treat everyone equally. There are still plenty of giggles and glances cast my way. It has everything to do with what occurred next to the champagne table. And no one seems surprised. Chapter 9 Clay I honestly don't care what you have to say. It was agreed I was going to be there for a month doing this volunteering, and that's the end. I want to hang up the phone, but have to listen to the rest of what Larry has to say. That's what we agreed upon, but please understand when more things come to light, we have to readdress the issue. He's speaking calmly, but the usual cheerfulness is not there. You said you'd take care of that. I thought so too. That was before another one of your partners stepped forward with information about some foreign trades. What the hell are you talking about? For the first time in a long time, I really have no idea. I did some things, but those were all taken care of. At least they should have been. Look, this is something I'm currently looking into. Keep doing what you do, and if there is more, we'll get it handled then. Larry's voice has returned to being optimistic, but I still want to reach through the phone and punch him. You can't call me up with this information and assume I'm able to get back to work. Do you have any idea how hard it is to sit here dealing with these little brats, knowing I'm stuck here for another few weeks? Oh, it can't be that bad. I love kids, he replies. I roll my eyes. Then why aren't you the one down here in a suit? Because I'm not the one with the plea deal. That's all on you. Larry laughs again. You are doing great, I can say that much. My money was on the fact you would bail out after a day. Thanks for the vote of confidence. Anyway, you'll be in the loop on what's going on. We'll get this sorted out in no time. I'm sure we'll get it figured out in the next couple weeks. You better. I'm getting dreadfully tired of this entire fiasco. Then make sure there is nothing else that will come to light. In fact, why don't you give up on foreign trading and focus on what's right here? That mall is going under, and unfortunately, the numbers still do not add up. You could buy them out and set up something new. That is not a bad idea, but what will that do to Mr. Scott? Don't get all soft on me now, Clay. The end game is money, just like it's always been. If we can sweep this under the rug and get everyone to focus on the next great thing you could do with that space, we'll be in a good spot. He's right. I don't want to deal with foreign trading anymore. It's too much of a headache with so many key players, and I wish not to get involved in more scandals. My company is known for that, so those are the people I tend to attract. If I were to buy out the land for this mall, I could tear it down and put up something new. Perhaps a car dealership or something to attract more investors. You should think about it. There's a mountain of paperwork to get through, not to mention some people, thanks to you. Larry's voice brings me back to the present and I sigh. Don't go too crazy buying. This can't turn into something else, I warn. You know I wouldn't do that. Now get out there and enjoy the holiday spirit. Larry laughs. Ho ho ho. I hang up without responding. He's exasperating to say the least, but he still might be helpful. I dismiss what he said about them all. Admittedly, I've grown to care about some of the folks and don't want to upset them. It won't be easy, however, to get out of the legal trouble I'm in. It was too good to be true, to get charity duty for a month. Of course, the entire plan was to save them all. Now I'm thinking of being the person to step in and tear it down. There you are. Come on, break time is over, Alexis says, poking her head into the break room. The kids out there want to see you. I'm coming, I say a little too harshly. She looks at me with wide eyes then turns and walks away. She's been rather odd since the party. It probably has something to do with our kiss. But she doesn't want to talk about it. When Scott brings it up, she merely ignores it. There's no time to deal with that right now, anyhow. 
Far bigger things need to be taken care of, starting with what to do with them all. I have a few weeks to think about it, and with Larry working out the details, there's time to sit and reflect. How to approach Scott with the offer? Unless Larry plays the bad guy. I pull on the beard and adjust it over my face with a sigh. It's strange seeing myself in the mirror, dressed up like Santa. The suit makes me look the part, but I'm not in the mood. I'm never in the mood. This isn't the kind of life cut out for me, so why am I so torn about my next business endeavor? In all honesty, I don't really have to give Scott an offer. When it comes down to it, if he's losing them all to a bank, all I have to do is step in and give them a bid they can't refuse. Sure, it's not the best way to handle this shit, but it's the way I know, and it's relatively painless for me. They'll be fine, I mutter, adjusting the suit under the beard. It's about time the old man moves on with his life anyway. I don't look at myself as I turn to leave. It's appalling that I'm torn about this. I should forget about personal feelings and do what is best for my company. People like Alexis and Scott are good at bouncing back after they deal with hardship. They'll be fine. Don't get caught up with feelings for anyone. I have to take care of myself. Chapter 10 Alexis What does that mean for us? The worry shows in my voice. I had my hopes up so high for the charity and working with them all, that I planned on asking Mr. Scott if I can continue after the holidays with a booth of my own. Then out of the blue, he called a business meeting and announced the mall was going under. Nothing yet. The plan is to make sure we work as hard as we can and bring in as much revenue as possible, he sighs. We are doing a great job getting the people here with Santa Claus, but that is not enough. The first week was great. Since then it's just gone back to the way it was. You've been the owner of this place for years. How can you just let it go like this? I ask. It's not that simple, he replies. I open my mouth to respond, but Buddy interrupts. This happened to me and my family's mechanical business years ago. My father, his father, all the way up the line. But when times got tough, there wasn't much we could do about it. What do you mean? I ask. The sting of tears forms in my eyes and there's a lump in my throat. I mean, when you get the big corporations sweeping down out of the sky like vultures, there's not a lot you can do, Buddy attests, with a bit of frustration. He's still hurt about losing his business. It's something he's brought up more than once, though no one feels comfortable inquiring about the details. Can't you say no? I ask, turning my attention back to Mr. Scott. That's just it. When you don't have money to pay the bank and someone else does, you don't have many options, he sadly declares. That's bull. I spit. What do you have to say about this? You're one of those big corporations, so isn't there something we can do? I turn my attention to Clay, who's been sitting quietly during the whole meeting. He looks pained at my question but recovers quickly and merely shrugs it off. I don't deal with this sort of issue. My lawyers and a legal team work out the details so I can focus on the growth within the company. I give him a doubtful look, as if he's lying. He is the one with money and the big business, after all. It would only make sense for him to have the answer. Lawyers the bane of my existence, Mr. Scott sighed. I can't tell you how many times I've wanted to throw them out of the mall, just knowing who they are. I can't say they're my favorite people on the planet either, Clay chimes in. He gives me a look as he speaks, and I drop his gaze. I don't believe him, and unlike Mr. Scott, I won't get caught up in his lies. I'll call him out on them any time. But what does that mean for all the stores here? I had plans to move forward with my work as soon as the holidays were over, I say with the lump returning to my throat. Mr. Scott clears his throat. If we go under, then we all have to figure out what is next on the agenda. I'm sorry Alexis, I really am. I thought this would work out. This is bull, I say again. I turn and walk out the door, not bothering to look at Clay. He could step in and do something, if only to give us some advice on how to fight this. I'm reeling with disappointment and worry, and don't know where to turn. 
The news is a bombshell to all of us. It seemed like things were doing better. Mr. Scott appeared to be most convinced that we were going to make it. The more time I've spent around him and the mall, the more attached I've grown, and the less I want to ever leave. It's a beautiful building, and there is so much potential for growth if we could give it the facelift it needs. But now it is too late. I barely get by on the wages he pays me, and my sister's charity is doing even worse. But I've decided this is my second home, and I have been doing everything in my power to keep it going. Now it looks like all my hard work will crumble. Mr. Scott will sell out, all my friends and colleagues will move on with their lives, and Clay Jordan will be the millionaire he's used to being. I, on the other hand, will be back to square one. There is no future for me after this. I'll have to give up on the charity, find a new job, and once again face the reality of whether or not I can finish school. It isn't fair. There you are. In your own famous words, isn't it time you get back to work? Clay asks as he poked his head into the dressing room. The kids out there are waiting to see me. I give him a look. Don't act like you give a damn about this place or anyone in it. How is this my fault? He asks coolly. This isn't my business, and I'm only here because the judge ordered me. That's a large part of the problem. I snap. You don't care about this place any more than you care about anything else. You live for you and that's it. Is there anyone else to live for? I sense a nerve was hit, but it won't stop me from continuing. There are a lot of other people you could live for. Instead, you spend all your time going from one meaningless party to the next, never making a real connection, except for the fraud charges maybe, I smirked. He spins around to face me and for the first time, he's genuinely angry. How dare you bring that up? You don't know a damn thing about that, or anything else in the business world. How else do you suppose I'm able to manage starting charities, and work my way up the ladder any place I've ever worked? My arms cross over my chest. For one, your charities are never successful, and working at a shopping mall for Christmas is no real achievement, Clay coldly replies. My jaw drops and a sob dews in the back of my throat. But I'm not going to cry in front of him. There is no way I'll ever give him that satisfaction. We'll be late. I push past him. I'm not the kind of woman to ever follow a man, let alone one who just treated me with such little respect. He's walking behind me and I toss my hair, causing the little bells in my ponytail to jingle happily. I'm not sure what to do next. But through it all, I blame Clay for some of it. He knows how to handle business, but he's throwing in the towel because he doesn't have to see the consequences. He's right. He'll be here through the end of his sentence, then go back to the life he's used to. None of this affects him in the slightest. I'll prove him wrong. I don't care what he has to say about my charities or what I'll do next. I'll prove to the entire world that I don't need anyone else to help me. If Mr. Scott wants to let his business burn to the ground, that's up to him. I'm sick of these men who don't know how to chase what they want. I'll show them all. Chapter 11 Clay It's a long afternoon. There's silence in the dressing room as I take off the suit and Alexis gathers her things. She's still pissed but for some reason I can't find the words to apologize. She's turned this back on me when I have nothing to do with it. But she's young and doesn't know the way of the world yet. Her ambition amazes me, but she doesn't have the experience to match. There's no denying the fact I'll be here for another couple of weeks. However, I prefer not to spend time with her being so angry. It makes it incredibly difficult to work with the kids when she has a mindset, but with her ties to Mr. Scott, there's nothing to say about it. She gathers up her things and heads for the door. Look, Alexis. What I said earlier. I'm terrible at apologies. She whirls around with fire in her eyes. I don't give a damn if you're sorry or not. Let's not talk about it. Leave me the hell alone. That was a shitty thing for me to say. Let's not end our partnership. She laughs. Partnership? You are here for one reason and one reason only. Mine is completely different than yours. 
We might work in the same place, but we are not partners. Whatever you want to call it. Let's not be so tense for the next two weeks. You didn't have fun this afternoon, either. Don't flatter yourself. You need not pay attention to me, for me to have fun. Her eyebrows rise. I'm not like the women you tend to spend time with. That's one of the things I admire about you. You are not like them at all. She wasn't expecting that kind of answer. You are far more determined, and you have vision for your life. You are not the kind of woman to be flaunted. Hell number. I would kill a man if he ever tried to flaunt me. The fire is still blazing in her eyes. Which is why I want to ask if you will join me for dinner. As two respectable adults. And one being very sorry for what he said. Her hands drop to her sides and she looks at me with shock. Why would you think I'd want to have dinner with you? Because you like to go out for dinner, and you know me. I know you're a jerk. Most people in my life are. It goes with the job description. I grin at her teasingly. She softens a bit. Santa Claus is not supposed to be a jerk. She's fighting a smile. You'd be surprised what you learn about good old Saint Nick. Many of the heroes we celebrate were kind of jerks in real life. Have you ever read up on the real one? Never cared to. I like thinking of him as magical and kind to everyone, she sighs. Realizing the real one was just a man sort of makes me sad. Well, he wouldn't be too happy if he knew you were sad this time of year. She gives me another look. Are you talking about the real one or the fake one? Either one wants you to be happy, I shrug. And why wouldn't they? It's probably not a good idea. She's trying to change the subject, but her expression looks agreeable. Come on, it's just a couple of friends having dinner. When's the last time you went anywhere you fancied? Anywhere I want. She looks at me with expectation in her eyes. I suppose that means we'll go to a burger joint and not a five-star restaurant. I love burgers. We can go anywhere you please. What I said this afternoon made me feel bad, and I wish to make it up to you. You name the place, and a cab will pick you up in an hour. I'll let you know, she gives me another strange look. I smile back. I'll see you in an hour. Alexa's threat for hamburgers is just that. In fact, she selects a more expensive venue. She's never gotten this before, and it's delightful to show her my world. This is so gorgeous. She looks around the room. I had no idea. You gave me the impression you might like it. As you mentioned, you hadn't been to this particular venue. You should have a chance to try it. You come here often? Am I the date of the night? You sound jealous, I tease. Are you thinking about the mistletoe incident? No, never, she says a little too hastily. That was one of the most embarrassing moments I've ever had to go through. I thought it was nice. She gives me a strange look. It's clear she's trying to be in her element, but she's a fish out of water in this place. She doesn't want to look awkward, but doesn't have the experience to know what she's doing. Why don't we get a spot over in the corner? It's better without all the noise. It's a lie. Front and center of the room is my style. The prime place to be seen and noticed. A look of relief washes over her at my suggestion, and she is quick to tell the waiter our choice. Why don't you indulge in a little champagne? I ask when she orders water. It's a work night. She shakes her head. You sound like a kid saying it's a school night, I retort, looking over the menu. How old are you? Do you have to get home in time for your curfew? She gives me a glance. No, I just don't want to be sick in the morning, that's all. You won't be sick from one glass, no one does. If you think I'll let you get drunk, you have a surprise waiting. Isn't it the way with all you men? Take out a girl and get her nice and plastered so you can have your way with her, she asks with a snide look. That's hardly the way for me. Do you really think I need to get a girl drunk before she lets me sleep with her? I laugh. Come on, you should know me better than that by now. 
She says nothing but the look on her face screams envy. She wants to know how many partners I've had. I can see it in her face. Except I never kiss and tell. She'll never know the number, just as she'll never be questioned herself. All right, one glass of champagne, she says at last. But I'm on to you. And if you think I'm not, then you are the one with the surprise coming. I'll watch my step, I grin. She orders the champagne, and I get a whiskey, and it's not long before the conversation is flowing. She's getting relaxed and speaking freely with me. But I won't bring it up. The last thing I want to do is scare her off, and my impression is it won't take much to do that. We'll enjoy the evening and see where it goes. Though, the way she keeps touching my arm, I'm getting an idea where we'll end up. Chapter 12 Alexis Cut loose and have some fun. My friend's suggestion echoes in my mind as we finish our meal. What came over me to agree to have dinner with Clay? I'm still pissed at him for what he said, but then, he's trying to make up for it. It was a gentlemanly thing to do, to say the least. He also let me pick the restaurant, for the most expensive one I knew, he doesn't seem to mind. In fact he treats me as though I was one of the social elite, though I often spend my money at thrift stores and survive on food handouts from time to time. I'm not reckless with my money, I know where it should go. Did you have a good time? Clay asks as he helps me slip into my jacket. It's another courteous gesture, which takes me aback. It doesn't matter how much money one has, a gentleman should treat a lady like a lady. But I'm still not prepared for it. I did, thank you, I smile warmly. It's the most genuine smile he has gotten from me, and it looks like he's pleased. Great. Perhaps we can do it again sometime before I leave, he suggests. Let's not plan anything too swiftly, I reply dryly. He laughs. We walk outside next to one another, and I fight the urge to grab his hand. This isn't a date. This cannot be a date. That's too weird. I'm too familiar with someone who's going to walk out of my life in a couple of weeks. And we've only known each other for a couple of weeks anyway. My relationships are slow-paced. Too slow at times. Men have walked out of my life because I refuse to sleep with them. But my first time should be with someone special. Someone I know and trust. I'm not a wild one like Sarah. Things are safe and will stay that way. We get into a cab and Clay smiles. My place is closer, and you are more than welcome to come up for another drink before you go home. The tab is covered either way. We have to work in the morning. But thank you for the offer. He smiles without a word and turns his attention out the window. It's a fight with myself on the entire ride to his place. Going for a few minutes, having a drink and thanking him for the night would be polite. It won't be weird tomorrow if we do that. Right now, we should just get out of here. He's been nothing but kind throughout the evening. Flirty, but nothing that made me feel pressured. By the time we get to his place, I give in. One drink okay? I don't want to be hung over in the morning. You will not, he says. I can keep an eye on how much you have. I roll my eyes, feeling like a teenager when we step out. Clay pays the driver, then turns to me as we walk toward the shiny glass doors. I'll call another cab when you're ready. It's not nice to leave them down here not knowing how long it'll be. I have money to call a cab for myself. No one is arguing that, but this evening was my idea, so let me cover it. We step inside the building and I'm dazed by how nice it is. The floor is so polished it glows, there's a woman at the front desk and people are milling about all seemingly wealthy. Without Clay, there would be no reason for me to be in a place like this. He leads me straight to the elevator and the door shuts. He stands very close to me. Close enough for me to smell his affluent cologne, and arousal builds inside me. Clay is nothing like the guy I've envisioned doing it with the first time. But for some reason that's all right with me. He's dangerous, he's primal, he's intimidating, and he's got his sights set on me. He could have any woman in the world, but it's me he wants. I feel on top of the world. Though it disappoints me, he keeps his hands off me and we make our way through the hall to his penthouse. 
as soon as he opens the door, I'm dazed once again at the sight of everything. You live here? Yup. What are you having? He walks over to a full bar. This is the most beautiful place I've ever seen. He's the most incredible man I've ever met. Suddenly, I can't help myself anymore. I'm falling in love with, and I have no regrets. Chapter 13 Clay I wake up to find the opposite side of the bed slept in, but Alexis is gone. I roll onto my back and try to remember what happened. She stayed for a while and left around midnight. We move to my bed to chat and enjoy each other's bodies again. Seems she liked me more than she let on. She finally had to get going, and I insisted on paying for the cab. She tried to argue but in the end I won. I always do. She kissed me tenderly before she left. Was this a good idea? Of course, getting a woman into my bed bears no regrets. Each time it is a goal, and in that way, Alexis is no different than the other dozens of women. But there is something about her that is unusual, and I can't put my finger on it. I like her, that's for sure, but before last night she was someone I just wanted to be with. Now that it's happened twice, I don't feel the same. But that is what scares me. I've never wanted to see a woman again so soon. Her number goes into my phone, and if I get bored or can't get the lay, I'll call her. Alexis is special. Her ambition is really something. It's beautiful, and it makes me want to take her to new heights. If she were to join my company even as an intern, no doubt it could be even better than it is now. It'll take some convincing, but hell, she was in my bed so I can convince her to do other things. How is it going to proceed at the mall? She was so strange after the kiss at the party, as though she regretted it, though at the time she was just as much into the moment as me. No dealing with her moodiness. If she continues being that way, I may not deal with it. There's enough stress in my life, I don't have the time for someone who can't make up her mind. Or those who go through with something, then spend the next few days in a bad mood because they wish they hadn't. My phone rings. I sigh, roll over, and grab it off the nightstand. My eyes roll when I see it's Larry, then I check the time. What do you want? Do you know what time it is? Good morning to you, sunshine. So glad to hear you're in your typical good mood, his cheerful self comes through the phone. Do you know what time it is? Most people tend to call within business hours. Most people aren't doing what I'm dealing with, either. If I call you during business hours, you'll make some bull excuse about working when you really hate that job and look forward to getting out of there as soon as possible, he rants. Damn, I'm glad you called me at this awful hour to tell me about my life. Listen, you wouldn't be getting a call if it weren't important. Are you busy? Lying in bed like most people at six in the morning. What the heck are you doing? Not lying in bed which is what productive people do in the morning, he replies with a short tone. It's the first time he's so curt with me. Perhaps I'm doing a better job of getting under his skin. Cut the crap and tell me what you want. If this is a social call, I'm hanging up now. What? Is it so outlandish someone would call you this early in the morning? Be glad I keep these hours to make sure you are covered. You are more worried about covering you at this point. You are more than aware the court could turn on you for not providing all the evidence in the case, I say with a yawn. This isn't my first rodeo with lawyers or the court system. I don't care if you went to law school. And I'm not too worried about that anyway. The dates prove I had no idea at the time of the trial, so I'm covered. There's a tone I can't help but respect. He's getting tired of the way I treat him, but I don't give a damn. Lawyers are a dime a dozen, especially if they want to get paid well. I can get another one in a heartbeat. Maybe not one as good as he is, but one that will do the job. I yawn again. So you're calling me to tell me you are over it? No, I call to let you know I have some good news. His voice returns to the usual, annoyingly jovial tone. Well, that's a first. 
Come on, you don't mean that. I got you out of jail, didn't I? I don't respond, so he continues. We're going to buy the Berkshire Mall. That makes me sit up in bed. What? That's right. The owner, I forget his name, he starts. Mr. Scott? Whatever, that guy. He's been steadily going under for a while, and we all hoped your little gig would stop that. It might have helped for a while, but with the amount of debt, it's not going to happen, Larry declares triumphantly. So what's the plan? My heart sinks. I wonder how to go through with this. Lawyers handling it or not, they all will find out I am behind the mall's demise. I've come to enjoy their company, especially Alexis. Standard procedure. You're going to wait until after Christmas. The court is clear you must stay there throughout the month, but after that we are free to do as we please, Larry says with more conquest in his tone. I told you this would be a Merry Christmas. What will we do with it? Not another shopping mall. I hope to deter him. We'll tear the place down. What's wrong with you? We've done this a thousand times before. We'll throw something together. A casino, a car lot, who knows? But I knew you would be thrilled with the news, so just stick it out a little longer, buddy. Things are going to look up for you. He's clearly congratulating himself on what he believes to be a success. Is that all? Are you pleased, he replies. Not overjoyed, you had to do this at six in the morning. Some things really can wait. Well, damn, I thought I'd help you start your day well, but I see that was a mistake. His voice reverts to being annoyed. Yeah, leave me alone before eight. I am not backing down. I just wanted to let you know. I hang up. I lean back to stare at the ceiling once more, but my mind is preoccupied. We are going through with this. I hoped something would change and we could call it off, but that will not happen. It's Larry's solution to the financial problem, and while he might be right, I'm not agreeing with him totally. We've done this thousands of times before, just as he said, but never to people I care about. It's always been faces that won't haunt me at night. How will this go over with Alexis? I'm not looking forward to that. I might very well lose her, and I want to fight against it. Except that will mean fighting against my own business and the financial problems we're facing now that I no longer engage in foreign trading. In a single phone call, my life has become a total mess. Chapter 14 Alexis I pull on my tights and look in the mirror, not too happy to see myself. I feel weird about doing it with Clay, but didn't expect this. Hundreds of emotions run through my brain, my body. Which to focus on? My whole body is sore, but I have no regrets. It was my decision, but now I don't know what to do about Clay. Also, there are many questions running through my head and I'm not sure how to feel about them. Does everyone wonder how they will act around the person they just did it with? Or it is something that is perfectly normal? Nothing seems natural or normal to me. I should learn how to handle it better. I want to talk to Clay, but at the same time I don't want to bring it up. Another part of me knows that's a blatant lie. The fact of the matter is, I want to be with Clay again. He needs to see that I too can do more than just lie there and let him take me. I want to prove I can be just as sensual as he is. But how will I do that? How can I face him after this and will he talk about it? Do guys talk about it? It's not something I've talked about with other girls, except when Sarah brings it up. I sigh and put on my makeup, trying not to add more than normal. I want Clay to think I look good, and my first inclination is to put on more than usual. I want him to take me in his bedroom once more. The ride to work is long. With ice on the roads the vehicles move slower, but that gives me time to think about what to want tell Clay. Part of me wants to play it cool and not say a thing. Another part of me wants to tell him I had fun and hope he thinks so too. I step out of the cab and pay the driver and then take a deep breath. When was the last time I was this nervous about going inside the mall? This place has become like a home to me and I love seeing everyone. 
Well, most of them. One person in particular, but I'm scared to hear what he has to say. Squaring my shoulders, I walk into the mall, playing it cool. I don't want to draw attention, but I'm looking for Clay with every step. It's not unlike him to hide in the dressing room until the last possible second. However, there is a slim chance he might be out already either way, I want to see him. Good morning, you look jolly today. Mr. Scott startles me as I walk through the door. He gives me a weird look. A little jumpy. Maybe a little. It was a long night, and it's never good if I don't sleep well. What were you up to? Nothing. He gives me another odd look, and I smile nervously. He knows me well enough to discern something is up. And definitely, there is something up with me. I wondered if you would be here today. Clay walks up. Why wouldn't I be? My heart races as Mr. Scott eyes the both of us, and Clay gives me a knowing smirk. He turns to Scott, and I'm terrified he'll tell him what we did, but he chuckles instead. You should have heard her in the dressing room last night. So ready for a vacation, and for this holiday madness to be over. She should try not showing up for once and see how good it feels. Relief floods over me so strongly, I just roll my eyes. You said you weren't going to say a thing about that. I tease. I said you better hope I don't, he flirts back. My cheeks flush crimson and I shake my head. How has this man gotten me wrapped around his finger? Mr. Scott eyes the two of us then shakes his head. It's good to see you two getting along, but if either one of you dodge your shift, I'll kill both of you. We all laugh and he shakes his head as he walks away, muttering how will be the death of him. I turn to Clay, suddenly feeling exposed and vulnerable. He's seen more of me than anyone else on the planet. He's touched me in ways no one else has. Could he tell I've never done it? Or at least that I was before last night. The smirk he gives me makes me want to run and hide. Strange for me to beat you in to work in the morning. Was someone a little tired after last night? My cheeks flush again. I might have stayed up a bit later than usual, but it doesn't bother me. I toss my hair. You should be the one who was too tired. I don't have much of a choice. I'll go to jail otherwise, he reminds me. I don't think Scott would actually make good on his threat to kill you if you took a day off. You work harder than anyone else here. Which is why I can't take a day off, I say with another flip of my hair. Why am I doing this? It's a subtle way of flirting, and I need to stop before he gets the wrong idea. We better get to it, I say quickly. I turn and speedily walk to the dressing room, trying not to jog while doing it. I don't want him to know I'm falling for him. As soon as he finds out, I'll be putty in his hands. At the same time, I want him to know I'm head over heels for him. He moved on me with such passion, such confidence, there is no doubt in my mind I am one of the greatest lazies ever had. At least I would really like to think that. Chapter 15 Clay Since being forced into this charity business, this is the first time I am having fun. Alexis looks at me every chance she gets and she's probably thinking about last night. I enjoyed the flirting this morning, and I want more. She's hard to figure out, but at the same time, I could probably get her to do what I want again. She likes my confidence, and I am pretty impressed with the skill she demonstrated. She was so sensual. I don't know who she was with before, but they had to be someone good to teach her the skills. Except as the day wears on, a change comes over her. She's becoming less friendly, and she seems to lose interest in flirting with me. Something about her is putting up walls between us. It's confusing. I want to call her out on her crap, but I'm not sure how. She's younger than me, yet very mature for her age, but she and I come from two different worlds. Because of that, I can't expect her to live the same way I do. By the end of our shift, she's ignoring me completely. There is something going on but I don't care enough to find out. I've never felt this way before about anyone in my life, but have no time to get caught up in some high school type of drama. She looks scarcely old enough to be out of high school as it is. Did I make the right choice after it all? 
Hey, Scott, can I talk to you for a minute? I ask on my way out the door. Alexis left as soon as she was able, and I want to chat with him. They are close, and he might have some inside information to share. Not much, just enough to learn what's going on with her. Don't tell me you're quitting, are you? Mr. Scott has a concerned look in his eyes. I shake my head. No, but I wanted to ask you about Alexis. Did she seem out of the ordinary to you today? I don't care what he thinks about my relationship with her. What do you mean, he asks. Did she seem sick? Is there anything I can do? No, it's nothing like that. She didn't seem as happy as she usually is. I mean, she was fine this morning, but there definitely seemed to be something wrong by the time she left. He's the kind of man to see how she's doing, and I don't want her to know that. You know, as long as I've known Alexis, which is a pretty long time by now, she goes through these moods. At times she's in high spirits, then there are times she's withdrawn and sullen. You never really know what you get with her, which is partially what makes her interesting, Scott laughs. How long do these things last? Not that I'm stalking her. No, of course not. The two of you are becoming friends, and that's great. She needs more support in her life. His face darkens. I give him an inquisitive look, not sure how to proceed. What is he talking about? I shouldn't trouble you with her past, but let's just say there's been some hardship. Her sister. I still feel bad about the charity when I first got here, I say with a sigh. It's not only that. Her sister was just the beginning of her troubles. The death of a child is tough for any parent. It was the death of them. I mean figuratively. A family devastated in several ways has taken its toll on her. Scott shakes his head again. Sighing, I wish I knew what to say. But I'm uncertain of how to bring it up without prying. After all, I'm the one who will leave in the next couple weeks, and all of this will be torn down. It won't surprise me if she hates me for it, and that in itself keeps me at bay. You shouldn't be bombarded with all of this information. We all have our own paths, and she was given a shitty one, Scott sighs, and then chuckles. The fact that you hate this time of year has been broached more than once. That stems from extreme pain. It's the charity work. People are more caring and giving this time of year, so she's able to see growth in her work, Scott explains. He tucks his notebook under his arm and checks his phone. I don't mean to run off, but I need to make this next meeting. There might be a chance we can stave off the big corporations after all. Fingers crossed, Mr. Scott grins hopefully. Another stab of pain runs through my chest. He doesn't know my corporation will buy him out, and the fact that he hopes to stop it makes me feel worse. Good luck with that, I smile and pat him on the arm. With the miracle of the season, you can find something. He gives me a strange look. What's that glance for? You said the miracle of the season, as though you believe in such things. He shakes his head. Is that bizarre? I'm feeling defensive, but wish not to let it show. I've been nothing but difficult since my arrival at the mall, but need to admit, being here every day has helped me see things in a different perspective. What he does might not be the best, or even what Alexis does, but the holiday season seems better, and I want to be nicer about it. It's funny. That suit is rubbing off on you. Scott laughs and shakes his head. I'm glad. I'll be glad when this mess is over. I sigh and shake my head. I'm sick of doing this and can't admit it. You'll be glad when it's done, but you'll miss us when you go back to your fancy life, Scott comments with another laugh. Anyway, it will not look good if I miss this meeting. Take care. You too. Oh, and Scott. I stop. His eyebrows rise. You won't say a thing about this to Alexis, will you? Not a word. She likes you, but will not get her hopes up. He smiles once more. What does he mean by that? I stop myself. He's just teasing. Scott always teases everyone around him. What did he mean by getting her hopes up? Did she say something? Is there a chance after all? Chapter 16 
Alexis. Quickly, I walk out to the cab that's waiting for me outside. What came over me? I had to get out of there as soon as possible. Clay should not get the wrong idea, and I have no clue how to do it. A huge part of me wants to have a relationship with him, but the more rational side knows that will never happen. He is way out of my league. There are too many alarms signal to let myself fall for him. I need to get away from this. My phone chimes. It's a number I don't recognize. I open the text, curious. Hey Alexis, it's Clay. We did not have a chance to chat today, so I wondered if you would like to grab a cup of coffee to sort things out. I wait for a minute, looking at the text. How did you get my number? The reply comes immediately. Sandy gave it to me. What do you say? I roll my eyes. Of course, Sandy would feel free to hand out my number without my permission. Mr. Scott wouldn't do that. He knows too well that I get pissed when that happens. More people should respect that, so much gossip going on at the mall. Everyone feels free to hand out everyone else's information. We can, but I don't have a lot of time. I hit send before thinking about it further. A part of me wants to meet up with him, and another part wants to avoid the entire situation. That's fine. Let's meet at Gregory's Diner, if you don't mind. Great coffee. Are you free? Again, I hesitate. He's waiting for an answer, but I am not able to send one. Finally, I say, screw it. All right, I'll be there. But again, I don't have a lot of time. The driver gets the new directions and turns that way. I settle into the seat and sigh. He'll want to talk about last night. At least I'm quite sure. What will I say? I can't tell him the truth. If he finds out he was my first and how I feel about him, he'll dismiss me as any other woman who lost their versus card. Yet, if I lie to him, I'll only cheat myself out of what could possibly be a good relationship. Stranger things have happened, and it wouldn't surprise me if that is what happens with us. At least a girl can only hope. We pull up in front of the diner and I pay the cab, stepping out of the car. It's a busy place but it won't be difficult to find him. Few people in the world look so elegant in a suit, and he always wears one. At least when he's not Santa Claus. I step inside and scan the room for a familiar face. Clay is sitting at the breakfast bar with his back to me. It's something I really like about the diner. I immediately plan what to order. Then I've got the impulse to walk up behind him. It will be immature but funny. The closer I get to him, the more I consider doing it. He's on the phone with someone. That will make it even funnier. I'm determined not to get his attention until I'm able to scare him. Other people in the diner look my way, but they seem amused at what is about to happen. None of them blow my cover. Listen Larry, make sure this is flawless, Clay says into the phone. I don't know who Larry is, but Clay certainly talks to him a lot. No, that's not a good way to do things. No, I'm not getting soft. We have one chance, and I don't want to blow it like the last one. I talked to the owner of the building yesterday. Yes, Scott. He said he's on his way to a meeting that can keep the business from going under. Is that true? Clay speaks in a low voice, but I am standing close enough to hear every word. My heart sinks into my stomach, racing at the same time. The potential of the business going under was clear, but Clay never mentioned he had something to do with it. In fact, he always acted like he was just as surprised as the rest of us. Taking a deep breath, I wait to hear more before drawing conclusions. Listen, if we are going to strike this deal, we have to do it right. I'm not getting into more trouble or work like this again. I'm above this and intend to stay that way, Clay declares. It's all I have to hear. A noise escapes my throat. It's partly a sob and somewhat a gasp, but enough to get Clay's attention. He turns around surprised then quickly wraps up the call. Look Larry, we'll talk about this later. No, I don't care what you have to say about it, we'll talk about it later. He hangs up while the other man is still talking. He looks at me with astonishment. 
I didn't think you would be here so soon. I would have saved that phone call, he says with a grim face. He's trying to be suave but I can see right through it. He knows he's been caught. What was that? Do you really think you will be able to get away with this? It's not what you think. He rises from his chair and puts his hand on my shoulder. Don't touch me. You are a liar. I want nothing to do with you. I fight to keep my voice down but it's too late. Customers are already looking at us, yet trying to mind their own business. You don't know what you heard. Clay snaps back. He has a temper. It's one of the news stories. But I'm not going to sit here and listen to him gaslighting me, knowing what has been said. Does Scott know about this? No, and I would appreciate if you didn't say anything. Again, you don't know what you heard just now, and I won't fight with you right here in the middle of the diner, Clay speaks in a calmer tone. Well, you don't have to worry about fights with me because I never want to see you again. I want to sound angrier than I am, but all that comes out are tears and sobs. Everyone is staring at us now, and I can't take it anymore. I turn on my heel and walk out the door, ignoring Clay's calls to come back. I know what he said and he can buzz off. Chapter 17 One week later Clay I don't understand. It's not at all like Alexis to ditch her obligations. What could have upset her so much? Mr. Scott shakes his head. I thought the two of you got along. The last time I spoke to you before talking to her was when you said she got into these moods. Yeah. There's a difference between someone getting in a mood and simply dropping out of life. Mr. Scott shakes his head. She's done this sort of thing to an extent, but she's never done it like this. Whatever happened must have really upset her. She heard part of my conversation on the phone, and she misunderstood what's going on, I say, exasperated. I've already told him several times, yet he keeps pressing me. He's trying to find out what was said, but I can't tell him. Not until I have more details. What did she hear? I'm not asking you to tell me the entire conversation, but what could she possibly have heard that got her so riled up, he presses. It was a private conversation, and she eavesdropped. She could have been more mature about it, and talked to me instead of running off. It's not fair to either of us. I let the anger show in my voice. I don't care what he thinks. It's certainly not fair to the company. I was depending on her finishing with the holiday. Without her, I doubt we'll be able to pull in the crowd we have, he sighs. The main attraction is Santa. So where is the problem? I know I'm being snarky, but he's only fighting to find out more of my story. It's a team effort. You bring in the people, she gets them to you. It doesn't matter if we've got a thousand folks standing in line if total chaos is around us, Mr. Scott says rather sharply. It's rare for him to get that way, but after stumbling through the week getting help from the other staff, he's at his wit's end. It's only a few more days until Christmas, and then all of this will go down. We are entering the biggest days of the year, and he wants to push as much as he can to increase the sales. Look, at the end of the day, it was up to her to leave. You can't push that on me any longer, I remark, still harsh. I act like I don't care anymore, but the fact of the matter is the opposite. I care a lot. I have been trying to get a hold of Alexis since she ran out of the diner. She does not answer her phone or text messages. I would stop by and talk to her, but haven't the slightest idea where she lives. The only times we hung out outside of work were the night she came home with me, and the meeting we had at the diner. I really don't know much about this woman. Sounds like the tides have really turned. It appeared the two of you were starting to like each other, Mr. Scott comments. What could have given you that idea? I don't want to talk about it anymore, and he's still fishing for the details. I'll never understand love, to be honest. He shakes his head. Why are you talking about love? I'm not in love with her. I don't want to shout. The last thing I want is for anyone else to hear this. The gossip that goes on. 
I don't want to make the situation even worse. Man, the way you look at her. It's in your face when you stop for a moment, a child on your lap, and watch what she's doing. Oh, don't look at me like that. I'm not saying it's a blatant look, but it didn't escape me. I doubt it escaped her either. There's a twinkle in his eye. I can hardly blame you. I've been in love with that girl since the day she walked into this mall, looking for help with her charity. He shakes his head with a wistful look in his eyes. It stings to think about Alexis's charity and how she will not have a place to set it up. She had a lot of plans. She told me more than once how important it was to her, and I supported her every step of the way. At least I wanted to. I hope she understands one day that I'm not entirely in charge of my firm or the decisions they make. She seems to think I'm the king of the world and able to call the shots with everyone who walks through my door, though I'm really at the mercy of many others. How could she know that? She was a startup with some visions, but not the power to make it happen. It was part of the reason I fell in love with her. I love that ambition and the drive. She's not the type to get discouraged with the shit around her. That is, when she's not hurt by the person she loves. Your sentiment is appreciated, but you have it all wrong. Alexis does not want to see me again. She's made that much clear. Mr. Scott sighs. He wants to comfort me and tell me she's just angry and will come around. He believes in holiday miracles, complete bull to me. Even with the magic of the season, there is a way everything may just not be all right. He can't see into the future. He agreed she's never done this before. He's figuring out what's going on. But just like me, he has no idea. Still, Alexis hasn't come to tell him what she heard. It's admirable she has not. She'll come around eventually, and your life will go back to normal. You'll pull through with this business, and she'll have her charity, and who knows. One day the two of you might fall in love. I weakly suggest. Oh no. Your hope in the matter is appreciated, but I am too old for her. She'll never turn a second glance to a man my age, he chuckles. I need someone like her, but more like me. Age-wise, that is. And one day you will. I grab my beard and grapple it over my head. Break time is over, and I better get back out there to relieve Brittany. That girl needs all the help she can get, that's for sure, Scott laughs. You should have seen the look on her face when I told her she'd be the elf today. I laugh, but my heart isn't in it. I miss Alexis and wish there was a way to get a hold of her. Neither one of us wishes to involve Scott. It looks like he's the only hope to reconnect with her. I feel bad about what happened, and admittedly, she wasn't wrong in her assumptions. She doesn't know I'm also doing my best to fight this. I will do anything to make sure the Berkshire Mall stays in business. I pause on my way out the door. Maybe it will mean the worst. Chapter 18 Alexis I look at my phone and sigh. I'm in the middle of helping with dinner at a local homeless shelter. No time for harassing calls from Clay or Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott is simply worried and wondering where I ended up, but Clay is just trying to talk again. And that'll never happen. I'm hurt beyond words. I never talk about my charity, because that will destroy the idea before it becomes a reality. Clay gave me the impression he was different. Sure at first he seemed like the kind of guy who didn't care about anyone but himself, when he had all those kids on his lap. But the more we got to know each other, the more I perceived him in a different light. There was even a part of me that didn't believe that he did the crimes he was accused of. Pay attention to what you're doing, please. Greg, my boss, pushes past with his arms loaded down with plates of food. Sorry. Phones are off limits during shifts, he grumbles. Sorry. I slip it into my pocket and tend to the plates of food in front of me. My job is to portion out the dinner and place the plates on the tray, but it's difficult sometimes. We have to keep the portions decent, but as hungry as some of the people in the room are, they should get a little extra. 
I have no control over who gets which plate, so I need to stick to the rules. My phone chimes again. I glance over my shoulder. Greg is in the other room, handing out the plates. He'll move as quick as he can, but it gives me some time to check the message. It's from Scott. A part of me wants to tell him to leave me alone, then another part can't. I glance back to Greg before opening the text. Can you please stop by the mall later today? I really want to talk to you. I send a hurried reply, knowing that my phone has to be put away quickly. I'm sorry Mr. Scott but I can't bring myself to it. I go back to serving the plates. My phone chimes once more. It's him again. I've been nothing but good to you. You at least should give me an explanation. My heart sinks as I slip the phone back into my pocket. He's right. He has done more for me throughout the years than anyone else. I can't just leave him high and dry. No matter how angry I am with anyone, at least I should face my boss. I text saying I'll be there, but also that I can't be on my phone at the moment. Now it's time to watch the clock. I arrive at the mall still wearing my work clothes. I don't care if bits of stuffing and gravy are splattered on the front. I take pride in my contribution in the community and won't stop for anyone. My heart pounds trying to decide what I'll tell Mr. Scott. He deserves to know the truth, but I don't want to betray Clay. There's a part of me that's filled with compassion for him, and I don't want to cause more trouble. If Mr. Scott were to find out, there is little doubt in my mind that Clay would be fired. He is so close to finishing his sentence, I don't want to be the one to send him to jail, no matter what he did to me. As long as I don't see him, as long as I just talk to Mr. Scott, I'll be okay. He's in his office. There you are. Please sit down, he says warmly. I obey, but it gives me an uncomfortable feeling. How are you? Fine, I reply. You left really suddenly, he presses. There has to be a reason for it. I thought you would stay beyond the holidays and get your charity set up. I thought so at the time but you know, things change, I say grimly. But what changed? There has to be something. I know you well enough. No way you would have just ditched me like that. There's pain in his voice but I can't find the words. It wasn't you or anything you did, trust me, I swallow hard, mincing my words. It's just that I learned some new information that wasn't very good, so I decided to leave. What information is that? I'm not at liberty to say. Maybe it would be easier explain if I brought Clay into the room. He's just as confused as me about what happened, and the two of you can work it out, he says cheerfully. No, don't do that. I hold my arm out toward the door. Mr. Scott doesn't listen. He pulls the door open and Clay walks in. Immediately, I'm filled with fury once more. I don't want to see Clay. I'm pissed at them both for putting me in this predicament. Hey, Clay blurts out. I look down and refuse to answer. It's obvious you don't want to talk to me, but there are a few things we need to discuss, he presses. Yes, the two of you sit and talk it out. I'm here to mediate. This way we get all the answers, clear up misunderstandings and leave the office happy, Mr. Scott says cheerfully as he sits down. You are an idiot if you think I'll sit here and be the bad guy. I shout. You are the one who is ruining everything, not me. What are you talking about? Mr. Scott asks. Clay is growing uneasy, and I have to choose my words carefully. I still don't want to betray him, but it's more tempting with each passing moment. You misheard some issues you are not supposed to be a part of, and you overreacted, Clay says after clearing his throat. I heard you on the phone. What you said was as clear as what I hear right now. Don't you dare tell me any different. My voice is low and my tone even. You eavesdropped on something and you're trying to use it against me, Clay declared. Why the heck would I do that? I laugh. What would that prove? I don't know. You are the one doing it. Clay snaps. I'm only coming clean, exposing you to be a liar and ruining the picture of the angel in disguise everyone thought you were. I lower my arms to my sides as I shout. I don't care if anyone in the halls hears this. I am pissed and will let the world know. 
Okay, you both need to back up on this, Mr. Scott interjects once more. What are you talking about? Clay here plans on selling our business out from under us, just like the greedy corporate he is. I snap. He doesn't give a damn about what happens to you, me or any of us. Easy easy. Mr. Scott soothes. Take a deep breath and sit down. Let's get to the bottom of this. Ask him. You'll be right at the bottom of this, I say defiantly. Since you insisted he come in, why not ask him yourself? Clay's right. You misunderstood what's going on and you aren't thinking about it clearly, Mr. Scott announced. What are you talking about? I turn on him. Men like him know what they're doing. I can't put him on the spot with legal matters as such, but there is no such thing happening, Mr. Scott says with anger in his voice. It's rare for him to be infuriated with me but it happens. Why is he angry now? It's only making me feel worse. This is happening right under his nose and he doesn't realize. If you are going to be so naive to think he's incapable of doing something like that, then you haven't paid much attention to the papers. I gain a new sense of defiance. His past is none of your business, Mr. Scott says. Clay sits quietly throughout the whole thing, and I try to read the look on his face without much success. I won't be here to watch all this fade away. You can have me, or you can have Clay. We both know who you'll pick. I flip my hair. Mr. Scott looks at me as if thinking I've lost my mind, but I've actually made it up. I will not work for a business that's going under, and not for a man who doesn't believe me. Or one who is slowly stealing my life's dream away. Mr. Scott can figure it out in the end, but I won't be there when he does. Good day to you both. I nod my head. Mr. Scott still looks confused and Clay appears dismayed I'm going through with the threat. He knows Mr. Scott and I have been friends for a long time, but I'll prove to them both that I will not work in a place I don't believe in. I turn on my heel and walk out the door slamming it closed behind me. I don't want to hear Mr. Scott asking me to reconsider or even to come back and talk to them. I've said my piece and they've made their stance clear. Clay can have them all. I've worked hard without it, and though it's another closed door, I'm determined to recover. Somehow, someway, I'll make this charity happen. Chapter 19 Clay The rest of my day is spent trying to make the kids happy, but having a terrible time of it. It's tough being a jolly Santa Claus when my world has crashed down around me. I'm torn. She was so upset in the office, it showed in her face. More than likely I'll never see her again and that breaks my heart to a big extent. I have never fallen for a woman like this before. I feel like I met the woman I could spend the rest of my life with. Knowing I had that chance and now she's gone is more than I can stand. She had a dream of building that charity here in the mall. She cares a lot for Mr. Scott and the others who work here. She doesn't want to see all of it go away. She's obviously aggravated with him, so he can see the truth. It hurts me that I didn't stand up for her when she needed me to. I stayed silent and let her look like a fool in front of one of her best friends. I feel sorry for her. I need to make it right with her. What will that take? The only way is to get her back here and to save this place. It won't be easy. I'll have to do something I don't want to do. Next. I'm working with Brittany again, and she isn't sure how to handle the size of the crowd. She's trying, but she's rather overwhelmed. However, it's Christmas Eve, and this is the last chance these kids will get to see Santa Claus. The next child hurries over and crawls up onto my lap. He looks at me nervously with his big eyes. Hello, young man. And what would you like for Christmas? I hope the parents get all these kids what they want. Even though I'm not the real Santa, even though there isn't a real Santa, I hope each of these kids will believe in him by the end of tomorrow night. It's something that makes Alexis special, and one of the things I don't want to lose in the coming year. How many things about me will change because of her? I am quick to make changes for her. Santa? The boy asks before he crawls off my lap. What is it, young man? It's so formal to talk like this, 
but I don't have a choice. There are rules that have to go along with them all, and I have to follow them, even if I want to be friendlier with him. What do you want for Christmas? He looks at me with his wide brown eyes. None of the other children have ever asked me that. Most of them were too scared to do more than whisper what they wanted, then sit and stare at the camera while their enthusiastic parents had their photo taken. Do you know what you want, he presses. Santa, we need to keep this going, Brittany coaxes. She doesn't want to end the moment, but she, too, has rules to follow. It's her job to keep the line going. This is the busiest we've been since the start, and I'm a little overwhelmed myself. You know what I want. I know this needs to be wrapped up. He shakes his head. I want to spend it with my family. His eyes grow wider than before, and he smiles. That's what I want, too. He hops off my lap, and I smile as he trots down the aisle back to his parents. His mother holds a baby in her arms, a child too small to know what the holiday is yet. It's a happy family, and he meant what he said. What is it he wanted before his question? I really hope he gets it. Somehow, he reminds me of Alexis, and I feel more resolved than ever to continue with this plan. At the end of the shift, my heart races walking back to Mr. Scott's office. We haven't spoken much throughout the day, not since Alexis came to his office. I have to speak with him, and he needs to know the truth. Can I bother you for a moment? I knock on his open door. He looks at me in surprise. Yes, please come in. I wanted to talk to you, too. You first. He won't be able to think clearly once he hears what I tell him. I wanted to apologize for what happened earlier. Alexis is not in her right mind at times and often assumes the worst. He nods toward the uniform on the table. No, let me speak, I interrupt. There was actually a lot more to what she said than I let on. His eyebrows rise. The only way she'll come back to this mall is when I make things right, so I'll be up front. I'm removing myself from the volunteer position, and I want you to accept this check. What? You only have two days left. You'll end up in jail. Scott confides with alarm in his voice. Just read the letter in there. It'll explain everything. For once in my life, I need to do the right thing by everyone else's standards. I can't go through life being such an egotist. I have to do more than that. He looks at me, dumbstruck, as I turn to walk out of the office. He picks up the letter from the desk, so I turn. Give me a few minutes. I don't want to be here when the cops show up. That would be too traumatizing for the kids. His mouth falls open, and he wants to think of something to say, but he's so shocked he doesn't know where to even begin. I, on the other hand, don't want to hear from him. I want to get out of here and have a couple more drinks before spending Christmas behind bars. Somehow, it'll be better than I thought. There's no more of the shame and fear I felt before. I finally feel like I did the right thing, and I'm at peace with my decision. Even if it does mean I'll get locked up. Chapter 20 Alexis I said I'm at the homeless shelter. I have an annoyed tone to my voice. I don't want to talk to Scott anyway, but once again he is relentless until I answer. You've got to hear this. There's excitement in his voice and I sigh. All right, but I've got to get back inside. They can fire volunteers, and I don't want that on my resume. I sound exasperated, but after the way he treated me, I don't care. I am not going to treat him with the same respect when he basically called me a liar. First of all, I'm sorry, he starts. I sigh. Is that all? No, there's something else, and you're going to be shocked when you hear what it is. Once again, the exhilaration is in his voice. Come on, tell me. Okay, here goes. My heart races as I arrive outside the door to Clay's penthouse. It isn't the best idea to show up unannounced, but I need to see him. I ring the bell and wait, my heart still racing. He opens the door a few seconds later and is surprised to see me. Hey, he says. They drop the charges. I smile. 
a confused look grows on his face. What? The bank. When they heard about the donation and what you did for the mall, they dropped all the charges. You're a free man. Before he has a chance to respond, I throw myself onto him. I can't believe you're here. I can't believe what you did for me. For us, I whisper. Thank you. I am proud to support someone who believes in something. Grow that charity and start saving lives. I believe in you. His lips meet mine and we share a long, passionate kiss. I've never felt so attached to anyone and wish the moment could last forever. There is one problem however, he says. What's that? What about you and me? I look at surprised. What do you mean, you and me? You are the first woman who has taken my heart, and I don't want this to end. Of course, I need to go back to my life as a CEO, but I can still make the time to come down to the mall every once in a while. I would love to see how your charity grows, he says in a low tone. Are you asking me to be your girlfriend? I let the shock show in my voice. Do you want a boyfriend for Christmas? Clay asks with a teasing smile. My heart skips a beat. I never thought he would ever consider that. Knowing he wants to be more than friends is a complete shock, and I can't do anything but snuggle into his chest. Is that a yes? He laughs, rolling off of me, and I snuggle against him once more. The snow is falling lightly outside the window, and a ray of sunshine fills the room. That is a definite yes, I say at last. He leans forward and kisses my forehead, caressing my arm. I lost my family years ago to tragedy, and wanted to devote the rest of my life to serving others in need. Not once have I thought I would find a man like Clay, and it's great I did. I think we should go out, Clay says. Are you sure? I ask reluctantly. I do. His smile makes my heart flutter. I want to take my new girlfriend out for some Christmas fun. Slowly, a smile spreads across my face as he gets out of bed. What do you say? He looks at me. He extends his hand. I take it, looking up into his eyes. I'll grab my jacket. The End Did you like this book? Then you'll love The Billionaire's Gift. Blaine Vanderbilt is the hottest bad boy in town. And also my family's mortal enemy. My dad's store went out of business thanks to his big company. And to make things worse, he is after me. Our attraction is undeniable, but I can't let lust rule me. I can't let my family down. They would never accept us being together. I wish I could have been more disciplined. I should have never agreed to go out on a date with him. Because I let passion take control of my body that night. Now my family will never forgive me because I'm falling for him. The Billionaire's Gift Sneak Peek, Chapter 1 Blaine November 5th The sound of light drops hitting the canvas rooftop of the black canopy fill my ears along with my heart. It feels as if it's raining inside of me too. Today, we are laying my father to rest in the grave next to my mother's. She died when my youngest brother Kent was born, a rare thing nowadays. That happened 25 years ago. It doesn't hurt nearly as badly as it used to. But with Pop's death, the pain is coming back, biting at me with a vengeance. It's been a long time since anything has hurt me. It took me years to harden myself to the point that I was unbreakable. And in one day, Pops managed to break down that whole steel structure that had surrounded my heart. Like a grizzly bear with a huge fist, Pops slammed into the protective barrier that shielded me and my feelings from any pain. He was taken away from us so suddenly. His fatal heart attack at 57 has left me, my younger sister Kate, and the youngest of us, Kent, alone in this world. I'm the oldest, and I assume the others are going to be looking to me for the first time in their lives as a role model. I have never been what Pops would call a good role model to them. As a matter of fact, he would use me as an example of how not to be. I'm a billionaire at the tender age of 30. I've worked on my little empire since I started college. I mastered in business, 
and managed to hedge in a group of like-minded investors to help me with my endeavor. With the initial investment of money, I managed to build a great business. My first store, Bargain Bin, in downtown Houston, my hometown, it was a complete success. Only a year and a half later, I had the money to open another store in Dallas. At that time, I wondered, if the stores I was opening in the big cities were working so well, why didn't I try opening one in a smaller town? Not a tiny town, a mid-sized town. So I opened the next bargain bin, number three, in Lockhart, Texas, population 13,232. Just the right size to find out if my idea would work. One by one, my stores took over the market in that town, just the way I thought they would. There was some controversy about my store coming in and ruining business for the locally owned small town stores that were already established there, but I didn't care. Business is business. No reason to take anything personal. The thing about Bargain Bin is that I will beat any price on anything. Sure, I have to really search around the world for the cheapest products, but it's working for me. I have stores all over the United States now, quite a feat for a man my age. Pops wasn't in love with my way of doing business or with how I treated women either. He told me on more than one occasion that my heart was cold. He was right. I had to agree with him on that. Just like anything that you want to keep for a long time, freezing is the best way to accomplish that. A squeaking sound brings my mind back to what it should have always been focused on, instead of roaming away from the sadness in front of me. My sister leans into my side and runs her arm around me as she sniffles. I'm going to miss him, Blaine. We watch as my father's gleaming titanium casket is lowered into the dark ground. Not exactly sure what to do, I look to my brother, who is on the other side of her, for the appropriate response to such a thing. As always, he helps me out as he gestures for me to put my arm around her and pat her on the head. I mimic his movements and say, there, there, Kate. Things will be all right. You have me. And just like that, Kent has me taking the place of Pops, as he was mouthing the words for me to say to her, and I was doing it, trusting him without thinking. I do, she asks. Do you promise, Blaine? Narrowing my eyes at Kent, I tell my little sister, I promise. Whatever you need, you come to me. I'll be here for you. Kent gives me a smile and a thumb up, and I give him the bird. He's always been that thorn in my side as the baby of the family, and the guy who tries like hell to make me see my evil ways, as he calls them. My stores mostly employ people with disabilities. As those people are all on some type of disability government assistance, they can't make too much money. So I make sure to pay them only what their particular amount can be. I don't want to mess up their assistance, after all. Kent thinks I'm a terrible person for doing such a thing. He calls it exploitation. I call it doing smart business. He can call it what he wants, he isn't in charge of how I make my money. Which brings me to the fact he and my sister make very little of the green stuff that makes the world go around. Kent is currently a truck driver. He hauls oil from point A to point B over and over, he does the same damn thing, day in and day out. It is a nightmarish way to make a living, if you ask me. Kate works at a daycare, taking care of snot-nosed brats every day. That too, sounds like something out of a nightmare to me. Pops used to help them out with their bills when they came up short which I told him wasn't really helping them at all. But now I guess it's up to me to step into Pop's shoes and the role of the head of the family. It was a role I've never wanted, but he's left it wide open and empty. With the way my little sister is holding on to me, I can see I'm needed. Chapter 2 Blaine Walking into our father's home without him greeting us at the door like he'd always done, is more than odd. The home that was once small and cozy feels empty. Even though there are the same things in it there have always been, it feels empty without pops. I hate this, Kate whines as she flops onto his old threadbare couch. I asked my father on several occasions to let me buy him a house, but he was full of stubborn pride and would never let me. I gave him a Cadillac last year. It was the first thing he ever accepted from me. He had always wanted one, and I suppose when I gave it to him for Christmas, 
he let a bit of that foolish pride slip away so he could drive the car he'd always dreamed of owning. I recall feeling a spark in my heart that Christmas day, when he finally accepted something from me. It felt good. Most of the time I feel a whole lot of nothing. It's better that way. So now what do we do Blaine? Kent asks as he opens Pop's little fridge next to his easy chair. Beer. I nod and he tosses me a cold natural light beer, then Kate holds up her hand for one too. The three of us sit, and all of us pop the beers open and take long drinks. The resounding ah fills the room, making us all smile, as we had all decided to make the sound our father would make after his first drink of beer after a long day at work. I wonder what in the world the barbecue shack will do without pops to cook all of their meat for them. He was the absolute best at it, Kate says. I wonder if there are any leftovers in the kitchen icebox, Kent says, and gets up to go and see. I'm anything but hungry. But I can see my younger siblings need the normalcy to help them get through this. If there's not any, I can call in an order and have it delivered. Kent calls out from the kitchen, no I want pops. The sound of bottles being moved, and things being shuffled around as he digs through the refrigerator tells me he's digging deep to find any leftovers. Ah. Yes I found some. You have no idea how old that is Kent. Don't eat any of that, Kate shouts at him, then gets up to go inspect the food our little brother is about to put into his mouth no doubt. I get up and follow her to make sure the idiot doesn't eat something that might kill him. We've had enough tragedy already. Kent is smiling as he holds up the box with a date from three days ago, written in black sharpie, across the top of the white styrofoam lid. Today is the last day to eat it. Come on it's brisket pop specialty. Are there any beans in there? Kate asks as she takes over the search in pop's fridge for things that will remind us of him. I give in and say, if there's potato salad in there pull it out too. I like the way the old man made that too. While Kent puts the meat on a plate and pops it into the microwave, Kate finds beans and potato salad, then pours the beans into a bowl and places it on the counter. Zap these next would you baby bro? Sure, I can handle something this easy, he says, then takes another drink of his beer. Do you guys remember the first time we got into Pop's beer fridge? My butt still hurts, I say with a laugh. Kate laughs as she puts the potato salad in a bowl and places it on the table. Since everyone else is doing something, I decide I need to help too and get up to get us some plates, silverware, and napkins. He did get you two boys the worst. I was crying before he ever spanked me. When the actual spanking came, I hardly felt it, but it didn't stop me from wailing like a banshee, Kate says as she takes a chair. I place a plate in front of her, and put a spoon in the potato salad. We never did that again, though. One tin was enough, Kent says as he puts the steaming plate full of brisket on the table then goes back for the beans as the microwave beeps. It wasn't the spanking of myself that stopped me. It was hearing you two cry like you were being beaten to death that stopped me. That was the last time any of us were spanked I do believe, I say, then place the last two plates on the table and take my chair. I never got another one, Kate says as she starts making her plate. Hey wait. Kent shouts at her. We have to say grace Kate. She puts the spoonful of potato salad back in the bowl and nods. You're right. Especially today. Man I can't believe he's gone. I just can't believe it, she says and picks up the napkin I gave her to wipe her eyes, which are springing leaks. Hey, no crying at the table sis, I tease her. You know the rules in Pop's house. Only good words are spoken at the table. Now tell me your best time with Pop's. She nods then takes a drink of her beer. My best time with Pops, huh? There are so many of them, I don't know if I can pick a best one. But I think one of the top best times I had with Pops was when he took us fishing. Kent puts the beans on the table and sits down. Yeah, fishing rocked with him. He reaches out for our hands and we each take one, then he looks at me. You get to do this now that he's gone, Blaine. Say Grace. I ask as I shake my head. I don't know what the hell to say. Kate makes a snorting sound I assume is some kind of a laugh. Just say what Pops used to say. Wing it, Damien. 
I don't think the meal will burst into flames, having one of Satan's disciples praying over it. I hate when she calls me that name, and she knows it. It's no secret that all of my family thinks I'm heartless, and must be demonic to do the things I do in business and in my personal life too. The name calling is something I usually don't put up with, though. The occasion calls for me to laugh her off, so I do just that. Okay, Kate. Let's see what I can come up with. Bow your heads and close your eyes, I tell them, and watch to make sure they do. Then I bow too. Lord, you've gained an angel in our father today. We know he's safe and happy in your hands now. We found this food he prepared before he left us. Now we know it's three days old, so if you could bless it to be sure it doesn't make us sick, we'd all really appreciate that. Say something about us being thankful Blaine, Kent whispers. And we are thankful Lord. Not only for this food, but also for having our Father for the amount of time you let us have him. He will be missed. He was a great man, a kind man, and a wise man. A knot forms in my throat, and I have to stop and clear it. Amen. This not crying at the table is a lot harder than I thought it'd be. Chapter 3 Blaine November 10th Hurrying to turn the lamp on beside my bed, I sit up, trying to catch my breath. As the light comes on, illuminating my bedroom, I look around to be sure I'm really in my home on my estate, rather than in my childhood bedroom, with my father sitting on the edge of my twin bed talking to me. Every damn night since we buried our father, I've had the same dream. Pops comes into my bedroom, the one I had as a kid, and sits down and starts talking to me about right and wrong. My head is aching with how much has been put into it, even though it's not real at all. My heart is aching as well. I don't recall ever feeling as much as I have in the last five days. It's hard to believe my father is more with me now than when he was alive, but that's how I feel. Yesterday, I went to the corporate office, and when I found one of the employees from the Houston store in the reception area, I stopped to talk to him, an unusual thing for me. He told me he'd asked his manager for some time off with pay, so he could go see his younger brother in the hospital. The manager had told him, it was against our policy to give employees leave with pay for anything. I had to take him into my office because he started crying, and I found myself feeling terribly for him. He told me his ten-year-old brother had been diagnosed with the same disease that hit him, at that exact age. He explained how the disease changed him, taking away his ability to walk and leaving him paralyzed from the waist down because it attacked his brain. It also took away some of his mental capabilities, and he wanted to be with his brother to help him understand things. The young man told me things that made me see life in a new way. He told me he wanted to tell his little brother how he was still a viable human being, and that he would be one too. Walking and being able to use your brain as well as you used to, isn't as hard as it seems to be. At least he gets to keep on living. I sat there and listened to him tell me things I'd never taken the time to listen to from any employee before. And I found myself writing out a policy to allow leave with pay for certain things, family equals members facing challenges with their health being one of them. And before he left my office, I had him give me his parents' phone number so I could call them. Without even thinking, I told them I'd be paying for their son's hospital bills and anything he needed to help him deal with this terrible thing he'd been afflicted with. Danny Peterson gave me something that day. He gave me an insight into what kinds of things he and others like him face. I felt as if I'd been given a gift, the gift to understand others and have empathy, I've lacked my whole life. With Pops coming to me in my dreams every night, I'm feeling like I need to make a lot of changes. It's as if I'm being given the opportunity to start on a new path, one I didn't realize existed before. Looking at the clock on my nightstand, I see it's six in the morning, and make a snap decision to call my brother and sister to see if they'd like to come with me to breakfast. It's early enough to catch them before their workdays begin. Kate answers on the third ring, What's up, Lane? Me and I say, I want to take you and Kent out for breakfast. I'll have my driver take us, and afterward he can drop you both off at your jobs, or you two can come with me to visit this kid in the hospital if you want to take the day off. 
I'd like to hang out with you both. I can't afford to take the day off. But breakfast sounds nice. I'll get up and get ready. I'll pay you for the day you'll be missing. Come on, go with me to the hospital. I don't want to go alone, I cajole her. I'll call and see if that'll be okay then. See you soon. Next I call Kent. Hey, what are you doing calling me this early, he answers his phone. I'm up and want to take you and Kate out for breakfast. You think you can take the day off? I'm paying your missed wages if you'll take it off and come with me to visit this sick kid in the hospital. I'm in, he says without hesitation. Where do you want me to meet you? I'm getting my driver to take us, so just get ready and make yourself look decent too. I want us to look respectable when we go to the hospital, I tell him, then end the call. With a pretty great day ahead, I get out of bed and feel kind of light-hearted. I usually don't feel a thing like this when I start my days. My plans usually consist of getting online and making sure I'm getting the cheapest products possible. It's nice to have such a gratuitous plan for my day, and as I go to the bathroom, I think of another thing I should do, take Danny's little brother some kind of toy or something to make his hospital stay a little more pleasant. I don't have a clue what a 10-year-old would like though. Maybe Kate will know since she works with kids. All I know is, I have a pep in my step that I don't usually have. It's oddly amazing and I think I like this feeling. Stepping into a warm shower, I have to fight to settle my brain down. So many thoughts are moving around inside my head, thoughts I've never had before. I suppose it's my father's death that has me thinking about making changes in my life. A pressure is on me to get things moving in a new direction. A good direction. As I wash my hair, I think about how my brother and sister are living. They're making a living doing honest work, and I should be prouder of them for how well they've turned out. I never tell them anything like that. I actually say opposite things to them, about working so hard to earn a buck. I need to let them know that not only am I proud of them, but I'm here to help them do anything they want to do with their lives. Anything at all. I wonder how they'll react to that. My money has often been called the devil dollars by them. They may not want that money helping them to get where they want to be. But then again, with my changing attitude, they might start thinking of that money differently. All I know for sure is that I need their help to figure out how to make things right again, how to keep making money, but stop hurting others while I do that. I hope they can figure out how to help me. Chapter 4 Delaney. I need you to have that pick line in before I get there, Nurse Richards. The doctor in charge of the neonatal unit for the day orders me. I'll have it done. Don't worry. I'm about to start a double shift, going to the opposite side of the hospital for the next eight hours to help out over there with the older children. If you need me for anything, then just call me and I'll come back over here. Okay, thanks. I appreciate it, he says, then ends the call. I head to the small room where a tiny newborn is having a difficult time staying with us. The poor baby was born with a hole in her heart that's going to have to be repaired if she's going to have a chance at surviving. To add to her problems, she's developed an infection and antibiotics will have to be pumped straight into her tiny heart. Her mother and father are with her in the little dark room, and I find them holding each other as I come inside. Good morning. They let each other go and turn away from the little incubator that holds their daughter. Good morning, her mother says. What's the plan? Do you know yet? I'm going to be putting in a pick line. It's not going to be easy to watch. If you two would like to go down and get some breakfast from the cafeteria, now would be a good time. I promise to have her calmed back down as soon as possible. I tell them as I move about the room, getting together the things I will need. I'm staying, the young mother says. If my baby's in pain, then I need to be too. Her husband wraps one arm around her and stays silent. I look over my shoulder and offer the same words I offer all the parents of the sick children I take care of. There's no reason to look at things in that way. Staying strong for her is much better than suffering along with her. 
That way you can come back in here and let her feel your calmness rather than you being upset after hearing her cries. She's right, honey, her husband says, then takes her out of the room. As I look down at the sleeping baby, I feel terribly about her condition. I don't understand why these things happen to anyone, much less children. I do know this medicine will help her, and that gives me the strength to do the hard part, make her cry. In the beginning, five years ago, when I become a pediatric nurse, things were so hard for me. Even giving children shots that prevented them from getting horrible diseases was hard for me to do. Day by day, little by little, I came to terms with what I was doing for them. A bit of pain one day, opposed to a terrible illness, is worth it. And I have exceptional abilities to calm them back down. The baby moves a little in agitation as I move her around to position her. The door opens and in comes the other nurse to hold her still for me. Hi, Betty. You ready? I ask as she washes her hands, then comes to us. I suppose so. Let's get this over with. I totally hate this part of our jobs, she says. I nod in agreement, take in a breath, and hold it as I push the needle into the baby's chest. Her scream comes out as I do. Then my mind shuts off so I can help her without feeling terribly about it. Three hours later, and a couple of coffees too, I'm on the other side of the hospital, checking on the third floor patients. With a quick knock on the door, I grab Samuel Peterson's file hanging next to it, then go inside as I look it over. Good morning, I say as I come into the room where a ten-year-old little boy is fighting pneumococcal meningitis. A very tired father sits at one side of the child's bed, and another young man sits in a wheelchair on the other side. Good morning, he says to me. I'm Danny. Sammy's brother. How is he? His numbers are going down, which is a good thing, I tell him as I look at his chart. I'm here to get his vitals, so we can see if he's still improving. If you don't mind my asking, Danny, what happened to have you in that chair? The same thing, he says, then blows a chunk of blonde hair out of his eyes. Only thing different is my parents got him to the hospital three days earlier than they realized they needed to take me. We're all hoping he doesn't end up like me. With a nod, I start taking Samuel's temperature and hear the sound of someone clearing their throat. It's a deep sound with a smooth edge to it. Can we come in? Sure, Danny tells the man. Hello, Mr. Vanderbilt. It's a pleasure to see you here today. I wish things were better, the man says. I turn around to grab the blood pressure cuff and stop as I see one of the most handsome men I believe I have ever seen before. His light brown eyes land on mine without any words coming out of his mouth. There's a nice-looking younger man behind him, and a woman too. I quickly get back to my task at hand and try to stop envisioning the built man with no clothes. Shame on me. Dad, this is the man who owns the whole company of bargain bins, my big boss, Danny says. Oh no. Not that jerk. He's my family's mortal enemy. I never realized he was so attractive. I've only seen a few pictures of him in the paper. But I hate this man. He's the reason my parents live in public housing, and I have to help them just to make ends meet. When he opened a bargain bin in my hometown of Lockhart, Texas, he drove my parents, who owned a small tire shop, completely out of business. They lost their home and in just a matter of three years were on welfare. That man is as close to the devil as they come. I brought your brother a video game. I had no idea he would be sleeping, the devil man says. Yes, he's sick with meningitis. I do hope you've been vaccinated, I say as I busy myself with taking care of the poor, sick boy. All of our vaccinations are up to date, the young woman says. Our father made sure of that. Even after we all grew up, he still kept records and called us after he'd scheduled our appointments to get them done. He died last week. My ire is quickly smashed by her news. I turn back to look at the three of them and notice they all have a resemblance to each other. I'm sorry to hear that. Your father, you said? All three of yours? I ask. The great-looking man who ruined my family nods, making his dark blonde hair move around his chiseled face in such a way that it makes my knees weak as he says, yes, we're siblings. 
I'm Blaine, this is my sister Kate, and that is our brother Kent. I know how deep that bond goes. When Danny came into my office yesterday, he made me realize how important it is to have them around when things get tough. Yeah, Danny says. Mr. Vanderbilt gave me time off with pay to come and be with Sammy. He's not a bad man like everyone says he is. I stifle a laugh as the evil man's perfect eyebrows arch. I have a lot of changes to make. I think I have been kind of a bad man. But thanks to my father passing and you, Danny, I think I've seen a light. I doubt that, or perhaps it's the light from the fires of hell where the man is sure to go, he's seeing. Chapter 5 Plain I can't stop looking at those green eyes. They're so dark it brings to mind emeralds. Her fiery red hair is pulled back into a sensible ponytail, and her deep green scrubs actually make her look even prettier. Moving further into the hospital room, I lean against the counter I'm sure she's going to have to come to in order to get something for the poor sick boy sleeping in the bed. She's so beautiful. She has to be married, so I search her quick-moving hands for a wedding ring and find her fingers without a single ring on any of them. Good. So, how long have you been a nurse? I ask her. She looks over her shoulder, but not directly at me. Five years. Her words are short, and I have the distinct sense she's judging me. The sound of a voice comes over the hospital's PA system. Nurse Richards, you're needed in the neonatal unit. The gorgeous nurse looks up and sighs, parting her naturally ruby-red lips as she does. Okay. Either I'll be back to finish him up, or another nurse will come in to do it. As she turns away from the kid in the bed, she looks at me for a second, then hurries out of the room. I find myself watching her as she goes, and wishing she didn't have to leave so damn fast. Then Kent takes my attention as he snaps his fingers in front of my face. Earth to Blaine. Ah. Uh. I ask, then blink and shake my head, then look at Danny and his father. You two fellas want to come with me to the cafeteria to grab something to eat. My treat. Danny nods and his father shakes his head. I'll stay with Sammy. I don't like to leave him alone. Kate steps up to the plate. Mr. Peterson, I'd be more than happy to sit with him while you go get something to eat. I work at a daycare. I'm really good with kids. And I don't think he's about to wake up, but if he does for some reason, I'll call my brother and he can let you know, okay? Come on, Dad. You haven't left this room since you brought him here, Danny tells his father. Come on, Mr. Peterson, Kent tells him. I saw Peach Cobbler when we walked past there on our way up. It looked good. And I saw one of those ice cream machines there too. I bet some of that cobbler with some ice cream would really hit the spot. The man nods and gets up. It does sound good. He looks at Kate, who goes to take his place. You will call if anything happens? I promise, she says as she pats him on his shoulder. Now go eat something, Mr. Peterson. It's important to keep your strength up. As we leave the room, I see the pretty nurse talking to a doctor. Her hands are on her hips, and she seems to be irritated at the man. I eavesdrop as we pass them and hear her say, look that's not cool. I was with a patient. You can't have me page just to talk to me. It's over and done with, Paul. I'm not playing your head games. I'm a grown woman with a good head on my shoulders. You still want to see other women, and that's cool. Only thing is, I don't want to be one of many, I want to be the one. Purposely, I hang back behind the others so I can listen to what they're talking about. The doctor says, and you might be. I have to have something to compare you to, in order to make that decision. And there you go, she says. We just aren't meant to be, Paul. So I'm going to get back to work after I grab a much-needed fourth cup of coffee, and you are going to stop your shenanigans. Fine, Delaney. But you're going to be the one who regrets ending what we have. You'll see, he tells her. I hang back even more, in hopes of letting her catch up to me, since she said she was going to get coffee. And now I have an in with her, as I have something to offer her. Her footsteps are soft but fast-paced as she walks up behind me. I hear her stepping off to one side and take a step that way too. 
a huffing sound comes from behind me and I stop. Turning around, I act surprised. Oh sorry. I thought I was getting out of the way, for the person coming up behind me so fast. Seems I managed to get right in your way. Where are you off to in such a hurry, Nurse Richards? She narrows her beautiful eyes at me, the long dark lashes nearly touching her high cheekbones as she does. How do you know my name? They called you over the speakers only moments ago, I say and place my hand on her elbow to steer her forward as I start walking again. So, where is it you were headed? The cafeteria, she says, then looks at my hand on her arm. And you? Same place, I say with a smile. Allow me to get you something. Name your poison. Her tone is sharp as she snaps, coffee and no thank you. I can get my own coffee. I don't need your charity, Mr. Vanderbilt. Call me Blaine, I say and move my hand from her elbow to the small of her back as we turn into the doorway of the cafeteria. And may I call you by your first name, Delaney? She stops and glares at me. How the hell do you know my name? That didn't come over the PA system. As I passed you talking to that doctor in the hallway, I heard him call you that. It's such a pretty name, I say, as I escort her to the coffee machine and see the case of pastries beside it. Donut? No, just the coffee, and like I said, I'll get it myself. We both reach out to pick up a large cup, and our hands touch. She jerks hers back as if she was shocked or something. I said, I'll get it. Sorry, I say with a grin. I want one too. Oh well, I didn't realize that, she says with the tiniest look of embarrassment on her sweet face. You go ahead. Ladies first, I say as I wait for her to get the cup. She takes one and fills it up, then I do the same. We both reach for the sugar at the same time, bumping hands again. I laugh and she growls. We seem to keep getting into each other's way. I'd like to think we think alike, not get into each other's way. I reach for the pumpkin spice creamer and offer it to her first. I'm putting this into my coffee. Would you like some? She nods but frowns. I was about to use that one too. She holds her cup of steaming coffee out and I pour it in, stopping at the same time she says, that's enough. Oh you stopped. Okay. We do think alike, I say as I drop a stir stick into her cup. Hardly, she says. Then walks away from me. I grab a donut from the case and follow her. I saw her eyeing them and know she wants one. Just as she gets to the counter, I slap a twenty on it. I got this. She huffs fine. The older woman who is behind the cash register gives her a shake of the head. Not a very nice way to thank someone for a kind gesture, Nurse Richards. If you knew who this man was, you'd understand, she says, then spins away from me. Why does she act like she hates me? Chapter 6 Delaney His hand on my arm doesn't slow me down one bit. I'm busy. I know that, his silky smooth deep voice says from beside me. Then he's steering me to a booth and sliding me into it without me understanding how he's doing it. When he slides in next to me, I find I'm trapped between his huge frame and the wall. Damn it. Look, mister. His finger touches my lips, and I fight the urge to bite it. Blaine? And you have something you want to say to me so badly that it's making you act a little crazy. So what is it? What have I ever done to you to make you form an instant opinion of me? I drum my fingers on the table in an attempt to control my anger at the man who really does seem clueless to his evil ways. Look Blaine, your ways of doing business have left a trail of bankrupt people behind you on your road to success. You have climbed on top of their nearly dead bodies to rise to the top of the business world. I for one do not care to hobnob with a person such as yourself. Call me judgmental if you want to. Okay, I will, he has the audacity to say to me. You ruined my parents' tire business in Lockhart. Do you recall that at all? I bet you don't. I bet you don't care who you ran out of business when you opened that damn store there. I sip my coffee to try to calm down. Something about this man has all my red flags waving at once. I see now. 
So you are validated in your opinion of me. I can understand you a lot better now. You see, communication is the key to any happy relationship, he says with a smile, a very nice smile that's hovering on the edge of the best smile I've ever seen on a man in my life. Only that smile is on the face of the most horrible man I've ever encountered. Great. So let me out so I can go on about my life. I pause and think about what he just said. And the word relationship has no place in this conversation. Oh, but I think it does. How about you let me take you out tonight? It could help make up for what my business has cost your family. And I don't know if your parents ever told you everything about my business, but I always offer to buy out the inventory of the businesses I happen to tread on with my discount stores. Yes, they did tell me. You offered them $50,000 for their inventory that was worth twice that amount. So kind of you, Damien, I say with a smirk on my lips. Damien, he asks, and his frown tells me he's been called that before. I am not the Antichrist. I have done some business dealings that I'm thinking more about now. I am a man who is in the beginning stages of changing my ways. Since my business has directly affected your life, I'd like very much if you would go out with me so we can talk and I can come to a better understanding of what I need to change. Change? I ask with a huff. You need to change everything. Close the damn stores down. That's what you need to do. That's a bit drastic, and frankly, it would be very mean of me to suddenly end the employment of thousands of people. So some other suggestions would be appreciated, Delaney, he says, then his damn hand is moving across my shoulders as he lays his arm on the back of the seat. Even the way he smells is expensive, and it really pisses me off. It's not my job to educate you on business ethics. With your obvious education in business, didn't you even have one business ethics class? I've had several, he says with a smile. I can't believe he can sit there and smile at me. It's pretty damn obvious what I think of him. Well, you learned nothing from them. When you opened your first two stores, you did so in huge cities that could handle that kind of competition. Then you decided to go for the jugular of our country, the mid-sized towns, and that's where you went wrong, I let him know, since he seems so damned oblivious to the fact. But those places are where my company makes the most money. It's just good business sense, that's all. Surely you can understand that, if your parents were business people themselves, he says, then picks up the donut he bought, pulls a chunk of it off and holds it near my mouth. Would you care for a bite? What? I ask, and he pops the piece into my mouth. I have to chew the delicious thing up and swallow it, and I'm so damn mad at him for invading my mouth, it's not even funny. Don't you ever do that again. What, share my food with you? He asks, then pulls a piece off for himself and eats it as I glare at him, secretly hoping he'll choke on it. No, shove food into my mouth without my permission. I correct him and wiggle to try to let him know I want him to let me out of the damn booth. I need to get back to work. You are more than aware that I need to go finish checking out Samuel Peterson. Oh yeah, that. He gets up and holds his hand out for me, but I ignore him and get out on my own, turning to grab my coffee. As I walk out, I find him right next to me. I'll walk you back. I huff, as I have no idea how I'm going to shake this man. Do whatever you want. You always do anyway. You don't know me at all, don't really know me. The man behind the business. I'm telling you, I'm changing things. I really am. I'd love to get to meet your parents and get some insight into how I can make things better. I stop and look at him with amazement. Oh, you would, huh? Would you like to go to the nice, three-bedroom home they had before you ran them out of business? Because that's gone. The mortgage company took it when they couldn't pay any more. Now they live in a one-bedroom, tiny home in government housing. I'm sure they'd love it if you stopped by. My mother could make you a government cheese sandwich and give you a jelly jar with tap water in it. Want to know why? He shrugs and kind of looks like he doesn't. Why would that be? Because they are dirt poor now, thanks to you. I storm away as he stands perfectly still. 
I leave him with the sight of my extended middle finger and hope he finally gets how I feel about him. End of the Billionaire's Gift Sneak Peek Thank you for listening to this audiobook. Audio copyright 2023 BFA Publishing. Please like and subscribe to support this channel. It helps more than you know.